Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members and officers. Welcome to the Planning Committee. In the interest of safety, if there continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room in the public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. In view of the skating rink, which is in the middle of Guildhall Square, you would meet outside the university building, which is behind this building. We would check that everybody was there. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust Fire Marshal regulations, please remember to sign out when you leave the building after today's meeting. For those of you who have not attended this committee before, I will explain the running order for this morning, and probably for this afternoon as well. After committee members have declared their interests, I will announce each item and ask those of you who are here to make a deputation to come and sit at the table. After the planning officer has made the presentation for the application, individual deputies will have six minutes to express their views, and joint deputies, that is where more than one person wishes to make a deputation either for or against, joint deputies will have 12 minutes between them to make their views known after which you will take no further part in the proceedings unless we need to ask a question to clarify a statement that has been made. Members will then ask questions, make comments, and the decision on the application will be made. Both members of the committee and members of the public are reminded of the need to consider material planning matters and not to refer to any personal information about other members of the public. I will ask you to leave, and I, in fact, will require you to leave if you do so. May I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed, that is, filmed from a camera at a fixed location at the back of the meeting room, and will be recorded on the Council's website. The camera will mainly capture the backs of those making deputations, but there will be some footage of those making deputations as they approach and leave the table where the microphones are located, and of people entering or leaving the room while the meeting is in progress. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating quite explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Finally, may I ask everyone to use the microphones provided when they are speaking. Thank you. Before we come to the items on the agenda, I think for the benefit of the people in the public gallery, it is useful that we go around and introduce ourselves, why we are here, who we are. I am Councillor Hugh Mason, a councillor for St Jude Ward, and I am the chairman of the planning committee. Good morning, I'm Juliet Gill, I'm the principal planning solicitor uh, at the council. I'm Lisa Gallagher from Democratic Services. I'm Judith Smythe. Councillor for St Jude Ward and Vice Chair of this committee. I'm Councillor Claire Eugene and I'm Councillor in Charles Dickens Ward. Good morning, I'm Councillor Lee Hunt and I uh, represent Nelson Ward which covers Stanshaw, Tipner, Buckland and North End. Hello, I'm Councillor Donna Jones, I'm a Hillsey Ward Councillor. Uh, I'm Councillor Matt Atkins and I'm a Councillor for Cosham and Wimmering. Luke Stubbs, Eastie and Carrings Water. Good morning, Councillor Terry Norton, Drayton and Farlington Ward. Hello, I'm Rebecca Walkman, I'm a Principal Planning Officer. Jane Thatcher, Planning Officer. Peter Hayward, representing the Highway Authority. Eze Caledo, Head of Development Management. And I'm Ian McGuire, the Assistant Director for Planning. Thank you, there'll be a short test at the end of the meeting. <laughs> Um, agenda. Item 1, apologies. I've had a very late apology from Councillor Steve Pitt. Um, his kitchen is flooded and he's waiting for the emergency plumber. He will join us as soon as possible. Do we have any other apologies? Uh, Councillor Udi. Um, um, my apologies, I have to leave by 3 o'clock. No 
further apologies. Right. Declarations of members' interests. Are there any? Uh, Councillor Udi? A uh, small thing. I might be Facebook friends with one of the objectors on item number one. I can assure you that we're only Facebook friends and we're not kind of like friends in... I'd, I would assume that it's the person I'm feeling. Please wave if it's you, because um, maybe, maybe not. It's a quite a unique name, so I thought I might have known that person. But um, if not, that's fine. Right, thank you. No others. Uh, right, can we have an update, please, on previous planning applications? Thank you, Chair. Um, the Council, since the last uh, development management uh, meeting, has received uh, eight decisions on the uh, Town and Country Planning Act for uh, control of advertisements. Uh, out of those eight, uh, the Council had two uh, dismissed and six allowed, and these uh, to do within uh, internally illuminated um, signages uh, within the uh, borough. A key aspect of it was key consideration of the planning inspector was to do with the uh, nature of the immediate context of the sites where the adverts were going to be placed. And considering that most of them were commercial oriented, um, took the view that uh, the additional um, signages would not have any ad adverse impact on the street scene, nor, nor would it uh, amount to a, a visual uh, impact, uh, adverse individual impact on the immediate surroundings. Um, we also, in addition to that, we received um, two further decisions, three further decisions, please, uh, which regards um, householders. Um, in that, out of those three, one was dismissed and two were allowed. Uh, again, key issues to learn lessons to be picked from there. Um, officers uh, will reflect on this and ensure that uh, we aim for least 80% uh, and above uh, in terms of decisions going our way at planning inspectors. Thank you. Thank you. I think it is for the benefit of those who are sitting looking rather perplexed in the public gallery. Um, decisions which we feel are not acceptable can be appealed to Her Majesty's planning inspector and Her Majesty's planning inspector takes a much wider view than we do and so uh, sometimes we find that w our rejections are overturned by Her Majesty's planning inspector. So that's what that was all about. Right. Can I have an update on the nitrate situation, please? Certainly, Chairman. A little to add, really, to uh, that which we understood on the 4th of December, the last planning committee. Uh, we have our interim strategy. Uh, decisions were made accordingly with it. There's some more applications on today's agenda for consideration using that strategy. Obviously, as the decisions are made here, appropriate assessments are then written up and sent on to Natural England. We still wait for their final comments back on the individual application uh, assessments, but we continue supporting the strategy in the recommendations before you. Hey, thank you. Um, members, we now move to the planning applications which are before us. Um, I will advise members of any updates as we reach each particular item. Can I? We now have item number one, which is on page three of your agenda 90A Compton Road, construction of six dwelling houses. Um, can I have to the table, please, Martin and Trudy Hooper, Mrs. Lovejoy, James Skeeler, and Martin Lewis, who have all asked to make deputations. I'm yes. assuming that Mrs. Lovejoy isn't here because I've just realised that I do know Mrs. Lovejoy, um, but there's no, there's no lady that's come forward, so I'm assuming she hasn't. Turned I up. don't think there was a Mrs. Lovejoy at the table, so I think you're okay. <laughs> right, can I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> 
So this application uh, is, the address is 90A Compton Road. Uh, it's the south side of Compton Road between Compton Road and Battenberg Avenue. Uh, it's, I haven't got a pointer, so please apologies, this one, the batteries run out, but <laughs> um, St. Nicholas Church lies to the rear of the site, and this site is occupied by what was the vicarage, um, along with uh, part, of the ch part of the church hall, and uh, a garage, and what is uh, what currently used as a scout hut. And that's the site that you can see there in red. The trees that you can see quite prominently next to the church are protected by tree preservation orders. So some photos of the area. It's uh, quite a traditional sort of um, street of houses in Portsmouth, two, mostly two stories, some of which have been extended into the roof with dormer extensions. Uh, the, the bottom photo shows the existing site buildings with the garage, the house and um, the scout hut. The proposal is for the construction of three pairs of dwellings, so a total of six dwellings. They would all have four bedrooms. They'd be designed, I'll show the design a bit more later, but they'd be designed with the third floor sort of partially within the roof space, so a kind of two and a half storey. Um, you can see the extent of the application site there. A part of the church hall would be retained to the rear, um, otherwise the rest of the buildings would be removed. So this just shows the ground floor plan, um, <coughs> just sort of with the sort of lounge facing to the south with gardens to the south. Uh, there would be one parking space per dwelling accessed from Compton Road um, and um, some small sort of landscaped areas in the frontage and bin and cycle stores within the rear gardens. And this just shows the first and second floor plan. So there's three, three bedrooms on the first floor of each property and, and then a, finally a bedroom in, at roof level of each dwelling. And in terms of the design, <coughs> this show, there are some um, CGI images in a minute which give a better impression. Uh, so they've been, it's quite a contemporary sort of style take on, on, a, built, on a dwelling design. Um, as I said, the, the third floor has been designed partially within the roof space to keep the height down. And we've got an image there to the bottom showing it in relation to St. Nicholas Church and with the retained church hall as well. This is just a slide showing the design inspiration. This isn't the actual design of the dwellings. This is just a sort of design the, the, where, where the architects have taken their cues from and the types of style of house that they were looking at. Um, this is, this is this, just to show you the side elevations and this is then showing you a few more um, kind of 3D views looking from the church and from Compton Road. Excuse me, yeah, so I just wanted to flip to that one quickly. So that's the um, CGI image showing them in colour. So they're proposing a, a buff brick with a red roof tile. And you can see there the, the sort of contemporary nature of the design. So I'm just going to flip back again now, um, just to talk a bit more about parking. There is one parking space per dwelling, which uh, it does not accord with the council's adopted parking standards, which would require uh, at least two spaces. We have made a balance judgment, taking account of the need for housing within the city um, to meet the five-year housing land supply and also the location of the site which is relatively close to the Copner Road centre and um, bus routes so there's public transport nearby and it's making it's on that balanced judgment that we've come to the decision that the provision of six new houses would outweigh the highway objection in this case it's, it's explained more in the report and I'm just going to mention a bit about the footpath um, again sorry I can't point but so the slide on the left shows um, there's two routes currently that public can take through the site from Compton Road to Battenberg Avenue. The left-hand slide shows one, one route which is currently gated and closed, so isn't currently used. The, well, the top bit isn't used. The right-hand slide shows the, the route around the east side of the church hall, which is currently what is used by people to go between the roads. The application scheme would remove the link on the on the eastern side of the hall but the one on the western side would still be there and the intention of the applicant is to open that up so that there would still be a pedestrian route through the site as we understand at the moment these are not recognized public footpaths um, we believe that a application has been put in to recognize it as such 
if it then was recognised as a public right of way, the applicants or developers would have a duty to divert it, and that is where they intend to do so by opening up the west, the, the, the western side. Uh, this is all; these are all matters that would, doubt, would be dealt with outside of the planning system uh, through the rights of way process. So, for that reason, there isn't a condition specifically related to that on the application. But what we have done is put a couple of conditions on related to construction management and security to make sure that anybody using the footpath on the western side during uh, the construction process would be kept safe. This is just uh, another sort of CGI showing the design for your consideration. And um, I'll just flip back to the layout. <coughs> And the application is recommended for permission, subject to a legal agreement to deal with the nitrate mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, the gentleman here, Mr. Lewis? Yes. Uh, Mr. Schieler? Uh, you are Mr. Hooper? Yes. Right, thank you. Mr. Hooper and Mr. Lewis, you have six minutes each to address the committee on your points. Who wants to go first? Okay. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> okay. If you can push the button on the right hand side, the light comes on, you are now live. Oh. Uh good morning. Wow, this is quite intimidating. Um my name is Martin Hooper. Um my myself and my wife, Trudy, unfortunately she couldn't make it today. We've lived at eighty seven Compton Road for about 38 years where we've raised two children and a three bedroom house we live directly opposite the proposed development um, we've never been contacted directly or indirectly by the church uh, to explain or ask for any opinions we have we have one car and no driveway I'm sure you've all read and understand the many objections to the proposal, but I'd like to make some following points. Firstly, over the last five years, I can name six neighbours who have moved in locally. Of these, five neighbours have two vehicles and only two shared drives. From this short survey, I would say that most people moving into Compton Road will have two vehicles. <coughs> this development offers one driveway for one car. The church authority needs funds to repair some this sorry, the church authority needs funds to repair some necessary buildings. Yet the vicarage, which you can see on the plan, has been empty for four years until very recently. And that's a four bedroom house with driveways and the garage. If the vicarage had previously been sold or rented, perhaps this would have funded some of the much needed repairs needed to the community halls. If the repairs had been made, then perhaps the church would not have lost income from playgroups, scouts, rainbows, St John's and many other groups who have been who've left and been forced out of the halls. If that had been done, the church would not have forced those group users to leave the halls. Sorry if that doesn't make sense. Obviously to me, maybe the church would not have lost some of its congrega congregation if they hadn't pushed out some of these groups. Accessibility into Compton Road is difficult for large delivery vehicles and unfortunately it didn't show a picture of the access into this area. And I've personally can wi have witnessed lorries, large lorries, reversing the full length of Compton Road to get out. Regular traffic of large vehicles will be a potential hazard to resonance vehicles. 
If this development is approved, it will cause considerable noise and disruption, not only to me living opposite, but all those in the vicinity and in the road. The proposed drawings uh, and photos we saw last night, which is those up there, indicate that we'll be overlooked by these houses. Instead of a clear view of trees and the church, which we've had for the last 38 years, we'll now be faced with that building. It looks out of place to the rest of the housing, which is all 1930s built. They just don't fit in. I appreciate that the church needs money, but to make a neighbourhood, do they seriously believe groups that have been pushed out will, be, will return? And I also appreciate that the council wants more housing. But please take into account that roads can only get so full. And it is already full. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Hooper. Well said. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lewis. Good morning. My name's Martin Lewis. I am a resident of Compton Road and also a scout leader at the former St. Nicholas Scout Group, which unfortunately was forced to close because of eviction by the church. Uh, where I'd like to start my recommendations, please, is reference to the footpath. Now, it sh the lady showed previously the uh, footpath on the left. Uh, that is never, ever been a footpath. To the uh, left-hand corner of Compton Hall, which is the hall still shown, is a sign saying this is not a public right-of-way. Uh, previously, there used to be a gap there, which was closed off, and it's on your records, I believe, on the 29th, 11th, 2010 to stop people accessing that area and as a safety zone for play school children. A application for the other side to be recognised as a footpath, which has been a footpath for well over 20 years, was presented to your rights of way team uh, last year. And I've got here an email received from your rights of way team on the 24th of October 2018. And it says, many thanks for your inquiry regarding an update to footpath uses evidence form, which we'd already previously submitted uh, by email or post. I confirm we have received these and the matter is under investigation. <coughs> now, it came to light that though there is a scanned digital version of the defined map, by rules and regulations, you're required to have a physical map. Now, this appeared to somewhere along the line got misplaced in the records office. So there was quite a delay to which I then sent another email, your reply, referring to you as the council, many thanks for your email. With residents and inquiry, I confirm that this work is currently being looked at by Hampshire County Council. Unfortunately, I have not been provided with this time scale and this has been clarified, I will forward it on accordingly. So in the meantime now, this is still a regularly used footpath and even this morning, in the five minutes I was looking at it, more than 25 <coughs> people used that direction. Uh, on the uh, <clears throat> 21st of December this year, I received an email after a reply to, uh, re sending to your offices, uh, we're still awaiting official confirmation and update from our legal department regarding this. Unfortunately, I cannot provide any further updates at this stage, when I have been provided with this, I will form you at the earliest possible opportunity. So it has never been declared a footpath because it is not on your defined map. But I would also like to refer to a judgment made by the Council and the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 to the uh, footpath at Side in Portsmouth. And it said here which is not shown in the map, is reasonably alleged to, to subsist over land. 
Now, that footpath has been used considerably longer than the one in Camber Docks. So, even though it's not on a defined map, it is a public footpath and it is a right of way. When they closed off the other side, one of the main reasons was we were having tremendous problems in the street with vandalism, including motorcyclists taking it as a shortcut. And they were never too sure whether it was a shortcut or avoidance of the police, but it was becoming a dangerous area because of its direct route. Uh, it doesn't show clearly there because it puts the red line up beside the church, but the direct route actually runs from Compton to Battenberg. When that was closed, the vandalism, attempted burglaries, dangerous motorcycle riders finished, literally overnight. And I can testify personally that my house had two attempted burglaries, which were both reported to the police, and both caused because that was an easy escape route for any vandal. Uh, please stop me if I go over time, because I also like to refer to the parking situation. Thank you. Um, one, I'll go through very rapidly now. The Scout Hut is not owned by the church, it is owned by the Scout Association. I have documents here if you wish to see them, which as near as we can get to proof of ownership. The parking situation, you say about two cars per house. Uh, that is correct, and the government website, it says two to four cars per house. That has recently, or in 2015, changed, and it should be 2.25 cars per house. Also, on the plans here, it shows six spaces outside the houses. I'll be very interested because it shows me the width of the spaces. It does not show me the length. You'd be hard pushed to get six cars in there. Uh, highways parking in parallel parking the requirement allowed or recommended again on a government website is i got fortunately still talking english is 20 feet it should be 6.5 meters long by 2.76 meters wide to allow for parking on the public highway now all of these information are removed from government websites so the parking is completely out you're looking for 12 cars in reference to the houses and you're also looking at the extra seven included please remember we do need housing but the rights of people living in an area with uncharacteristic building is just as much a right even if it's under the human rights act thank you thank you Members, questions? Councillor Hunt. Just, just, can I ask, I mean the plot sizes look roughly the same as uh, established housing to me. Um, I was looking opposite, there's three units opposite these three. But if, if we were looking at an application, let's say, for two similar houses, in other words, similar to what's there already, and um, they were providing two parking spaces, would this recommendation be for refusal on the grounds that we weren't utilising the land to the best of its ability? What do you think? I, I don't think we can really answer that. We'd have to judge every application on its merits. Um, so it's not. we don't have a set... It, we, we look at a density of around 40 dwellings per hectare as a minimum, but quite often in streets like this and sites like this, it, it's more than that. Um, but we wouldn't be able to answer that question. A, a different, what is the density on this land? I haven't got an answer to that question. Um, could we, could we? we might be able to do a quick calculation and come back to you. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that'd be will be helpful. Yes, uh, Councillor, um, if, I, if I might uh, offer some assistance here. Um, when officers do look at schemes of this nature, uh, one of the key considerations is to look at the character and the grain of development within the local area. And this being one that we looked at, I mean, this is it's a, it's a shorter uh, sense of the depth of the garden. Um, in terms of the footprint, one himself is relatively within, keeping within the grain of development within the area. Thank you. Yeah. 
I, I inferred that. I'm just interested whether or not um, with the d whether or not the density uh, means that we could, for example, reject <laughs> this and come back with another application. That's what I'm looking at. Uh, I don't know if there's a. Just looking forward to having the answer to the question about the density. <coughs> We can take another question in the meantime. Yeah. yeah. Councillor Stubbs. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And two questions, really, which arise from um, the representation. So the first is about the status of the footpath. Now, um, you know, it's. I, mean, I, I think I know what. I think I know what the situation is on that. But could the officers explain? Does that have any status in terms of the planning decision we've been asked to make today? As I explained in the presentation, it, it currently isn't a recognised public right of way, but we understand it's under consideration. It is a matter that would be dealt with under separate legislation to planning. So if it does become recognised as a public right of way, the owners of the site would have a duty to, um, what's the word, uh, redirect it. I can't think of the term. Divert it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as it stands, um, it isn't a recognised public right of way, but we, we believe that is being considered as such. Yeah, so my, my understanding of the situation is in terms of the decision we're making here today on the planning committee, that we can't take that into account, but were a public right of way to be established by another part of the council, it might prevent implementation of the scheme. But in terms of the decision we've been asked to make here, it's not relevant. Can you confirm that? Yeah, it, it's, not, it's not something we can consider at this, under this decision, no. We have a question I had relates to. Apologies, oh, I, I can just say, say the strict interpretation is quite. What planning shouldn't do is replicate other areas of legislative control. Public rights away is dealt with under legislation. However, it's not an unreasonable consideration for you to be mindful of uh, of this matter and feel because there is some confusion about the designation of this uh, footpath as, as detailed by the deputation. That that's something that you are concerned with. Um, that might be a reason to defer an application, I'm going to be entirely honest with you. However, in this case, because there is available land where clearly a diverted footpath could be provided, officers are satisfied that even if there is an established public right-of-way through the site, there is an alternative available for it, and that would obviously all be picked up by that separate legislation, so there would be no uh, likelihood of any adverse or significant adverse implications from it. So I would want you to dismiss it entirely out of hand. It's something that you as decision-maker would want the contextual information for, but it's because there is that additional uh, route uh, around the red line of the applicant site, but through uh, the land control by the church, where we're satisfied that there will be no adverse implications should that be identified as a public right of way, and obviously then the appropriate diversion apply for in due course. Yeah, my other point is about some of the points that were made about parking and specifically the fact that we um, are, we as the local authority, do not have a five-year land supply and therefore the presumption in favour of sustainable development applies. So I just want to clarify from the officers, I know this is touched on in the report, but, um, you know, how these things all fit together. I mean, it's, I mean, basically the policy that we have in the local plan, I mean, it, could we ever actually apply that now or are we just... Re required to just implement national policy, which doesn't say these things, uh, on the grounds that we don't have a five-year land supply. Um, as always, planning is not black and white. The presumption is uh, a tilted balance, saying that, you know, effectively, where your policies are out of date, then you should look to grant it. However, the habitats regulations, which apply to the entirety of the city, then say that tilted balance wouldn't always necessarily apply in uh, overruling uh, planning uh, judgments. Uh, it isn't black and white, is the short answer. The application has to be assessed uh, looking at the MPPF as a whole, as a document. That requires good management of on-street parking and amenity, uh, good design uh, and good use of land for housing. So there is always that balance to strike. But certainly we feel that the uh, need for housing in the lack of five-year land supply is undeniably an extremely 
pertinent material consideration uh, that in the overall planning balance the uh, technical failure of a parking standard in this location with the provision and layout as provided uh, is insufficient to warrant refusal. But that's the judgment obviously members will have to come to individually. What you're referring to there is po national policies and the MPPF and clearly they all apply um, and they all have to be taken into account but we're talking here about a local policy um, and so you know my um, understanding of this is that the local policies are now um, overridden by the presumption. To be absolutely clear, that, that's not the case. Uh, the development plan, the local policy, is still the primacy uh, in there, um, but there is a tilted balance applied and how that tilts the presumption in favour of grants, even if it is contrary to policy, based on whether the policies are considered to be out of date. Primarily, the five-year land supply or housing provision policy is a matter of judgment uh, to apply. We, I would very much strongly encourage you, significant weight has to be given to housing need and the lack of a five-year housing supply. Uh, that is a, a clear national guidance and, and a guidance I can professionally provide. Um, but we also have to take into account the privacy of other constraints, such as habitat regulations, uh, to look at how that affects the tilted balance. So it is always a mixture of judgment. It cannot ever be said the local plan is entirely disapplied. It, how you apply those policies is, how, is your judgment and not based on the advice we provide in our reports. Councillor Norton, did you wish to? No, it's okay, thank you. Um, right. Councillor Stubbs, my question was about the alleyway and Councillor Stubbs' answer. Uh, Councillor Atkins. Uh, one of the uh, deputies mentioned the idea of a 2.25 parking requirement. Is, is that accurate? Or where does that come from? Uh, I was wondering where that figure had been arrived at from. Was, was that in relation to the on-street parking they were talking about? Uh, it, it, it may have been. Yeah. They implied that there was a requirement in new development for more two than two, two spaces. And yeah. I just wanted to confirm that our requirement was, was two, two spaces. Yeah, ours is two, I believe. Two, two spaces. Two, yeah, two spaces. Um, just a, a, a follow-up on parking then. Um, so first of all, on, on that particular plan, presumably there will then be dropped curbs and dropped curbs tend to bring with them a protected area of road that, that you're not allowed to park on, you know, those kind of white tees. Won't those extend further into the yellow spaces that you've created on, uh, on, as on-street parking as generally those tees go beyond the, the distance of the actual edge of the drive itself? Um, and I mean, I, I know that we can't decide on the basis of a planning application that's not before us, but w what is the function of these little wings on the side of the house? And, and if they'd been set further back, wouldn't it have been possible to park two cars end to end if those driveways were, were two car length in, in size? Uh, firstly, I'd say that the, we're assessing the application on a basis of one parking space per dwelling. The applicants chose to show that on the plan, the um, these, but I mean, that's that's. I think they were just indicating that there is some on-street parking that, that may not be entirely accurate as to how it's laid out, but essentially we are looking at one space, one parking space per dwelling. Uh, in terms of the design, this is design that was put forward to us um, to, to achieve the floor space that they wanted with four bedrooms. Potentially, you know, potentially with different design with less bedrooms might be able to have um, a different layout. But what is the function of the little ear bits oh, on the side of it? So this bit? Yeah. The, 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 no, 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 sorry. We, we, here? On all, on all of them, the, 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 two, the two kind of extra bits what? with the funny circular thing in the center. Is that a dining table? What is that? The circle? Yeah. yeah. If, if I may assist you, they have illustrated that as with a dining table, so that you end up with two ground floor oh. reception rooms uh, on each house. Um, uh, but it is that fundamental point, yes, a different design would give you a different output. We are obviously obliged to assess this design, which yeah, if you took that wing away, so that has a bedroom uh, in the first floor which, and a dining room on the ground floor from the illustration, uh, but it would be a smaller house without them. Yeah. Thank you. Got an answer for Councillor Hunt uh, right. on the on the dense 68 dwellings per hectare. This is 68 dwellings per hectare. We'll look for a minimum. Yeah. Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, was going to ask one of the questions about the footpath, which is uh, which is part of Mr. Lewis's 
um, deputation which uh, Councillor Stubbs has covered. Um, Mr Hooper made two points, one about the construction vehicles, noise and disruption, I'm assuming he meant uh, during the construction phase as opposed to the people living there, although I guess it could be both, um, and also the point was made about overlooking um, uh, from his or his house being overlooked by the new houses. Um, I know the answer to both but I think it's only fair that he's come along and made those points that they are addressed um, so I'm taking this opportunity to raise them so that the planning officers can address both construction vehicle noise and disruption and the overlooking from the houses opposite. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in respect of construction um, issues we've, we've got condition 11 uh, which is for a construction management plan to be approved and agreed by the council before they start work. So that would um, cover deliveries and, and access by large vehicles and how it was managed throughout the whole construction process. Uh, in terms of overlooking, we have, we have taken an assessment of the separation distances between buildings, <coughs> which these would have a fairly typical separation distance that exists along the road, along Compton Road at the moment, between op with the, the opposite houses. Um, there's an actual separation distance of six, approximately 16 metres between the front of the dwellings and the front of the ones to the north. Um, and that is considered to be a, a sufficient distance to prevent any um, adverse impact in terms of overlooking. Councillor Smythe. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to return to the matter of the footpath um, because I'm not clear. Um, when you made your presentation, planning officer, uh, <coughs> you said that you had referred to the footpath on page 20, paragraph 12, a condition, and said that during um, the um, <coughs> development and, and the security for pedestrians using the footpath would be um, uh, an important thing to preserve, therefore implying that there is going to be a footpath here. Um, I wondered why we couldn't put a condition on the planning um, application um, to make sure there is a footpath there, um, especially as it's shown on the plans. I appreciate that this uh, isn't on the, uh, within the red line of the development, but um, I think we could be clearer about the situation of the footpath, which would put uh, to rest some of the fears of the deputies. The short answer is the a requirement for a footpath on the adjacent uh, land, adjacent to the application site, uh, doesn't pass the test for necessity. Uh, it isn't uh, a requirement. If there was a public right of way established, uh, and we knew that was a, an incontrovertible fact, then I think that would be a condition we could easily uh, impose. But at this stage, uh, the best information we have is an application to have it registered as a public right of way, and consequently, to require third party land to be used for uh, creating a new public footpath would not be uh, a lawful uh, condition, in our opinion. I hear what you say, but I don't think that makes sense in the light of the fact that it's probably been there for a long time. This uh, People have been able to walk across the site in some place, and I would be. Uh, um, wanting um, um, local authorities to safeguard such uh, customary rights of way even where they're not um, legally proven. And I, I just doesn't quite make sense to me, and I wonder if you could clarify that further, please. If I can, so local authorities do safeguard uh, such rights of way through the Country and Wildlife Act, uh, through the rights of way process. That's a parallel system, not for this planning committee. We feel as do you, there is a reasonable likelihood a footpath right of way may be established, which is why we have accommodated that concept, as I mentioned earlier to Councillor Stubbs, in the context of the decision making, we recognise there is an opportunity to divert it. If that does happen, we have included the, ensured the conditions can manage access through that footpath if it is established uh, along the boundary edge of the site. Um, but because we can't require it, because it is dealt with by separate legislation and not currently an identified right of way to the best of our uh, information, we do not feel a further condition can be imposed. I'm sorry to come back again, but it does seem to me that it is the building of these, these buildings that would stop the pre present right of uh, present um, pathway that's used by people to go through the site. And surely it's not impossible for the developer to cooperate to try and get this right of way proved before they start developing. <coughs> 
In, indeed not, and one hopes and encourages them uh, to do so. They've certainly looked at this matter, hence these plans are available in the conversations with the Church, but it's not a requisite uh, of the Planning Commission. It f fails the test of necessity because there is separate legislation dealing with rights of way, and it would not be for the Planning Committee to co-opt uh, that legislative function. Questions from the Chair, then from Councillor Udi. Um, from the Chair, just to follow that one up, uh, an application for right-of-way is in progress at the moment. Would that, could that be enforceable, um, assuming it were granted, uh, to preserve the, f the footpath? There, there would be no possibility then of stopping up a footpath between Compton Road and Battenberg Avenue. Would that be the situation? I, I could refer you to the legal uh, team for more information, but in short, yes, there is a separate process. There's two decisions to be made here as the rights of way authority, so not the planning authority, whether there is a right of way, um, which would immediately prevent this application being uh, developed because it would be obstructing the right of way, and thus a further application would be needed to divert that right of way around the edges illustrated uh, on this plan. So there are two further decisions for Portsmouth, but not for this planning committee. A second question for me um, concerns the matter of the Scout Hut. That is not a planning consideration because that is ownership. Am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> a third question. Can we go back to the ground floor design, the ground floor plans? Could you explain to me within the building <clears throat> themselves what are the significance of the white space, the blue space, and the green space? Because um, being old, my eyes are not so, good enough to read that. Sure. To give you a, a quick answer, the, the white space uh, outside the buildings are uh, parking uh, and paving. Inside yes. the building, that represents the kitchen space, that is countertop. Uh, and indeed that therefore illustrates that the blue area is in effect which we in planning would generally call uh, non-habitable space. So that's not where you're going to spend uh, a lot of time. There's, it's a small kitchen and a hallway uh, and the downstairs cloakroom. The green space is the rest of the ground floor, uh, an open uh, corridor, a dining room and a lounge as annotated. But obviously people would use those reception rooms as they so choose. Thank you. Councillor Udi. Um, could I ask Mr Lewis some questions, please, regarding the uh, scout group, please? Thank you, Chair. It is rele a planning relevant question. Um, I think I have a, a way that I'm going with it, but I need to use Councillor Hunt's Bible at the same time uh, in a moment. Thank you. Um, did you say that your scout group, because uh, uh, you had the ownership of the, the place, but you were told, were you told to leave the scout hut? Uh, due to strange events, we could no longer, we used to use for meetings the actual halls. Due to strange events, the halls were closed. So uh, we had no decision. We couldn't just sort of not do anything. So we had to move the boys or the children up to the Scout Centre in Hilsey. But we are still the legal owners of the actual Scout Hut. Uh, the present moment in time, it's being used for storage because we switched to the church halls when they were benevolent to us because we do actually work with a lot of disabled children. So equipment relevant to that is also stored in the Scout Hut. But we are the legal, the Scout Association are the legal owners of the actual <laughs> building. Does is that answer your question, please? Uh, a little bit. Is your Scout group that was specifically there, has that disbanded or is that still going? Uh, we amalgamated into the 104th. Some of the children remained there. Uh, others, it didn't fit in with their lifestyle because it is such a cramped conditions compared to the original church halls that wheelchair access and that sort of thing is exceedingly limited. And uh, not all the disabled children are with us and some of them their lifestyle with the parents unfortunately didn't fit in with the distance they had to travel so not all of those are with us a few did remain yes I think that's all thank you thank you 
If there are no further questions, may I come to comments from members? Yes, Councillor Stubbs. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I mean, you know, when, when looking at these decisions, one of the things I think we always have to bear in mind is, you know, what other things could go on the site anyway. Um, and I have to say, what we've got in front of us, I think, is a pretty good um, application. I mean, it does provide some parking. It's um, large houses rather than much smaller properties or flats, uh, which we see on so many other locations in the city. Um, the reality of it is, is that if this application, instead of being for six large houses, was for 20 flats and no parking, given our position, particularly in respect of not having a land supply, in other words, being, by being behind on our building target, we lose planning powers, particularly noticeable with that, that if that application came for the 20 flats and no parking, and we refused it here and went to appeal, I think the chances of that application passing would be quite high, quite honestly. So, you know, with this scheme that we've got in front of us, I think looking at it in its own right is pretty good. I mean, I do take, I'm very mindful of the matters to do with, with the scouts and so forth, but that's all outside of planning. I mean, the land ownership issues um, about access to buildings and so forth, that's not something we can consider. From our point of view, this might as well be an empty site because the owners will be within, you know, it will, I mean, the owners, if they chose to do it, could presumably just knock everything down and present us with an empty site, and they could do that. So that's the starting point, really. We can't take into account what's there. We don't have any powers to make people um, let out buildings and use them in a certain way. So the scheme that we've got in front of us, I think, is a positive one. I'm happy to propose the report. Uh, the officer's report has been proposed by Councillor Stubbs. Other members? Norton. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, the only issue for me, and we've raised it over and over here, is about the alleyway, and I know there are some contentious kind of answers there about um, whether that falls into planning and what have you, but I do think it's worth noting that, you know, this is very close to uh, Cliffdale Primary Academy. Um, we mentioned this last night in the briefing. There are 116 uh, students that go there aged 11 to 16 and some of them have really complex learning difficulties many of whom uh, suffer with autism and a change of routine um, you know moving to, lots of families I think move to the area to take their children to that school and they would use an alleyway to get to school um, if the alleyway is not there anymore they'll have to drive their car around it's a huge change of routine and and again there's two schools in the areas and it's it's used by a lot of of students to to, to get home so I mean the question for me is my you know, reasonable likelihood was what we heard, wasn't it? There was a reasonable likelihood that this alleyway will remain, and I, I think that's the best we're going to get on that. Um, so, I mean, the rest of it, I think there is no real material grounds to you know, prevent this from, from going forward. Um, so it's just the, the reasonable likelihood, and I think that probably is um, uh, the best we're going to get. So I'm happy to second Councillor Stubbs's recommendation. Thank you. Other comments from members? Councillor Hunt. I'm troubled by the application, uh, not because of necessarily the housing density. I mean, I've just read page 136, so many of the, much of the housing density in Portsmouth, particularly in the south, around Somers Town and other places, and in this case, for example, if you were going nearer to London Road <coughs> or Cockner Road would be about 100, maybe even 200 dwellings per hectare. The bird's eye view of this shows the plot sizes to be roughly similar to those that are established in the street. But the difference here is that those houses, for example, you know, would be, are, are divided, so it's two houses per plot size. And it's always difficult when you um, have a street style which is very well established in this 30s style and then you're presented with something that looks different. This has a kind of 50s, 60s, 70s style, look, 50s, 60s style to it. And the one thing that always grieves me is, as people who live here, is we're all subjected to different architectural fashions you know, these fashions come and go, and you can look around the city, and you know a particular architect has done a particular building because it's done in a particular style, and, you know, it spoils the grain and the context, which I think was mentioned earlier. Uh, 
of the street scene. But does this one actually, is it so out of kilter with the street scene that it should be overturned on those grounds? That is one that I'm having difficulty with. So the density, the plot size, the difference. It has a sharpness to it which doesn't sit in with the street scene. The pointed features up going up into the roof and those gullies down between. Um, but is that so awful that we want to throw it out? For me, the jury's out on, on that one. I think there has been an attempt to provide spaces for parking, but of course, people along the road there, you can see it. They are park probably in front of the scout hut already, so they're going to lose on-street parking just there, aren't they? And I was wondering what the, the boxes were on the, uh, on the street that we saw painted in front of... Uh, I'm not aware that this is a residence parking scheme here, no. So, so I just wondered what those boxes were painted on the street uh, that we saw on, on the bird's eye view. Um, they were outside each house, those up there. Or just showing car sizes, I presume. Or? Yeah, it's just a, an, an indication of, yeah. of what the applicant's opinion of parking provision. It is not something the council yeah. has So any, anyone can, can park in those little spaces, things, so people can get their car out. The problem is, is I agree with people. I mean, I live in a street where you're forever doing Mexican standoffs and taxis want to go this way. If the city was a one-way system, we wouldn't be having these sorts of arguments, I think, about parking so much. If you're going up Compton Road, coming down another, is it Methuen, another one nearby? Uh, Meredith. Which one? Meredith. Meredith, going up one. But then you put that to residents, oh no, they don't want to change that either, you know. So sometimes it's very difficult. On balance, I don't want it because of the parking standards. So I'm going to move a rejection because I sympathise hugely with the residents in North End and in Cockner and in Hillsey. We have the same problems where I live in South Sea. We have a car uh, parking standard which is uh, two, two and a half. Yes. Two, this doesn't meet that. I've weighed that up, I really have, against the need for larger, more family accommodation. But residents come along already today and given evidence that there's these uh, standoffs and these arguments about um, going down the street with people reversing and I don't want to add to that. They're going to lose this on-street parking in front of the houses and uh, they would probably go away from here very, very annoyed if it were put through. Um, I, I, and I take that into account but I also am very objective about what I'm saying and what I'm doing. Uh, uh, I think that they should reduce the uh, units on the site that they should provide two off-street car parking spaces. This can be achieved here. We've heard it's 68 units per hectare in this particular location and our minimum standard is 40. If they would come down to 40 it would better respect the housing density, density in this locality. I think the street scene would look better and I think that the um, the run of houses would look better too. So on those grounds I shall move a refusal on the parking grounds and wonder if they will come back so you're, with a less intensive development. So you are proposing a refusal on the grounds of overdevelopment of site and inadequate car Yes, park. and I did come I did come begin to convince myself on that throughout my argument, didn't I? So yes I did. I did. I did. You yeah. yourself into it. Yeah, I did. You're right. Um, is there a seconder for that? Sorry? No, there may be. Okay, Councillor Udi. Um, this might be a mixture of questions and comments because I'm trying to use the book and see. Uh, of course, slight question. Could there be um, anything in the way of uh, legal agreement to provide uh, remuneration to the scout group about the loss of their disabled members um, not being able to go anywhere? That is not a, park, uh, a planning consideration, unfortunately. You can't, do it. you can't do it in law. I can't see anything about an equalities impact assessment on this. I'm trying to find it. Can someone point me to it? Because I think there should have been regarding the... Because of the people around Cliftow and the people that had been using the scout group before and the fact that those 
things, especially regarding the footpath, has been taken away from a specific group of people at this point. Mr. McGuire. Yeah, so no, individual equalities impact assessments are not done for planning applications. Uh, there is a general public sector equalities duty that members should have in mind. Uh, and clearly, if you feel that there is a, a matter of equalities that isn't adequately accommodated within this scheme, uh, you can either come to a conclusion on that or we can uh, give you further advice. Uh, but we don't do EQIAs for individual planning applications. Could I request a deferral for one to be undertaken? If I may assist, I, I can give you sort of the head, heads up on what that would that would be, and it's because there are opportunities on, to take public pavements to an alternative route uh, that it would be insufficient. So while there will be interference uh, with that, that issue, uh, it would only be a material consideration for you to give weight to in the application, whether the loss, if there is such loss, of public footpath through the site or loss of disabled access community spaces is sufficient to warrant refusal, so that you wouldn't actually have any more information than you do today. See, that's why I'm up with community spaces, but it's been shut for a year and I'm kind of stuck. Any advice from any other councillors would be very grateful right now. But, um, right. Give me a moment. Thank you. Okay. Other comments from other members? Uh, Councillor Jones. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I think when you have um, developments like this that come forward that are in the middle of um, already very built up and established um, communities and streets of housing it's never easy and I'm particularly sympathetic with Mr Hooper uh, Mr Lewis and the other neighbours that live immediately opposite the site quite disappointed to hear that they weren't consulted ahead of um, a planning application being submitted and I don't mean the public consultation that was carried out I mean them specifically being made aware I think that that would have been quite useful and it may have alleviated some of the concerns they have, particularly around construction and other things. Um, we did hear from, um, from Rebecca, the planning officer, about uh, condition 11 around the construction of vehicles. Um, and having uh, a large construction site at the end of my road a few years ago that went on for almost a year, I absolutely appreciate the points that you're making. Um, and it does have an impact on people's lives. And if someone's having um, a new kitchen put in and there are works vans outside for a couple of weeks, you live with it. These things happen. But when it's you know a significant development, and for mine it was over a hundred flats at the end of my road, uh, and I can tell you that the whole road was clogged up. We had mud up the road, grit up the road. I mean, you know, the council were forever having to come and clean the road because of um, the impact of, of that construction. So I fully appreciate what was um, being said, and I think if this does go ahead today under condition 11, um, a request to the planning officer or whoever executes the condition thereafter is that the immediate neighbours are kept advised on um, the conditions contained within um, Condition 11. Um, for me, this is um, actually more black and white than we would otherwise initially think. Um, Unfortunately, whilst there are concerns around the public footway, that's not a material planning consideration, and probably a comment is that it's really regrettable that the council hasn't executed that application for the footway before now. I mean, we heard from Mr Lewis that was submitted at some point in 2018. Um, if that had have been executed already, we may be having a slightly different conversation today, but we are where we are. Um, in terms of the main issues, which I think are very well summarised on the first page of this particular report, it talks about the principle of the development itself. So in principle, is this stretch of a residential street in Portsmouth suitable for residential development? Well, on the face of it, you'd have to say yes to that. Um, the design, including the impact on the heritage assets, well, that's clearly um, the church behind um, and the um, juxtaposition of the church and houses, considering the church has houses around it already. Um, even if we didn't like it, it wouldn't stand up at um, a, an appeal I'm sure so I think that is also um, acceptable um the internal living conditions and the impact on residential amenity. Well, the internal living conditions for whoever may live there will be perfectly acceptable. We've got far less adequate housing in this city already. The impact on the residential amenity, yeah, there, there will be an impact. We can't say there won't be because, you know, they have been used to looking at a single story um, scout hut. Um, okay, yes, a, a quite a tall uh, vicarage house, but actually for the majority of that space, it is single story and therefore offers them light and um, vision 
region straight through to the south of the city. So there will be an impact on that. But the question then is, is that impact significant enough to warrant a refusal? Um, and I think if we try to base anything on that particular issue, it would be overturned at appeal and this council would be uh, fined for having made a wrong decision. Um, highways implications, for me, this is the biggest issue, issue of the whole application um, because it's not meeting our current um, parking standards. Um, we've heard it is two spaces per dwelling and this is offering one. I think with a redesign, as um, Councillor Atkins suggested, pushing the dining room back a bit, you could have had um, two parking spaces, one behind the other, potentially. Um, but nonetheless, this is not our application. It's the application of, of the developer um, and whoever they're working with, their partners. Um, so the parking thing is definitely the key thing for me. And when I read this last night, that's the thing. PCS 17 is the thing that I was I was looking at. In terms of sustainable transport and other applications in the area, in North End particularly, where we have mitigated and we have allowed one space per dwelling rather than two because they're on a bus route, whilst I don't like that we have done it precedent has been set by this council over a number of years and therefore for us to refuse this on the basis of not providing adequate parking again is absolutely challengeable legally and this council would end up being financially uh, detrimented for it in my opinion um, sustainable design and construction well, that would be covered through conditions and the trees and special protection again there are a couple of TPO trees on the site which we're aware of and the developer is clearly going to have to work around them so on balance whilst I have absolute empathy with what's been said today and also having looked at the objections that there were quite a lot that came in that were online um, I just don't see how legally with any kind of strength we're going to be able to um, uh, uphold a refusal if this was appealed so I'm going to have to support it okay I propose to move to the vote the first one it has been proposed by councillor Stubbs and seconded by Councillor Norton that we um, approve this application. Those in favour of approval, please show. One, two, three, four. Those against, please show. Two. Those abstaining, one. Uh, the application is granted. Thank you very much for your deputations, gentlemen. Uh, they were very well put. We now move on to... Uh, application 2 which you will find on page 21 which is for 33 Castle Road South Sea construction of rear extension may I have to the table Mr. Sharman Ron Sharman uh, Matthew Anderson and Joe Mosa please May I have the officers report, please? Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, first of all, I'd just direct you to um, supplementary matters. Uh, there are two items that have been included on this application. One is um, a typo on the policy. It should have referred to policy PCS 23 in the report, Design and Conservation, not PCS 13. And following uh, receipt of amended floor plans, um, there is an amended drawings list for Condition 2. The application before you, councillors, involves a proposed rear extension and alterations to the front of number 33 Castle Road, an end of terrace three storey dwelling with a basement on the southeast side of the road. It's a locally listed building and is located within the Castle Road conservation area. The property is also the subject of an Article 4.2 direction with respect to various alterations that can take place to the front of a property that would otherwise be permitted development. 
This shows the application site and its two nearest neighbours, number 31 to the north and number 35 to the south. So the application site goes down to there. And number 35 is also a locally listed building and both number 31 and 35 have rear projections. This is the front elevation of the property, so it's the central property, it's painted brickwork and you have single glazed uh, timber siding sash windows. There's also a basement door at the bottom and that's the, the front door there. I'll also take this opportunity to show the, an existing um, sort of side access and conservatory area uh, to number uh, 31 and that's sandwiched between the two buildings. These are examples of uh, fenestration at the front of the building. So we have single glazed timber sliding sash windows, the basement door and the front door. This is a view of the rear elevation with non-original additions, single storey additions at the rear and its rear garden. Number 35 to the south, which is to the left of this photograph, uh, has a first floor tile hung bathroom extension here and just off nearly off the photo, uh, photograph is an obscure glazed window and uh, also uh, this is a single story pitched roof um, projection that contains the accommodates the kitchen and on number 31 to the north you can just see to the right it has a blank um, elevation for the three story element I'll refer you to a two story projection at the rear um, later on um, So the proposal seeks permission for a two-storey rear extension plus an enlargement of the existing basement and replacement windows and doors to the front elevation. The extension would measure 3.7 metres deep, 5.3 metres wide, that's essentially the whole width of the property, and 5.5 metres in height, topped with a parapet-style roof with a dental decorative brick detail referencing that that's found on the main building at the moment. It would contain timber frame sliding sash windows and timber doors with brickwork to match as closely as possible. The basement will be limited to the same footprint as the proposed extension above ground level, um, but this will be, um, the basement will be entirely under ground level. At the front, uh, there will be double glazed slender timber sliding sash windows that will replace the single glazed non-original windows and the front door and basement door would be also replaced with appropriate timber doors. If I can point out to you on the rear extension, the two first floor windows which serve an ensuite and a dressing room, uh, we've received the amended plans to show these would be obscure glazed and you'll see there's a condition attached um, to the recommendation to say they'll be obscure glazed and have restricted openings um, to uh, respect privacy. In design terms, whilst the extension is reasonably large, its scale is not considered inappropriate and its materials, architectural features and fenestration proportions and symmetry are considered to result in an acceptable form of development in terms of both the recipient building and in the context of the wider area. As such, it is considered that the character and appearance of the Castlereagh Conservation Area would be pres preserved by the proposal. Now to go on to residential amenity, so the two closest properties are number 31 and 35. Uh, with respect to number 35 to the south, um, there is a broom handle. I don't know if you can see that yellow thing. That indicates the, the depth of the proposed extension. This would come 2.2 metres beyond this um, bathroom extension of the next door neighbour. Uh, these photos are, are taken from number 35's garden area. So the impact on number 35 would mostly be felt within the outside space serving this property, given that its ground and first floor windows are largely screened by its own proje projections. So you've got a uh, utility area there, um, a bedroom, and then this second floor window um, would have a clear view over the, uh, the two-storey extension, which its overall height would finish in line with the eave line of number 35. Um, the bathroom window that you can see there is obscure glaze set to the south of the first floor extension and does not serve a principal room and therefore the impact on this window is not considered likely to be significant. 
Uh, taking measurements on site, 2.2 metres gets you to, sorry for my shaky hand, <laughs> gets you to this outside edge of this window here to give you an idea of the, how far it projects beyond here. The proposed extension would be visible uh, from the eastern end of the garden and the narrow garden space adjacent to the kitchen. And uh, it is noted that the projection at the, on the other neighbour, at number 37, if I can go back, their other neighbour also has a blank um, extension that extends out. So they do have a, a slight tunnelling effect already. Um, so that is accepted, but it's considered that... Um, the proposed, whilst the proposed extension would add to this sense of enclosure within this outside space, it's not considered to such an extent to justify withholding planning permission. Again, as I referred to, obscure glazing to the proposed first floor windows of the extension would address privacy concerns. Being to the north of number 35, the extension is not considered to result in any significant loss of light to this property to the south. So turning to number 31, to the north, the amended plans um, that we received have reduced the depth of the extension, so now it falls in line with the main three-storey rear extension, uh, uh, three-storey main ele rear elevation, uh, and therefore light and outlook to the east-facing windows is now considered little affected because it's in line with this uh, rear elevation, so the, these three east-facing windows will be uh, little affected. There is a conservatory that I referred you to the, on the first um, photograph that's sandwiched between the two buildings. It's not this element here, that's part of the planning application site, but it's in there. Um, it's inevitable that it's going to lose some light um, to it. it is already, light is already restricted um, to that conservatory by virtue of being squeezed between the buildings. There is also a kitchen, ground floor kitchen window. That's the sole window serving this kitchen, and that's in this two-storey projection at the rear. So part of it is already screened by the boundary treatment. Um, it will lose some degree of light and outlook. However, it's not considered to such an extent, again, to justify refusal. The actual and perceived overlooking is addressed again by the um, obscure glazing at first floor level. These, wind these photographs have been taken from within number 31, so that's the conservatory that I was referring to, and we're looking to the rear now. This is taken from the kitchen window. Now, I am standing to the far left to get a view um, at the, where the extension would be. Obviously, if you stood more square in front of the window, your outlook is going to be relatively clear. Uh, and again, this is taken from the east-facing dining um, room window, um, and the extension would be level with this, this elevation here. So to conclude, the scale, external appearance and materials of the proposed development are considered acceptable and would preserve the character and appearance of the Castle Road Conservation Area and the setting of the identified local listed buildings, which are the application site and uh, next door. Um, and the proposal is not considered to result in any significant adverse loss of residential amenity for occupiers surround of surrounding properties, and therefore it's <coughs> considered capable of support subject to the amended drawing condition on your supplementary planning matters. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr Moser, I assume that you are not an objector. No, You're not, right. In which case, the objectors, Mr Sharman and Mr Anderson, you have six minutes each, but to give your presentation to the committee. If you'll press the button on the right-hand side, uh, that will turn you on. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Our family have lived at 31 Castle Road, which is next door to the development site, since the 1970s. My father now lives on his own, and my family and I visit and stay with him at weekends. I live with my family in London, but I retain a number of property investments along Castle Road and in the wider area of South Sea, and therefore I care a lot about the local area. I would like to point out that we are in favour of improvements and development at 33 Castle Road, but what we do object to is the sheer size and pro of the proposed development, as we have detailed in our letters of the 11th of September and the 14th of October, both of which you should have copies. In summary, we have five objections. Number one detrimental impact upon residential amenities. We believe the proposed development is a direct contravention of the Portsmouth Local Plan 2012 paragraph 1.25, which ensures that the new development does not have detrimental impact on people's quality of life. 
We do not agree with the heritage statement made by the applicant, which states that the proposed design does not present any detrimental impact to the neighbouring properties. Number two, need to avoid town cramming. We believe the proposed development is in direct contravention of the Portsmouth Local Plan 5.3 to 5.38 housing density and would significantly alter the fabric of Conservation Area 12 and amount to serious cramming at the rear of the terrace. Due to the relative asymmetric geometry of our houses, the development would extend to less than a 100 centimetre gap between our houses, creating a pinch point and casting a shadow with a long corridor of darkness. Number three, impact of noise generated by the proposal. During the construction, there will be considerable noise generated. We currently have quiet enjoyment at the rear of our house and this will change with the new development. Number four, loss of privacy overlooking loss of daylight and sunlight. We believe the proposed development is in contravention of the Portsmouth Local Plan PCS 23 Design and Conservation which ensures that a good standard of living for occupiers and neighbours aims to achieve the highest quality of standard design and development across the city and protect and enhance the city's conservation areas. Our kitchen and garden will both be severely overlooked uh, from the advanced windows on the second floor in a with a serious invasion of our privacy and the sheer two-storey scale would lead to a loss of daylight and sunlight from the pinch point of the extension back to the original house. Number four. Number five, non-compliance with government guidance. We believe the proposal is in direct contravention of the guidance of government planning policy statement PPS1, paragraph 17 and 19, and government planning policy statement PPS3, housing, paragraphs 13 to 14, which outlined the government is committed to protecting and enhancing the quality of the natural and historic environment, and good design should contribute positively to making places better for people. In conclusion, we would be happy to see the development scaled back <clears throat> in length to solve our objections. We suggest that the compromise red line of the extension as indicated on our drawing uh, on our letter of the 22nd of October would be a satisfactory solution. Again, we are grateful that the Planning Committee would consider our objection when, con when deciding this application and appreciate the opportunity of being able to speak here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Anderson. Um, so thank you for the, the chance to speak uh, this morning. Uh, so I've lived at uh, 35 Castle Road for the last um, five years. Um, my main concern really is, is the projection of the, um, the first floor um, proposed extension. So we're coming 2.2 metres beyond uh, the extension you can see there of, of our bathroom. Um, we, we already have a building um, to the other side of us that I, I think probably wasn't an overdevelopment, but this seems to, to uh, be further uh, town uh, cramming. Um, I think it will have quite a significant tunnelling effect in that area outside our, our kitchen door. It's also going to affect the, the light to the garden, but possibly more importantly the, the light to our dining room. So as a terrace property, uh, the only light that we get to our dining room is, is through the, the back of the house, through the through the utility. Um, so the, uh, the, the the main objection really is is to the the size of that the, the first floor extension. Uh, if it if it if it went up only to the, the back of our um, extension on, on the bathroom, the, the impact would be would be much less um, to us. It, it's it's as it comes further out. Um, a couple of other just more specific points. I think there's been some challenges around the the kind of the process of this application and the, and the timing. It was disappointing when you had correct plans submitted on the 11th of December. Uh, up until that point, um, the, the plans were incorrect in the dimensions of, of the extension of our bathroom. It, it made it look as if the planned extension was only going to become out uh, 1.2 metres beyond our, our bathroom. So it's quite a significant uh, change in understanding that, that orientation. Um, we've also got some concerns about the details of the plans. That, that the it looks like the planned extension will butt up right against the the the, um, the extension of the bathroom. There's no details about what will happen to the tiles on the side of our um, bathroom extension, and will also come up to the side of our, our kitchen extension. 
Um, we've got some real concerns about the structural impacts, particularly of the extension of the basements. Um, the, these, these are old properties, um, and, and, and the, the foundations are, 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 you know, are not to the same as uh, modern properties. Um, so just uh, briefly, really, to, um, to kind of conclude, um, I, th I think number 33 is probably one of the, the oldest properties on the street, so dating back to, to 1790. Um, and the proposed size and dimensions of, of this extension, I think, will contribute to town cramming and have a detrimental impact on, on the character of the local area. Uh, it's also going to result in an incongruous and visually obtrusive feature that won't respect the building and the wider terrace. Um, the design seemed to fail to preserve the character and appearance of Castle Road um, conservation area. Uh, I think some of this could be mitigated by, by reducing the overall size uh, and limiting extension to a, a ground floor extension of the kitchen. We, we wouldn't have an objection to that. Um, is the, the, the basement is a concern in terms of the structural impact uh, and the first floor is a concern in terms of the, the tunnelling effect and, and the loss of light uh, to our property. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Merza. Um, good morning. Um, I, rep I represent the architectural practice which carried out the design for this proposal. Uh, with respect to the design, uh, we were very mindful of the, the building's locally listed status and very conscious of the impact any addition would pose to the recipient building and its surroundings. Our remit was to extend the modest property to afford much needed living space while preserving the integrity of the historic building. Extensions of this sort are commonplace in the area and can be found elsewhere. Um, there's ample garden space, um, which makes this proposal uh, feasible without any overdevelopment. The proposed two-story rear extension and enlargement of the basement have been detailed in a way that suits the building. Uh, the, the brickwork shall be matched in color and detail. Um, these these de details include um, arch brickwork above the window heads, um, a parapet for the flat roof extension with matching brick dental course. Um, all replacement and new doors and windows shall be made of quality timber joinery. Uh, the size of the rear extension has been carefully considered from the outset, uh, but has been then further reduced uh, during the application process to ensure that the impact on the adjacent neighbors is minimized. Um, as far as the, the front facade, um, the only work to the front facade proposed is um, the replacement of like-for-like -like windows and doors with quality timber uh, joinery. Uh, this one, coupled with the sensitive detailing of the rear extension, uh, this proposal, we believe, will still preserve and enhance the appearance in the Castle Road Conservation Area. Um, um, ob objecting representations have been made. Um, a concern that the impact on, on the existing two-story extension um, previously constructed at number 35 relate to concerns that shall be appropriately addressed with a party wall agreement. Uh, this process under the Party Wall Act 1996 is uh, separate to the planning process and provides a mechanism to ensure avoidance of disputes and agreements of satisfactory construction detailing. During the building control process, a structural engineer shall be appointed to carry out all necessary structural design and calculations for approval before any work shall commence. A Party Wall Agreement will also be in place prior to commencement. A concern of the impact of the extension um, on number 31 to the north was raised for fear that it would hinder aspect from the ground floor windows uh, and cause a sense of enclosure. To address this concern, the depth of the proposed extension was reduced and it now sits in line with the three-story rear elevation of number 31. In addition, uh, as has been mentioned, the uh, obscured glazing is proposed on the first floor windows which avoids the chance of overlooking uh, in order to ensure the, that there's no loss of privacy for the neighbors. Um, great care has been given to the design and impact considerations of this proposal. Our application or our applicant is keen to, ex um, to extend and refurbish this property as his family home uh, to a very high standard. Uh, care has been taken to enhance the property without causing detriment to the neighbors and I hope you'll see fit to support our proposal in line with the planning officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moser. Members, questions? Um, Councillor Jones. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Moser just made um, a deputation to say that the 
rear extension of number 33 would only come out to the rear to be in line with the rear elevation of number 31 is that correct i thought that we you had said that it would come further forward so that it would have affected the light into the kitchen of number 31 no it would come in line in line with this there. rear three-story elevation <coughs> would be in line with that um there's <laughs> okay. So that's the kitchen window. The kitchen window is beyond the extension. Okay, sorry, I thought it protruded out further than that. Thank you. Um, Can I, on, on the southern side, how much further did the, is the proposed extension going to come past that um, extension, which is a bathroom? How much? 2.2 metres. Sorry? 2.2 it will go past it. Past by that by 2.2 metres, which on site when we measured it, it came to that point of this window. To but it will, it, yeah, sure. So, and it will come in line with the uh, elevation that yes. we can see on the south side. Yes. Mm. There, so it would be in line with that. Yeah. And in terms of this property, um, when you're measuring on site, 2.2 metres comes to this point. <coughs> but behind. Yeah. yeah. But You might be able to, no, uh, where yeah. am I, uh, application site, that's, yeah. that's the existing rear elevation, it this is the three there. story, so it comes to that point and it comes across yeah. there. Yeah. And that's the kitchen window. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Do you wish to follow that up, Councillor Hunt? No, thank you very much. Right, Councillor Atkins. Councillor Jones actually asked the same question I was going to ask, so... Right. Other questions from members? I think in members' minds this, where this whole issue rests on the length of a two-storey extension. Councillor Atkins. It did actually also occur to me while you were speaking, um, the, uh, the first floor extension is proposed to be a bathroom and a, um, a, a dressing room, which actually is resulting in the loss of a bedroom, isn't it? If a um, future occupant switched the building back, would they be able to take the misted windows away, or are they kind of, the misted windows going to be a condition that, that's long-standing, protecting the privacy of the neighbouring gardens? Yes, Councillor, the um, condition... Glasses. Um, there's a condition that requires that all those windows uh, should be obscure glazed. It, it um, references the minimum obs obscuration level and it says they should be permanently maintained in that condition. So they would have to apply for variation if, if, you know, if that was the case. But that's the, that's the wording of the condition, so it would be uh, thereafter. Thank you. Ghost members, um, observations. Uh, Councillor Donna Jones. Um, thank you very much. The reason I clarified the um, position is because of all the, uh, <coughs> we've heard the um, objections from Mr. Sharman and also from Mr. Anderson, and actually it was the impact on Mr. Sharman's family's property that was causing me the greatest uh, concern. And had that, I originally thought that the extension was due to go sort of about another metre along that wall, which would have directly impacted the light on their living space into the kitchen dining area of, um, of the family property. Um, where the proposed elevation ends in conjunction with number 31 and actually number 35 has had significant extensions itself I think this is a clear cut case and I'm going to propose the application Councillor Norton Yeah I'd, I'd like to second uh, the application I think we leave ourselves in a very difficult position if we um, allow uh, buildings not to be brought out to the same level um, as their neighbours from the rear um, 33 is set back isn't it and in terms of the extension there being 2.2 meters beyond the bathroom of 35 well i think the bathroom at 35 is probably more than 2.2 meters beyond you know the building um at 33 there so i'm um, happy to i can't see any reason why we would refuse this really so happy to second councillor hunt well i've considered it and uh, i've tried to put myself in the position of i think it's mr 
Is it Anderson on the southern side who's got the bathroom extension? And it's the, this building is going to come out 2.2 2 meters more and it's going to be very tall. And I think that the, and the officers mentioned the sense of enclosure, which was an important matter in this. And I think that the, uh, sense, of in, the sense of enclosure would be too great, particularly on his property. It would create the, the darkness, so I remove, will move a refusal of the application on the grounds of it will cause a sense of enclosure by bricks and mortar. That doesn't happen on the other property. I appreciate it impacts the light going into the conservatory, but it kind of regularises it from that side, so I don't think that's really, that doesn't stack up there. But on the other property, on Mr Anderson's, I think it's a significant impact by way of uh, bricks and mortar and the sense of enclosure on him and the enjoyment of his property and his garden and his amenity and I think that uh, therefore we have to turn it down. Right, a second for that. Well just to allow it to come to the vote if it needs to I shall formally second that. Um, any other comments from members? Councillor Atkins. Um, <clears throat> just to say that um, I'd be supporting the officer's report in this case. To me, the, the thing with this boils down to, and I do recognise the, the negative impacts on, on the neighbours, particularly during the construction, um, and the fact that there will be some interference with lights um, in the windows. But to me, the, the, there's a kind of natural fairness in that you have to be at least all allowed to do what your neighbours have done, and, and particularly the, the large white extension that we see uh, in the neighbouring property there behind is, is, is a more substantial extension at the back of, of uh, that property. Um, and so if, if you look at the, the kind of way that the properties have been extended generally along that road, um, I don't think this is out of keeping out of character with that nature of extension. I think it's important that these terraced houses are um, put in a livable condition, a condition that accommodates the, the best number of people in the, in the best sort of uh, circumstance. So I, I think that I can see why people want to extend these. I think it, it's only fair that this person should be allowed to extend in the manner that other properties have been extended. Um, and I think coming to the corner of the, the neighbouring property behind, yes, it does impact more on the property to the south, um, and the person to the south may eventually then end up extending as well, but um, to the same extent. Um, but I think that's a reasonable compromise. Um, so so I, I think fairness between neighbours, I think it's reasonable to allow this application. If there are no other comments, we will move to the vote. It has been proposed by Councillor Jones, seconded by Councillor Norton, that we accept the officer's recommendation and grant planning permission. Those in favour, please indicate. That is six in favour. Those against, please indicate. Right, thank you. Mr. Mosey, you have the um, planning application you required. Thank you very much for, for, to the other gentlemen for coming and making your deputation. We now move on page 27 to an application 43 Eastern Parade for construction of a two-story garage at the rear of the property following the demolition of the existing garage. Uh, can I have uh, uh, Mrs. Mavrikakis and Mr. Higgins at the table, please? Right. Oh dear. Usually. Um, Councillor Winnington, uh, I am quite happy to have you, hear you making a deputation. Um, I. Now, um, we have Mrs. Mavrikakis, uh, Mr. Higgins, uh, Councillor Winnington, and who are you, sir? Mr. Mavrikakis, okay. Right. 
I assume that the deputations are those of Mrs. Mavrikakis and Mr. Higgins, and you have six minutes each. Uh, we have been living at 45 Eastern Parades for uh, 40 years now. My apologies. I'm getting ahead of myself. We have to have the officer's report first before we have your deputation. Sorry. Yeah. Put it down to increasing old age. Yes, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Good morning, members. Um, before I start my presentation, I'd just like to draw your attention to supplementary matters report, which includes one additional objection, which questions what changes have been made in the latest revised plans. Um, just to clarify, the latest plan was submitted to correct an error in the annotation of the proposed materials. Um, also, since the supplementary matters report was published, a further letter of objection was received this morning. Um, the representation was submitted by a previous objector. Um, the letter reiterates concerns which have already been outlined in the officer's report. Um, providing the chairman doesn't mind, I do have a copy of the most recent letter if anyone would like to see it. So this application relates to a three-storey detached property situated on the north side of Eastern Parade and within the Cranes Water and Eastern Parade conservation area. Planning permission is sought for a replacement detached outbuilding to the rear. The dwelling is set back from the highway with an enclosed garden and driveway forward of the dwelling. To the rear of the dwelling is an enclosed garden. This slide shows the existing garage and views from the garden. Um, so in comparison to the existing outbuilding, the proposed outbuilding would be an additional 1.5 metres in height, 4 metres greater in depth and 0.8 metres greater in width. Um, proposed building materials would include facing brickwork and roof tiles and the garage would include one space, one car, with ancillary loft space above. There are no site-specific land use policies that discourage the principle of residential extension of now buildings in this area. Therefore, the design policy, PCS 23 of the Portsmouth Plan, is the most relevant in this case. Whilst it is noted that the garage would be larger than the existing garage, the proposed development would remain subservient in size and well distance from the main dwelling. With regards to any impact on the character and appearance of the Cranes Water and Eastern Parade Conservation Area, the replacement garage would be situated approximately 35 metres back from the highway and is therefore not considered to form a dominant feature within the street scene. The main views will be gained from immediate properties to the east, west and north of the site. However, there are several examples of existing outbuildings surrounding the site, including the adjoining property to the east and neighbouring properties to the north. It is acknowledged that the garage would have a height greater than other outbuildings, however the application site is of an adequate size to accommodate the development. Um, so with regard to the neighbouring property to east, the proposed replacement garage would be adjacent to the eastern boundary and detached garage belonging to 45 Eastern Parade and would be situated approximately 6.5 metres from the neighbouring property itself. The development would be largely screened by the neighbouring garage and boundary wall and in regard to the separation distance, its orientation to the northwest, it is considered that the garage would not have an unacceptable impact on the amenities of the occupants of 45 Eastern Parade in terms of overlooking or overshadowing. Uh, the, with regard to the neighbouring property to the west, the proposed replacement garage would be situated approximately 11.5 metres from the boundary shed with the neighbouring property to the east, 41 Eastern Parade. This is considered to be an adequate distance so as not to result in a significant level of overshadowing or loss of outlook. And there are four roof lights proposed to the west elevation of the garage and to ensure there would be no issues of overlooking, should permission be granted, a condition would be imposed requiring the roof lights to be situated at no less than 1.7 metres from the finished floor level. And with regard to the neighbouring properties to the north of the site, footprint of the garage would not move any closer to these properties, however the replacement garage would have ridge height approximately 1.5 metres greater than the existing. Neighbouring properties of the north of the site are separated from the application site by a shared driveway and garages belonging to properties along Selsey Avenue. Due to separation distance and intervening garages, it is considered that the replacement garage would not result in any impact in terms of overshadowing or loss of outlook. All other material planning considerations have been addressed within the officer's report. Therefore, having regard to all material considerations, grade representations and planning policy, it is concluded that development is acceptable and capable of the support subject to conditions. Chairman. 
Councillor Jones. I have a pecuniary interest. I need to leave the room. We will inform you when we come to the next item. Uh, Councillor Hunt, you wish to make a point? I'll come, I'll come back in a moment. I'll, I'll, not now. Okay. Right. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Mavrikirkis, you have six minutes. Uh, Mr. Higgins, you have six minutes. Uh, Councillor Whittington, you have six minutes. So, if you could start, please, Mr. Mavrikirkis. Yes. Yes, so we have been living at 45 Eastern Parades for 40 years now. We suffered seven and a half years of slow, noisy, dusty, continuous building works on 43 and 47 in the last nine years. As long-standing residents, we assert our right to be without continuous building works encroaching on our house and garden. We consider this planning application as an outbuilding or granny flat rather than a garage which is disproportionately large compared to other garages in the neighborhood. The proposed garage, which will stand something like five meters high, will obliterate the light and cast a big shadow on our side of the house. The proposed front round window we have visual access to two adjacent bedrooms, a dining room, and a bird's eye view of our main drive. In a conservation area, this building will spoil the character of the immediate area and surrounding houses. In conclusion, this application blatantly ignores the existing rules of the conservation area it is unreasonable, selfish, and ambitious, with its sole aim to increase the value of the house rather than improve the quality of its owner's living. And as a writer, I would add recent advice has brought to our attention that a garage against our divided wall will devalue our property. Thank you for listening. Councillor Hunt. Yes. Um, can we have the? This is urgent before the next deputations. Yeah. Okay. There will be a short break whilst the solicitor and I consult with Councillor Hunt. My apologies for the delay. Uh, Councillor Hunt needed some legal advice on a, on a matter and has received it. Um, 
Right. Um, Mr Higgins. Uh, thank you. Um, Selsey Avenue and Eastern Parade back onto each other, and any development on one side naturally affects the other. The proposed development at 43 Eastern Parade proposes, in essence, to replace the existing garage into a small building which, with minimal amendments, could become a separate dwelling. It would, if an internal wall was built inside, in front of the roller shutter doors, be an ideal residence separated from the main building. Uses for this could be a granny axe, student accommodation, holiday accommodation, an Airbnb location, or even a place for guests. Ideal to put mother-in-law in, I'd imagine. Um, apart from the rationale of it becoming a separate dwelling, I have the problem with its size. It's completely out of proportion when compared to existing garages, and due to its size creates a problem as to the privacy of other neighbours. I have... I know some have stated that if translucent or obscure glass was used, that would negate the privacy aspects. However, what would stop glass being replaced with clear glass at a later date, and how could it be enforced? In addition, if this development was accepted, it would create a precedent which could, in future, end up with numerous substandard buildings which would completely spoil the area. To restate some of the points made by other residents which validate my concern. Number 12, Selsey Avenue. The loss of daylight due to overshadowing would, in some of the Selsey Avenue gardens, be completely upsetting. Plants which thrive in sunlight would need to be replaced with less reliant on the sun, and these generally are shrubs which do not flower so readily. Butterflies and bees need all the help they can get. Number 14, Selsey. According to the plans, the scale and the height of this structure is not in keeping with the area. The garages in neighbouring properties are not as large or high as the proposed development, raising questions to the real nature of the structure. E.g., will it be used as holiday lets, students, permanent lets or an Airbnb, with concerns for extra noise and loss of privacy when we use our garden? Number 41, Eastern Parade. The windows of the first floor and roof space overlook directly into the first floor bedroom of my property and will involve an intrusion and considerable loss of privacy. The same windows would look directly into the back garden of my property, which would involve loss of privacy. In addition to the size, use and the fact that it's completely out of character, I'm puzzled by the fact that we've had two update pa um, plans which were, in my eyes, identical. I may have missed something. In my last communication to yourself, I stated this was only done to give a false impression uh, that a better solution was being presented when none had been made. My apologies if not so. Was it dishonesty on his part or incompetency on mine? I'm not sure. On behalf of my neighbours and myself, may I request that the Planning Committee rejects this planning application. And on a little different matter, there is a coach house further along the road, but that was in a different time and in a completely different place. Um, and so I think comparisons with that should be completely ignored. Thank you for listening to me. Before I go on to the next, um, some people hearing that may have concluded that you consider there was a possibility of some form of dishonesty in the application. Um, I, may I ask that you withdraw that? Uh, well, my opinion. I said that I was worried that this was the case. I'm not saying it was, but that was my worry. Okay. Um, but as the, as the chairman, I have to make sure that there is nothing which can, can be considered to be an implication on the integrity of applicants. So that is why I withdraw it. If you wish not to, that I have fulfilled my duty. Thank you. Councillor Winnington. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I, from my, my inference of uh, what you said earlier, um, this has happened before in terms of putting in for deputations and, and it not being taken up. So that's a little bit of a concern because of, uh, often councillors are looking uh, quite late in the day and I did send it on Monday 
and the fact that this wasn't done uh, is a bit of a concern. So ju just not for just this application, but in future, if if we can make sure that if you send an email to planning reps, it is read immediately and and recorded, so we don't get issues like this again, whereby the um, councillors' deputations aren't down. May I suggest you leave that to the chairman, and the chairman will speak to the planning officers and the. Uh, people who are dealing with planning maps on that matter. If we could have your deputation, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So, um, on the report you've got, uh, members, um, there's there's various allusions. So, we, we know that this is in uh, the um, Craneswater and Eastern Prey Conservation Area, uh, and that is a very important point. Um, the issue with conservation areas is uh, that they do have a precedent uh, from applications in other places when you then apply. So in the past, we've had uh, in, in St. Jude for example, um, there is the conservation area uh, along the seafront there. And because there was a lot of development before the conservation area came in, uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s, um, there are a huge amount of development you can effectively get away with because of the nature of what is there already. So despite the report saying that you have to take every application on its merits, which of course you do, uh, in conservation areas it does matter what is elsewhere in the conservation area because if there's no precedent for something then it can't preserve or enhance the conservation area which is of course what the 1990 Planning Act Section 72 says that conservation areas any application has to preserve or enhance the character or appearance of that area so my submission members is that this application does not um, I was slightly concerned as well that the only consideration being given here is to the street, the street scene. That is not what conservation areas are about. They are about the entire conservation area, whether that be the, fr the street scene or actually within the properties as a whole. And the fact of having a, um, a longer um, garage is not without precedence indeed as you if we can go back to the plan if that's possible on the on the list uh, on sorry, on the slides which was, i think the first slide we had no no the the um uh, the overall there we go so so we can see that at number 41 the length of the uh, garage is of a similar length to what is proposed here however of course the height isn't so there is no precedence for a height and length uh, of this size uh, garage in this conservation area, also in this area of the conservation area. And there is no um, comparison, certainly either, for where you have the two driveways together of that length of garage. And that's a really important issue as well. So we've talked about loss of amenity, and in the report it says there is no loss of amenity, but I'm sorry, there is a loss of amenity. Because a loss of amenity isn't just for the property, it's also for the grounds of that property. So indeed, for the area behind, whereby at the moment you have effectively the two garages at number 45 and number 43 are flush. So the front of them are flush. So therefore there is no, there is a um, easy way to get lights coming through, as you can see, coming straight across. If that's four meters up, the gap between the garage itself, which will of course be a metre and a half higher than it is at the moment, and the back of the house is much, much less. So you are getting a lot of amenity coming on to the uh, garden area and the driveway area of number 45. So, um, so that's the effective thing here, members, for you to, to consider. Is there a lot of amenity? I would submit, well, there clearly is. Is this, does this preserve or enhance the character of the conservation area? Well, I would submit it absolutely doesn't. It is detrimental to it. It sets a precedent. It introduces something that does not exist at all in this part of the conservation area in Eastern Parade. Um, and is, it a, is, it, is the design of it something that you would... Uh, be happy with. So uh, I would ask members that you uh, reject this application as being um, it does not preserve or enhance the character of the conservation area. Um, it is 
an unprecedented uh, uh, development in the conservation area and also it affects the amenity of number 45 Eastern Parade as well as those outside the conservation area in South Sea Avenue. Thank you very much Chair. Thank you. Members, questions. Councillor Atkins. How tall actually is this garage? Uh, do you know how much taller it is than the one we see in the picture here? So the neighbouring garage. The total height, I believe, is going to be 5.5 metres. Um, I can measure it in comparison to the neighbouring garage if you'd like me to do so. Yeah, I'd like to do yeah. Right, okay, well, we'll whilst they're sorting the answer to your first round, Councillor Udi. Um, how high is the garage in relation to the that veranda that we see on um, the balcony on, is it on Compton Road, the one behind? Selsey Avenue, that's it. Sorry, I was back in earlier planning application, mind gone. Selsey Avenue, don't go around that area in East in Cranesville, obviously. We have a couple of height questions. <laughs> so yes, it'll be about 1.5 metres greater than the... But, yeah. I can... I can get the other plan. Is that showing it in relation to the neighbouring property? And in relation to the veranda on Selsey Avenue, unfortunately, I don't know the difference between the height of the veranda and the, back and the proposed garage. Uh, Councillor Atkins. And um, Councillor Smythe. The round window in the front, um, maybe I, I just missed it. I didn't see it mentioned in the report that that's required to be misted or, or good, um, glazed over, over in a few uh -huh. ways. Is, is that a condition on this application? It isn't at the moment, but I believe we can condition it to be able to go glazed. Councillor Smythe. Um, why, why didn't we uh, tackle the fact this isn't an application for a garage, it's a garage and ancillary storage, as stated on here. Uh, it didn't even look much like a garage. I'm just wondering why we didn't uh, challenge the title of the planning application. If I may, obviously, it, it, there would be, we'll have to look at the benefit for it. They haven't demonstrated the ancillary use for it. It's described as a two-storey garage. Obviously, it's not the intention to park cars on both stories of any building, um, so it is, we feel perfectly clear that the proposal is for an ancillary building to the dwelling. What that use is, whether you know, whether it be storage, a home office, whatever other ancillary lawful use, uh, obviously we do not know. Um, if they wish to make an independent use of this site, they would have to apply for plan permission in the future. From that question, that answer, I would assume that there is nothing which we could do to define the use to which that up the upper floor is put. So by definition it is required to be used in a way that is uh, incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house. Um, it is part of the same planning unit as the as the home and if they wanted to do an independent use of it further plan permission would be required. So there's little, nothing more that we can apply than the law already does so. Uh, so it will be, if there is an application as indeed has the it was example uh, by one of the deputations made a couple of stories, uh, a couple of doors down where the coach house has been granted permission to be converted into a dwelling. An independent application was needed to make the alteration. That is a two-storey building in the back garden of, a, of a number 47. Chair. Councillor Smythe. I just wanted to follow up on that last question. Thank you very much. So it could be used as a, an office, it could be used as a bedroom, it could be, uh, there, could, there could be a, a lavatory and a shower in there. And uh, could it, um, it could be used as a music drum practice room? Is, is that the case? 
It could be used for anything that's you know, incidental to the job of the dwelling house. It could be used it how you would use your own home. It's part of someone's home and it would be for them to use it. If they want to use it for an independent activity, as always, it's a matter of fact and degree. You can use it as a home office. If you've got 10 staff working in it, then that stops being a home office, and I would argue that that is a separate uh, planning unit. But obviously, we'd have to see how, over the years to come, if plan permission is granted and this is built, how the occupiers choose to use it. Could it, as be suggested, one of the deputations be let out on Airbnb? Again, a matter of fact and degree. Um, if it was a purely independent unit, it was only ever used for that purpose. Um, case, this is a fairly new uh, use of land, so case law is a little bit behind the curve. But if it was purely used as an independent residential letting property, uh, I believe the council may wish to, and I would certainly be recommending uh, that that's uh, something that would be a change of use of the site. If it's a uh, someone's office and storage room, and upon occasion, once a year, let out as Airbnb, or a couple of times a year when there's an event, um, that's still well within the, the realm of incidental enjoyment. I would argue, but hypotheses is always risky in this area. We'll wait to see what happens. Comments, Councillor Hunt. Yeah, I've looked at this and uh, I'm going to move a refusal on the grounds that the building, by way of its height, scale, and density, creates a dominant feature in the street scene, uh, which is out of kilter uh, with the street scene and detrimental to the conservation area. Do we have a seconder for that? Yes, yes Councillor Stubbs. And you wish to speak, Councillor Stubbs? Um, yeah, I need to say a few things, really. I mean, so, you know, we, things we can't take into account in this is any hypotheticals, you know, what could happen if someone changed the planning status down the line. We can't look at those matters. But in terms of what we have before us, we have an area um, of um, unusually large properties which have, a lot of them have small garages or other outbuildings out the back, but the outbuildings are quite small, particularly when, when, when compared to the main um, to, to the main residence, and I think that is one of the aspects which makes up what's in the conservation area. I'm concerned about the ridge height for this being, uh, was it, um, 150 centimetres or so, uh, over the, the neighbouring garage and over the others in the area. So I think that it is something which would be um, without precedent. I don't think we should approve it, and I'm happy to vote to reject this scheme. I can Members, just isn't these are all judgment points entirely, so clearly you're perfectly capable of coming to your own conclusion, but I think it is important to flag that there are outbuildings uh, in rear gardens of similar footprint. Uh, the one next door is a long, deep one. It's a flat roof structure, so it's a lower scale, and there are outbuildings of similar scale. The coach house I mentioned earlier, two stories up, will be a different use and a more historic structure. So please do bear in mind that uh, those buildings do exist in coming to your judgment on whether the introduction of a building in this case would cause harm and, and from what way that harm would emanate. I simply raised that because the concern uh, raised in the motion was the impact on the street scene and obviously there are limited views from the street scene. Anything you put forward and uh, the wording I'm sure has been captured by our colleagues in democratic services is, what, is that which you'll have to defend uh, on appeal and there are aspects of that which I would professionally advise you will be very difficult to defend. So, um, Councillor Hunt and Councillor, sorry, Councillor Udi, you were indicating? Uh, for a bit, I wanted to put in um, about the height um, affecting the people in uh, Selsey Avenue, I'll get that road right as well, uh, especially with that view from the, that, so you can see that it's going to rise considerably and I think that would have an effect on uh, neighbouring properties behind that may have bought that property at a time could look for loss of outlook and loss of everything else, I don't know, but chuck it all in, chuck it all in. Sorry, can I have a quick? Yes. Yeah, if I can stray with very firm conviction, members, throwing things into a reason for refusal is never well, beneficial. I don't, I don't if there's a legitimate planning concern, then we need to clearly articulate the harm and the impact of that concern so it can be defended on appeal. I'm not in any ways, it's your judgment to make, um, but exactly, so for example, the loss of outlook, outlook. Well, say, are we referring to the, the view? Because obviously there's no right of review in planning purposes. So it's the, it, in terms of outlook, what, are, what is changing that is causing harm? Because to be blunt, members, it's you on the stand in the public inquiry defending that opinion. So it does need to be caref 
carefully considered, exactly what you want to say is entirely your choice, but it is something that must be given give good due regard to ensure that you can defend each aspect of a reason for refusal. Uh, yes, you want to come back, Councillor Udin. I would imagine because someone yeah, had Council a stubs. with a balcony there that, that was there because they were, I know it kind of comes in the view terms, but it would be detrimental to the residents that live there because it's taking something away from them, more, more than the view, because it is deliberately termed to have that view because of the decoration of their house on the outside. Do you not understand where I'm trying to get to I that? I think what you're saying is that it would be detrimental to their enjoyment of their property yes. by reason of the size of the proposed uh, construction. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Been here a long time. Councillor Stubbs, then Councillor Adkins. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I tend to agree with Mr. McGuire that it could be overreached to make reference to Selsey Avenue in this, just because the prop, you know, with its the impact on the properties. I mean, there is an ex there's generally uh, quite defined about what loss of light actually means, um, and I think the separation distances in this case are likely to be greater than that. Um, I would also be just interested to hear if Councillor Hunt could read out his proposal again, because um, I didn't pick up on the bit about street scene, just so we careful what we've actually got. So I was going to ask for some advice then because uh, what I suggested was that the building by way of its height scale massing creates a dominant feature in the street scene. We could leave it a full stop there I guess and then I go on to say out, out, of, kilter with the, out of kilter with the street scene and detrimental to the conservation area. The thing is I think they go hand in glove. And, um, but if uh, I'm very happy to get advice on that, since I think that there is a, a, a agreement to want to refuse this application, and I'll be very happy to take advice from our uh, senior planning officer as to the best way to phrase it in the best interests of the decision. I would, so I would suggest how to culture with I the grain of development in the area rather than the streets. Yeah. So. Brain of, brain of okay, Councillor Atkins, please. Maybe somewhat reading the point that Councillor Stubbs has made, but um, I have two concerns, and one of them is at the risk of throwing more ideas around um, that we have talked about, but it's, it's, it's still that circular window at the front of the property. Um, there's no mention of overlooking regarding that circular window. It's passed back to almost a question, but it does appear to me that's an above fence height circular window that would have potential overlook into. Um, d dwelling rooms in the neighbouring house on the side of the house when there are not currently any windows. So, certainly the, there is a window to be proposed which is providing a, a view. We're looking at a, a view here of, of a similar uh, direction. It's closer. <coughs> if that would be, if that was the only concern, that's obviously resolvable through planning condition, a condition yeah. required that obscure glass be used in that window and permanently retained thereafter. So as always, if there is a legitimate planning concern, and privacy and immunity mm. certainly is such, it, and it is resolvable by planning condition, that's not a reason for refusal, because we would... No, but uh, if, if I was looking at pro uh, proposing um, exceptions, I, I would certainly want that condition present, but I'm not sure if that's the direction in which we're moving. Because to me, the, the issue... Um, with the size and scale of it, um, and perhaps this is not something, but it, it is a, the outer character with the conservation area, and to me, the harm and the risk being posed to the conservation area is the increasing size of outbuildings in this area. It's almost, if you like, they're increasing in size every time we see them, larger footprints, higher heights. Um, and uh, I do think we, we sort of need to put a line somewhere in terms of protecting this con conservation area in terms of the size, and this one seems substantially taller than other surrounding outbuildings, particularly. I'm I think not I sure, Councillor Atkins, where you are going with this. Are you uh, pro seeking to propose the officers? No, sorry, no. I, I, I'm, I'm part of the discussion of refusal. Because it could have been interpreted. You are seeking to support the officers' recommendations with stricter conditions on the glazing. No, all, my only point on the glazing was that if I was if I was minded to support the application, that would have been an essential but you are not requirement. So minded. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not so minded because I, I think the the size and the the, the scale, mm. particularly in terms of height, is uh, of these outbuildings is.
posing a, a threat to the conservation area in terms of changing the character and turning gardens into large outbuilding filmed um, uh, areas. Uh, I think I have it, if I may. Uh, uh, so tell us the hunch. So that we say the bulk, the building by way of its height, scale, and uh, density uh, creates a dominant feature in, this, in the street scene. Um, uh, by way of its two story element, it's out of kilter uh, with the grain of development in the area. Councillor Smythe? Um, I, I don't think that it's to do with the uh, street scene because, in fact, the view from the street is uh, one of the better ones. What is the most important thing is to say that the impact on the conservation area uh, and the, the overall character of the, the area and its gardens, um, in my view. Unfortunately, we've been advised, given clear advice by planning officer, that's not, clear, uh, that's not a thing to want to consider. Do you want to take this to Mr. Gentlemen, ladies, Mr. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, members, I appreciate that uh, you have a difficult job to do. Um, as uh, my assistant director said in respect to this, it's, um, it's one that we as officers need to kind of consider very carefully and make a recommendation to yourselves. I have, uh, before we started proceedings today, I read out um, matters of appeals that we have as a council lost and the ones that we have won and the ratio to me personally is quite disturbing. Now, with respect to this, I, I do find that it would be a lot difficult to defend this appeal. The reason being, and one looks at uh, probably number 39 or 41 there about the footprint of its um, art building. Um, or their art buildings are similar to what's been proposed. I bet it's a flat roof. Uh, there's issues to talk about views from um, the street um, opposite uh, or the street behind um, the street. Again, it's not a protected view. Um, that would be difficult for anyone to, to defend. Um, but again, I do defer to members to uh, make their recommendations, but my position is to advise, and, and I do believe that uh, my officer uh, would find it very difficult, myself personally would find it very difficult to defend this appeal. Thank you. Well, in, in, thank you very much. I'm sure the planning officer, the, any appeal, they'll take your views into account. So we've made a proposition. We're very clear about it, as far as I can make out anyway. It's a two-story element that's caused some problems. And so therefore we have, uh, uh, as a planning committee, taken advice and um, the prop proposition is there and I have a, uh, slightly amended it from the first time but very happy to take into account the impact on the conservation area and um, I think that members probably want to move forward on this now. I would think that is likely um, so I will bring it to the vote. It has been proposed by Councillor Hunt and seconded by Councillor Stubbs that the recommendation be uh, rejected and that the application be refused on the grounds of uh, height, scale, massing right. being, being of detriment to the conservation area. Okay. Right, so that is the proposal. Proposed by Councillor Hunt, seconded by Councillor Stubbs. Those in favour of that proposal, please indicate. That is unanimous. The planning application has been rejected. Thank you. Members, I propose to take the next item and then have a break. I, so... Sorry? We only have one deputy on that, which is, say? Right, okay, we will have, we will have a two minute break, two or three minute break, and I will have a major break after we have dealt with Westmores.
Members, welcome, Councillor Pitt. Do you have any declarations of interest? I've got a few declarations could make about my bathroom, but other than that, more, um, <laughs> no, no declarations, Chair. And thank you for bearing with me. Right. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Whilst, whilst we're waiting for the return of Councillor Norton, uh, could uh, Mr. Heppel come to the table, please? I shall give Councillor Norton another minute. I don't think we can delay any longer, members. Um, so on page 33, we have the application for Westmoors, 50 London Road, Cosham. Um, can I have the officer's report, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, this next application relates to number 50, London Road, and the application site cited on the corner of London Road and St George's Road um, within Cosham. Um, just to give you some site context, you have London Road extending where it splits just south of the, the eastern junction into Queen um, Elizabeth Hospital, uh, Queen Alexandra Hospital, sorry, um, and you have Haven't Road running east-west and just to the south of this picture, the Cosham District Centre. Um, it's just worth noting from this particular picture for reference later, the pattern of development with blocks of flats along the Haven't Road frontage turning into London Road, uh, later blocks of flats in here and on the opposite side of the road, uh, Portsmouth City Council car park just on the opposite side and then more traditional detached and semi-detached houses on St George's Road. The site currently comprises um, a five-storey, uh, sorry, a five-bedroom, two-storey dwelling house. Um, this is the view from London Road behind a large wall and hedge. Um, significant change in levels as you go up St George's Road. This is the view from the east, looking back towards the application site. Um, this is the first neighbouring property in St George's Road. A view from the south of the application building, um, from the adjoining car park, and this is a view of the current dwelling from the neighbouring property to the north. Just very briefly, I can always come back to these if you need to, but just showing the existing five bedroom dwelling house at the site and the existing elevations. Um, planning permission is sought for the demolition of the existing dwelling house and its replacement with a part three, part four storey building comprising 11 flats. Uh, one one-bedroom and ten two-bedroom properties. Um, this is considered to be acceptable in principle given the pattern of development to the south of the site uh, with the various blocks of flats um, and would also contribute towards the city's identified housing need. 
In terms of the site layout, um, the building would sit approximately in the position of the existing dwelling house, which you can just see marked uh, with a red dashed line, extending slightly further forward to the west and slightly further towards the rear. Access would be maintained in its current position from St George's Road with 10 parking spaces, bin stores, bike stores, the retention of two trees, the one on the application site protected by tree preservation order and areas of landscaping around the perimeter. Um, having regard to the presence of the car park providing a degree of separation to the, the first house on St George's Road, the presence of St George's Road itself and the sighting of the building to the north of the existing car park and blocks of flats, it's not considered that the proposal would result in any significant amenity issues. Just working through the building now, so this is going down a level to the lower ground floor on the London Road frontage, two two-bedroom dwelling houses, which the housing enabling officer has suggested would be best located to be the affordable housing provision on the site, given the level access from London Road to private accesses rather than through the communal entrance to the remaining units within the building. The applicant has agreed that these two units would be the affordable housing provision on the site and this would be secured through a legal agreement. The first and second floor plans um, identical showing three two, two bedroom dwellings on each floor with a lift and the communal entrance um, coming in and then serving off of those communal corridors. All of the units would provide an acceptable standard of living environment for future occupiers and the local highways authority have indicated that whilst there isn't um, su sufficient on-site provision for parking, the parking survey submitted with the application suggests that there's adequate space on the adjoining highway to compensate for the, um, the, the reduced parking standard on the site itself. In terms of design, the building is simple. Um, it's probably best described as a modern take on the, the blocks of flats further to the south, predominantly in brick, with detailing coming from recessed windows and panels, uh, and some brick banding running around the outside of the building. This gives a good indication of the, the changes in levels, so the London Road frontage here, so you get the additional lower ground floor accommodation, and then the parking area to the rear of the site. This is the east elevation facing into the car park, and the southern elevation facing into the car park of the adjoining block of flats. Um, this elevation would sit slightly forward of the existing building and slightly further to the rear, although it would be set slightly further from the boundary. Um, just showing artist's impression of the, of the development, which gives a better indication of the recessed panels, uh, the brick detailing. Um, we're still in discussions about the materials to be used on the balcony, which do appear slightly heavy, uh, exploring alternative materials for those. So these are the existing and proposed street scenes. Um, this is the London Road street scene. So yes, it would result in a bulkier building, than the existing property by virtue of its flat roof and, and presence um, further forward in the plot. Um, but overall, the height isn't significantly different to the existing dwelling house. On the St George's Road frontage, again, it would result in a bulkier building with a degree of separation provided by the car park to the first dwelling house, the retention of the protected tree, but again, similar heights through from the ridge line of the neighbouring house. So on the basis there's examples of flat roof buildings in the surrounding area, so these blocks of flats in here, uh, there's flat roof buildings down here, it's considered that in the street scene um, a flat roof building would not be out of character, particularly when viewed from the south. From the north, flat roofs aren't typical within this part of the city, um, you get the more traditional pitched roof forms. Um, but having regard to the, the positive benefits that come out of his site, mainly the provision of 10 additional housing units and the two affordable units on the site, it's considered that this would outweigh any shortcomings in terms of design. Um, members, you have a detailed report in front of you and for the reasons set out within it, the application comes with a recommendation 
of conditional permission. Uh, we've delegated authority to the uh, to officers to deal with the outstanding matters, namely the minor design changes and mitigation in respect of nitrates and recreational disturbance and the completion of a legal agreement to secure those mitigation payments and the provision of two affordable housing units. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Herpel, you have six minutes to address the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I represent the applicant, which is a locally based property developer. Um, as has been noted by uh, your officer um, and in your officer report, um, we've been working um, with the council for the past uh, year to devise an appropriate scheme for this site. Currently, as you've heard, it's occupied by a, a large five-bed family house in a poor state of repair. The site does not contribute visually to the area and the house is oversized for modern day housing needs. Uh, we looked at various options for redeveloping the site. As you've heard, uh, it's a corner site and it has a significant change of levels. It also doesn't have a great depth to the site and it's for these reasons that it isn't suitable for a scheme of houses in our view uh, and that is why we have uh, opted for a scheme of flats. And the site is just to the north of Cosham District Centre and as you can see and you've heard from your officer, it adjoins modern flatted developments on two sides. In sustainability and townscape terms, it is ideally placed to accommodate the scheme of smaller residential units to help meet the housing needs of the city. The proposals are therefore uh, for a mix of one and two bed flats, 11 in total, two of which will be designated as affordable units. The scheme has been carefully designed such that on its western side it matches the form of the three and four storey flats to the south and opposite. But it's at its eastern end, the height of the scheme drops down to match the adjacent residential dwellings with a, a substantial gap to the nearest adjoining house to prevent overlooking or overshadowing. The scheme, as you've seen, has a, cont a contemporary appearance with active frontages and good quality detailing, for example, in the design of the balconies and in the window recesses. The scheme provides off-street parking for future residents. Parking surveys of local streets, including video footage, have been undertaken to satisfy your highways engineer that the level of car parking proposed is appropriate. In addition to on-site car parking, cycle storage is proposed to the full standard. We are aware of the nitrates issue affecting the Solent and a nitrate neutra neutrality statement will be submitted to the council along with a full financial contribution towards the council's mitigation strategy plus a contribution towards the Solent, re Solent re recreation mitigation strategy. So in conclusion, the scheme will contribute towards meeting the housing needs of the city in a highly sustainable location. We believe the proposals are policy compliant in all respects and taken together with the fact that the council has a housing land supply shortfall, I would respect respectfully ask members to approve the plans. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Norton, the rule of the House is that if you are not here for the full presentation, you are not permitted to take part in the discussion or, to, or the vote. I'm sorry about that, but uh, you are not here for that period. Okay, well that's disappointing. Can I request that in future, in that case, we put a time on break limits? My understanding is that it was a short comfort break, which is what I took. I thought I had made that clear. Short comfort break was the wording, I think, that was used. Um, I am advised that by people that I did say two minutes. Um, it's regrettable. It is regrettable, but it is a general rule of which I shall imply. Questions from members, please. Gaza Atkins. Um, <coughs> the uh, height of the. Could you tell me what the height of the building is? You say it's the same height as the current eaves, but is that dependent on. Because there's an excavation going to occur, isn't there, to bring the uh, the building, particularly the London Roadside, down to street level. So, so um, what height is the building? Um, and, and so the E level of the previous building would be the same as this, but that is dependent on bringing the ground floor level of this building down somewhat. No, I mean, the, the overall height will vary depending where on the site you take that measurement from. But I think this is a very good indication to show that the, the, the ridge of the, the flat roof will sit very close indeed, a matter of centimetres 
uh, between the ridge of the existing house, obviously over a much larger period, uh, a larger area. And the excavations would occur at the front of the property. So in terms of overall height, when you measure from here to here and from there to there, there will be very little change. Councillor Stubbs, then Councillor Jones. Um, planning condition one, um, you're proposing to only give one year to enact this, develop, uh, this consent if granted. Why is that? I thought they were usually three years. Uh, thank you. As members may recall this from the previous planning committee, this is linked to the nitrates statement because obviously we are making available our nitrate bank if they wish to take advantage of that uh, provision. Uh, we obviously want to ensure that the development comes forward, drawing down on it and isn't sat for a longer period of time, three years, uh, waiting uh, while it could otherwise stymie other development that could come forward earlier than that. Well, when I understand that argument, well, the first application that we had, the one in Hillsley, that had a three-year time limit on it. That was a, um, a minor development and uh, consequently has a smaller impact, but I'll be entirely honest with you, that's an oversight by officers. We would have recommended a one-year issue, but obviously as a minor development, not many unit difference, obviously, uh, there's a lesser Im implication. Uh. Other members' questions? Uh, Councillor Jones. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, in, on page 36 of the report, um, there is a section under ecology which talks about the um, difference in professional opinion around the BAT surveys. Um, I wonder if the difference in uh, professional opinion can be explained, please. Yes, there were, there were three. Um, there's a preliminary ecological assessment that was carried out at the site. Um, they looked at um, the, the, the fauna, flora, and the presence of protected species, namely bats. Um, and following on from that, there were three separate bat surveys on three separate evenings. Um, the first um, did spot um, the sighting of a bat emerging from the property um, and other bats foraging within the rear garden. Then there was a later survey which um, didn't identify any bats emerging from the property itself, but there was foraging within the in the rear garden, and a third survey which took place, um, which identified no bats at all on the site. The difference of opinion is that the, um, the county's ecologists suggest that a dawn survey should have taken place in addition to the three additional surveys that have taken place. The applicant's ecologist is suggesting that wasn't necessary given the very limited um, identification of, of bats um, emerging from the property or foraging within the rear garden. Um, Moving on from that, the ecologist, our own ecologist, does suggest that if we can um, demonstrate through um, through the free tests that this is necessary, that there are public benefits, and the the impact of the species can be mitigated uh, through the derogation tests, that she raises no objection to the methodology for removing bats and um, providing the mitigation on the site. Mr. Jones. Supplementary chair, if that's okay. So, in terms of the policy that we have to protect um, the bats and that species, you're saying that that the policy that we have wouldn't substantiate an objection on that basis if we believe bats were living or foraging in the curtailage of the property. So, we know there are bats, or there have been bats, at this site. Um, and therefore they are a protected species and we have had to go through the relevant processes um, because of the, the way they are protected. Um, our ecologist has confirmed that she is aware that there is a presence of bats on the site and that there is a scheme for mitigation and as long as that is followed she's satisfied that the third of the derogation tests can be met and has left it to us as a local authority to make a judgment on whether the public benefits of the development, namely the provision of additional housing units and the two affordable housing units at the site would be sufficient to outweigh the need to carry out further survey work. Um, and given that we are already identifying that there are bats or the presence of bats and there is mitigation on the site, that we're suggesting that the benefits of the proposal, the public benefits, outweigh that uncertainty that exists 
and our ecologist has confirmed that if we are satisfied that that test can be met, that she would support our stance in granting a planning permission with the biodiversity enhancement management plan in place and the mitigation measures in place. Okay. Thank you very much. You may not know the answer to this question, but have we in the last two or three years, um, or in recent times, refused an application on the basis of a protected species and it has been um, upheld at appeal, or just we've refused it on that basis, regardless of the appeal situation? I can only speak for Portsmouth. Um, the answer to that is no. The presence of bats on a site isn't, wouldn't prevent a development from happening it would have to ensure that there's adequate mitigation for the protected species on the site. Um, in this case, the, the bat boxes within the protected tree is considered to be sufficient mitigation um, to outweigh um, the, the removal of a potential roost. Um, the ecologist also suggesting that this is a, a pipistrelle, it's not, um, a, a, which are, are widely common across the UK, it's not a rare species of bats. Um, so that's all factored into our assessment and, and why she is supporting our stance in supporting the application. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I've got two um, related uh, questions. One is, did I hear you right in saying that the affordable housing could well be wheelchair accessible? Did you say that? There is level access from London Road to those units. They haven't been shown as um, fully accessible, but I imagine that that could be looked at by the registered provider when they come to take those units on. I mean, obviously, it has to be built into the scheme because you can't uh, enlarge uh, doors and so forth um, without doing it. I would, I would think that would be a very strong um, uh, attraction to a social registered social registered housing. Linked to that is the fact that we've only got ten car parking spaces, and I would hate to see somebody in a wheelchair in an affordable uh, home denied one of those spaces because they always come bottom of the pile. Alas, um, how can we? Could we? Could we get an extra space on there? There, there is no further capacity for the provision of parking on the site. Um, we, we could look at a condition if you felt it was necessary to make sure that two of the spaces are allocated to the two affordable housing units within the uh, lower ground floor. The, the, the issue with that is if those spaces are not needed by those residing within the affordable units, you have two spaces within a communal car park that go unused. I know that car parking is often fraught with contention and you'd think people could work it out between themselves but actually it's always very, very difficult. Um, is there any way we can um, uh, encourage the provision of two wheelchair accessible properties there? From which I think it would follow that they would need car parking spaces. The, the units are not shown as fully wheelchair accessible. Um, they could be accessible units in that they have level access and into them. Um, we could look and work with a developer post decision to try and ensure those but as you say that the site and the footprint is finite um, and whether that can be fully achievable we would have to explore. Councillor Hunt. Just, just want to make sure that this is um, uh, lacking five car parking spaces to meet standards. That is correct. Six parking spaces. Yes. Yep. Sorry, it is, it is short of parking spaces. Um, the applicant has provided a parking survey that's looked at the surrounding roads um, and has demonstrated that there is adequate capacity on street to offset those shortfalls on site. Um, and that's not relying on the Portsmouth City Council owned car park um, because there's no certainty that that will be retained in perpetuity as a car park. Councillor Atkins. Um, the uh, the flats would be entitled would they to be part of the the residence parking zone in the area um is it fair to say that the parking survey doesn't indicate that there's a great deal of capacity on st george's road it's it's relying on partly london road and partly more distant areas of st matthews and st john's uh, to provide that extra space well, what i could see in the parking service it looked like st george's was a hundred percent most of the time they looked at it so the parking survey looks at available parking spaces within a reasonable walking distance, so it will not just be St George's Road. Um, included within that are areas of Haven't Road, St George's Road itself, St Matthew's Road, St John's Road and Regal Place, which is 
the way that we would expect a parking survey to work that's demonstrating that within a reasonable walking distance of the application site. If there are no further questions, our question. Um, with the, um, the the affordable housing aspect, um, I take it this is normally done on a kind of calculation basis, looking at the scheme and, and calculating the viability and then how much of a contribution it should be made. Because the risk always with these schemes isn't it, particularly if you're, you're excavating the ground now that if it was um, became too excessive in cost, it could the, the scheme could return later to try and remove the affordable. Um, the affordable housing element, couldn't it, if it was not affordable? So are you quite satisfied that it will be definitely affordable in this scheme to provide two units of affordable housing? I can never provide certainty that they won't uncover something unexpected through the construction works, but the application in front of us at the moment is for 11 units. Two of those are being shown as affordable housing units. Uh, that will be secured through a legal agreement. Um, so the information we have in front of us is that that can deliver the two affordable housing units on the site. If the applicant wished to deviate from that, we would have to take a view of whether that would require a new planning application or a modification of the legal agreement, which we would bring back to members. Councillor Atkins. Yeah, so but my final um, question concerned um, so something you said in, in the um, repeat, written report on... Um, page 39, you, you talk about the incorporation of a flat roof not being an ideal design solution in this context and having had a discussion with the applicant and in which they decided not to, to opt for a pitch roof because the neighbouring block of flats and the one over the road are both pitch roofed, aren't they? The, the flat roofs are, are, are down actually on, on, um, on the Havant Road primarily, aren't they? That is correct. This is this application in front of you at the moment follows um, a previous scheme that was withdrawn um, from uh, prior to determination. Um, it was for a similar design. Uh, it was a larger building that extended further towards these properties on St George's Road. Um, through the discussions on um, that particular proposal, we highlighted a number of concerns. Um, one of them was design. Um, one of it was overlooking impact on amenity inadequate parking because of the larger building and a smaller car park. The applicant um, withdrew that application and, and looked at alternative designs for the site. Um, they've modified the design in terms of its scale. They have decided not to take our advice on the, um, the finish to the building, i.e. not incorporating a pitched roof. Um, it may have increased the bulk further um, or impact on, a, on the viability of a scheme if they needed to review, re remove the units. Um, from the development. So for whatever reason they've decided to progress with a flat roof solution. I think the report identifies that perhaps this isn't an ideal solution given the, the pattern of development, but it's not considered to be so out of character um, with the surrounding area. It's a bulkier building that you'd expect to see on a corner of the main road. Um, and when that is balanced up, and this is a balanced judgment that you have in front of you, that when you balance the, the benefits that come from it, so the 11 units, the two affordable units, um, within a sustainable location, close proximity to bus routes, shop services within the district centre, um, Queen Alexandra Hospital, um, it, it's considered to meet the definition of a sustainable development. Sorry, just supplementary. One final follow-up on that. Um, clearly, um, is that considered sort of a separate issue, the lack of the pitch roof and the streetscape? Is that a separate issue to its, its size and bulk? Because obviously, I, I totally accept that London Road and, um, and the, the Spur Road element, it, it's in keeping with that side. But it's the St George's Road and the, the kind of further north bit of London Road, which are clearly much more sub suburban. And, and that house makes quite a nice, clear definitional point between the start of the suburban and, and the kind of more city centre blocks of flats. Um, is that pitch roof element taken in combination with that, or, or is, is that kind of bulk and size and that demarcation of the city centre from the suburban area not a factor at all? Sorry, I don't fully... Sorry, so um, in, in terms of impact on streetscape and townscape, um, to me there's two issues, and I want to know if they're both issues and both of them are, are 
um, can combine, if you like, or if they're entirely separate or if, if one of them isn't an issue at all. The first one is the pitched roof. The, the second one is, to me, that's that's the defining point in caution between the town centre, which has large blocks of flats, and the suburban area to the north, which is... is um, uh, and, and that house is actually almost the, the definition point where, where the boundary can currently be nicely clearly drawn. And so we're talking about swapping that out for, for something which I would consider to be part of the townscape to the south. I mean, there's clearly a transition from the more traditional houses to the north and the, the redevelopment pattern to the south. Um, there is a dividing line at the moment. It is there. Um, I would imagine previously it was there. So um, it will change the character of that particular block. Um, but you could argue that the St George's Road is the is the break. Um, this forms the um, sort of the, the terminating point of this block in here, blocks of flats. So I don't think the principle of, of a block of flats um, is out of keeping with the character of the area. And the report does acknowledge that the flat roof does change the streetscape and the um, the roofscape within that particular area. Um, and that is a shortcoming of the scheme. Um, it is a different design. Um, it does take some design cues from these properties. Um, but again, I think it identifies that perhaps if we were designing this ourselves from the outset, we might go for a different design. But that's not to say that the design we have in front of us is unacceptable. If there are no more questions, comments, members? Um, uh, I am actually going to propose refusal of the, of, of the report and refusal of the Planning Commission. Um, I do think that the design is, is too incongruous, it's too sharp and sudden, a, a block of flats into that suburban area. Um, I think that the, the, um, the impact on the, the street scene and the townscape is, is too significant to put such a large um, uh, block on that particular site as it transitions into uh, the more suburban area. Um, so on that basis I would uh, propose uh, refusal of this scheme. Uh, come back to that in a moment. Uh, Councillor Udi, Councillor Hunt. I'd like to propose four officers' recommendations for approval. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for Councillor Atkins? That's Councillor Hunt. Um, so, yeah, oh yeah. And do we second for Councillor Udi? <laughs> Councillor Smythe, thank you. So both, we have two proposals proposed, proposed and seconded. Um, Councillor Hunt, you indicated. I think the uh, very good planning officer summarised the difficulties around this particular site and was very kind of you to balance it all up. In fact, all of the officers today have been very good indeed in their explanations. You're right, you know, if we were doing those houses to the south, those blocks of flats now to the south, I mean, we wouldn't do them. They're brutal, um, straight out of the old brutal sort of style, almost sort of GDR looking, really. This new building, and I wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt when before I came to it, and then it came up on the screen, and, you know, it's rather... It, I looked at our PCS 23, and I always do, and I don't care what's happened in the past, uh, well, I do, of course, I care, but I look at the things that have happened in the past, and just because they're awful in the past, does that mean we have to have awful now? And I don't want awful now. I want what's in PCS 23. I want excellent architectural quality in new buildings, delight and innovation. This grim. To me, it's grim. I know it's a personal view, but this is grim to me. It's, an imp it's going to be an important corner site. And that transition from the houses in, uh, along London Road to the north to this is pretty um, hard and brutal again. So I think it's inappropriate in, its, uh, in the context of the houses adjacent to the north along London Road which I'm sure Cass Atkins will put into his refusal and it's not and, and, and it does not relate well to those houses and it's inappropriate on this corner side because it's, it's unattractive it's not excellent in architectural um, 
uh, its architecture is unattractive and it doesn't delight and innovate. So I think I pretty much captured what I wanted to say about it. If it's going to be this, I mean the pitch roof has got to be looked at. It is a corner site so I know it's going to be on the whole probably higher but it's got to do better than this. Councillor Smythe, you, do you wish to us? No. Uh, Councillor Donna Jones. Um, thank you very much, Chair. This is a really difficult one for me because um, I don't like it. Um, I think this is a really, really prominent site, uh, and I think I completely agree with what Councillor Hunt just said. Just because you've got poor design um, at the southern end of this block on the Haven't Road doesn't mean to say that you need to replicate it. I think it's out of keeping for this area, which is predominantly uh, residential, the end of this block of um, very classic 1930s uh, and earlier um, properties. Um, I think this is quite a hard looking, I mean I don't d dislike the design of the building if it was somewhere else in a slightly more, um, you know, mixed use area, but this is, it's a, such a prominent site there when you come down Portsdown Hill and when you come out of the hospital. Um, I think it will change the character and appearance of the area. Um, I think that my feelings and thoughts, legally and technically, are probably weak. But that is how I feel, um, and I think the loss of one of those lovely family homes is such a shame for Portsmouth again. Councillor Matt Atkins has um, proposed an objection, um, and in terms of the policies, I was just trying to look up which ones, the design scale appearance and townscape, which I'm assuming is probably... This is 23. Or is it 15? It's the design. So is it not PCS 15? It's probably PCS 15 as well. And then standard accommodation impact on the residential amenity, um, uh, PCS 23, I guess it's PCS 23 and PCS 15. Um, housing mix size and affordable homes. I'm not sure. I mean, I'll, I would have, I'd have to take guidance from you on, on the policies that, that, that the officers think it should be based on if the um, refusal goes through. But I think we're probably on weak ground here, but I don't like it, and I think it sets a precedent. Well, I know, but it's not good. Um, Councillor Pitt. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I tend to agree with Councillor Jones on this one, but I, I also sense, sense some hesitance on her part because we do need housing units in the city, particularly affordable ones, um, but. Is the level of sacrifice is what we have to consider here, um, and it ain't pretty. Um, so I reserve judgment for what a little while longer, but I do think it's disappointing that on a, a site like that, where there's an opportunity to get 11 units, that um, I, to be perfectly honest, I'd rather it was a story taller and had a pitch roof on it, was designed better. Um, but it, it just if that was the compromise, but at the moment it, it, it's not suitable for this area, I don't think. Councillor Smythe. Um, when you were explaining about the development, you did say there were some, still some ongoing discussions about the design, particularly of the top layers of the balcony, I, I recall. Could you explain what that might mean in terms of design um, and uh, where you're getting with that and how we could make sure that perhaps some of the um, design features that people are, don't like um, could be um, mitigated a bit? Uh, the design changes would be relatively minor and, and limited to um, the design of the balconies and the materials, um, just trying to soften them a little bit, move away from the, the metal which isn't necessarily characteristic of the area. Um, so look at opportunities for some form of, of brick slips or, or brick detailing to those um, with a different bonding pattern perhaps. Um, replicating perhaps what has been done um, along the lower floor level um, but also just seeking clarity on the quality of the design elements that they have suggested lift this building from being just a box uh, which is the recessed windows and the recessed panels on here to make sure that there's, there's adequate changes in in those facades um, interest from, from depth and shadowing um, so the real minor details, but it wouldn't change the overall design concept of this particular building. It can make a considerable difference to the whether the building feels heavy, slightly top heavy, or whether it doesn't. I mean, I, that, not.
Right. Yes. I, I was wondering if Councillor Atkins uh, and I might want to defer it instead because it looks like it's going to happen one way or another and whether we come back see if we can come back and get a better a better uh, design of a building you can't can't understand def it. deferring is unlikely to change the unlikely to change the design of the plan and I suppose what we might get we don't currently either have do we materials this could be literally you know um, concrete with, with chips in it or, or something uh, I don't know what kind of materials are being discussed for this, but it, yeah. yes, I think yes or no today. members, if, if I can assist, I think deferral. If there was a, a specific thing you wanted to, for example, change that window to this window, deferral to ensure that would be the case. If we didn't feel we could capture that by condition, would be appropriate. Something as fundamental as adding a pitch roof to this building, because that's an extremely large increase in mass. Um, I don't think is appropriate. That would be a matter, a reason. Uh, perfectly reasonable subjective reason to refuse planning permission and obviously the applicant could then appeal against it if they felt this was the correct solution or submit a new application with a pitch roof and an alternative design if they show so fit. I'm more than happy to take members through uh, the construction of a reason for refusal if that is the direction they're taking the, the application in. Councillor Pitt. Yesterday during the briefing there was um, mention made of the possibility that a um, a housing association might take all of these units and not just two and I think the thing that's in the back of my head is I don't really want to turn down 11 affordable units if that's what that ended up being um, so um, have we got any clarity about what stage those discussions are at so it is we're aware that they're happy discussion this is an application for two affordable units and nine market units so while that may change in the future obviously we wouldn't want a different design uh, quality on either of those schemes so if members feel the design of this building is insufficient uh, to allow the grant of plan permission I would suggest uh, that may uh, be uh, not a reason to defer, to defer the matter um, as always everything is in the mix it is a matter of the overall planning judgment and balance but of course, who, the actual management of a property is not a direct planning consideration. So, Councillor Udi. As we saw last month, we saw someone get outside of their S106 on a block of flats that probably wouldn't have been much different of a block, a, a, a block that probably wasn't much dissimilar to this, and including the demolition of the previous buildings as well. We should have thank our lucky stars that they're offering us two affordable units in this place and fulfilling their obligations, because I feel if we go back, I know the design's not too great, I'm not particularly fussed by it, but it's okay. Sorry, I've got a mint in my mouth. But <laughs> But if we went back and asked for a pitch roof and then it's going to be cost incurring, we're at a massive danger of using those affordable units on a on a on a S one six. Right, members. As I understand the situation, uh, Councillor Atkins has proposed refusal, seconded by Councillor Hunt, on the grounds that this is contrary to PC S twenty three design and conservation in that it does not have excellent architectural quality in the new buildings and that in terms of its appearance and materials in relation to the particular context it again does not meet the requirements of PCS 23. Is that correct Councillor Atkins? Yes I'm happy to take planning officer's advice on that though if, if, if it should include yes. PCS 15. Members and apologies. Uh, I will have to, you'll have to give me just a couple of moments just to give you a general uh, run-up to this. Any reason for refusal to have a chance of success on appeal fundamentally has to have three component parts. The attribute of the scheme which you find unacceptable, the reason that that attribute is causing a harm, and then obviously the policy context that it comes in here. So to take what we've heard, so we do know that the attribute materials have been raised. I'll just pick that one out. We have to identify why that is causing uh, harm and the appropriate policy. A lot of discussions have been had around appearance. We need more than that for a reason for refusal. For example, is it the flat roof? And you have a very straightforward reason for refusal that the proposal by virtue of a flat roof on this site being a corner, prominent corner pot 
uh, in the transition between one character and another is causing it uh, fails to take the opportunities for good enhancement and that's PCS yeah. 23 I, I, th I think yes that, I, that is the primary reason I don't know if it's worth including the, the brutalist style of architecture or not or if you think that's uh, absolutely not um, uh, because a style of architecture isn't, isn't for the planning committee to judge it's the attributes of the architecture so if it is yeah. the flat roof if it is the uh, four stories the size is, so, I mean so it's the size so it's the flat roof and the size, flat so. roof and the size. In, in that position, um, uh, in the transitional area, as you described. If I may, so it is the, it's not just the, is it the transitional area, is it the problems of the corner plot, is it both? It's both. It's problems of the corner plot and the transition to... Um, it's a prominent site, it's got a flat roof, it's the impact of that of that design in that location, isn't it? When you yeah. when you look along towards St George's and St Matthew's Road, which are all 1930s pitch roof houses, it's just not in keeping at all. And also the London Road has the North is prominent location on the way in and out of course of the city. In PCS 23, which guides me, it says it is, it is I would say it's not appropriate, <coughs> which you mentioned it is not appropriate, and I did mention it, not in appropriate in its scale, density, layout, appearance, and materials in relation to the particular context, which is the adjacent houses uh, up uh, northern up at London Road which are, and all around it. Sure. Councillor Smythe. some wording which Councillor Atkins could use. Um, Councillor Atkins, I'm loath to put words in your mouth, but what I understand you're proposing is that the proposal by virtue of the flat roof design and associated visual scale on this prominent corner site within the context of an immediate character, including lower scale pitch roof dwellings, fails to achieve the excellence and high quality of design or take the opportunities available for enhancing the character and quality of the area, contrary to the guidance of the National Planning Policy Framework and Policy PCS 23 of the Portsmouth Plan. Is it worth mentioning detriment to the area, or is, do you think the, the way the, you have captures... The two be? phrases I've used, the excellence and high quality of design is obviously the PCS 23 expectation, and opportunities available for enhancing the character and quality of the area is the MPPF definition of good design. Thank you. I'm happy to adopt that word. Councillor Smythe, before we... I just wondered if there was another picture of this. I think it's, this picture makes it look as if it's a great big box. It, in fact, has several indentations in it. I wonder if there are other pictures that we could see that might give us that uh, a slightly different view of it. The, these are the only drawings we have. Sorry. I'm really sorry about this. And Councillor Atkins, I've got to mention the parking standards in my opposition. It's, it doesn't meet the city's parking standards, and uh, the uh, the loss of park, the uh, lack of parking, will be taken up by uh, the surrounding streets. Apparently, so would you mind putting that in? Um, I I agree actually that, that the parking is a strong concern for me. My difficulty with including it in the objection, and perhaps planning officers can advise, is, is the application is supported by a parking survey. And as much as I have concerns and doubts around that parking survey, I don't want to introduce something that that will actually weaken our objection rather than strengthen it. Uh, 
Okay, I intend to bring this to the vote. Could you read out again, please, the form of words which um, I, would, I would hear from Councillor Atkins' mouth? The proposal by virtue of the flat roof design and associated visual scale on this prominent corner site within the context of an immediate character, including lower scale pitch roof dwellings, fails to achieve the excellence and high quality of design, nor take the opportunities available for enhancing the character and quality of the area, contrary to the guidance of the National Planning Policy Framework and Policy PCS 23 of the Portsmouth Plan. Those who support that proposal for rejection, please show. That is four. Those who are to a contrary mind, please show. Three. The application is therefore rejected. Thank you very much, members. The time is now a quarter past one. I propose having a half hour break. The break will be, Councillor Norton, half an hour or until such time as the chairman actually manages to return. Um, so that will be a quarter to two. Right. Thank you very much, members.
Chair, in the Chair, in the interest of uh, fairness, can I uh, question what grace I was given during my um, comfort break? Is that okay? Fair enough. <laughs> Were it only one person missing now, I would have started, even if it were Councillor, <coughs> even if it were Councillor Pitt who would shout at me afterwards. Well, Cora, we can get on. <laughs> yeah, but given the size of 62 Middle Street and the, um, the fact that it is a very major planning application, I am prepared to wait until we've got a full house. I am also told that uh, there is a problem and that only one of the lifts is working, <coughs> of which I was not aware. <laughs> Favouritism towards Councillor Hoody, yes, OK. <laughs> Hmm. That she wasn't there, so we I can't risk the timing because I've got to catch a train at quarter past three. I, I don't really expect this to go on too long, but just to say that I'll sit out, I'll sit, and um, I will not participate in this because if, if it does go on longer and I need to leave, then I've got to go, so I just won't participate at all. No, it's perfectly okay to participate until such time as you leave. Yeah, but if so you leave before the boat, you leave before the boat. Oh, so, uh, okay. Oh, that's not too bad. Then I thought I would be, if I just said no. that I've got to go, then I'll... Could you see whether Councillor Smythe is coming up the corridor? If not, I think with only one missing, we, can, we will start. No, okay. Right. Members, we come to 62 Middle Street. You will notice that you have a material in the supplementary papers uh, concerning the impact on the Solent SPA. Um, there was also, you will have received this morning, uh, an email from Councillor Corkery on this matter. You haven't seen it? Right. It's okay. Would you like me to summarise it? Yes. Do it in the appropriate time. I have Councillor Corkery's uh, email to us all will be summarised at a suitable time. Um, we will now start. <coughs> Can I have to the table, please, Mr. Tarrant and Mr. Christian? <laughs> Members, may I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so this application is for number 62 Middle Street, uh, which I have indicated here on the plan. Uh, it's probably a very familiar site to a lot of people because it's part of a larger site on the west side of Middle Street, um, which was identified in the Somerstown and North South Sea Area Action Plan for Regeneration. Uh, what I've indicated on here is some of the existing buildings because this application is for the construction of a four-storey block to accommodate up to 21 student rooms. Um, it's an outline application, so the only matters for consideration at this stage are scale and access. So I've just indicated in relation to the block that it is sits within, there has been a four-storey student block built on number 61 Earlston Street, 
Um, then there's the development at 22 Middle Street, which is student accommodation with a couple of commercial units at the ground floor. And further to north, you have um, the Trafalgar Halls with the co-op store underneath. You've got the University Alden building here to the east. And to the west, you've got the now vacant Leamington House and some much lower, scale, lower um, height residential properties to the, further to the west and further to the south as you go down towards the conservation area. This is the, the plan that was from the, this, the area action plan for Summerstown and, and North South Sea. Um, this was site one as it was indicated. And there was a policy in that master plan, the um, SNS8, which identified that whole site for um, B1 employment uses at ground floor level and C3, so private residential uses above. Um, this was 2012, I believe, uh, when it was adopted. Since that time, there has been some variations and flexibility given in, in that policy. Uh, for example, number 22, uh, which has got the commercial units at the ground floor, I think it was granted as sort of A1, B1, but it's now been changed to D2 because they couldn't find tenants. Um, the, the, the student halls to the, to the west of this site I think just has, 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 it was granted as to have an office underneath, which I believe is, is related to that halls. Um, and then the rest of the units in this block remain either vacant or in their current commercial uses. Um, so if I go forward. So these are some photographs of the area. I apologize, they haven't come out very bright. But the, the application site is the building here, which is a two-story building used by the PDSA charity. Um, and I understand there's two flats on the first floor. This is the adjacent student accommodation block. Uh, at the front of the application site at the moment, there's on the Elsdon Street frontage, there's a car park with vehicle access off Elsdon Street. And then if we look towards the north, you've got um, a three-story building immediately next door, which is in use as a stained glass window shop. You've got some two-story buildings carrying on up there, and then the, the, um, the Middle Street, Uni Life Middle Street halls further, further north. And then this is sort of looking from the north to the south. So this is taken from the uh, Middle Street halls looking to the south, you can, you can just about see the application site. Um, and then this is a, a view taken from the Olsen Street side of the application site, looking further to the south to show you how the character of the area changes to a more low-rise buildings as you go further south. As I said, this application is uh, submitted in outline form for scale and access to be determined only. The proposal is to have the principal access off Middle Street here, there may be a, then a couple of um, secondary access points to stores on the Elsdon Street side. There is no vehicle access proposed because there is no parking proposed. Um, this plan here then shows the scale of the building, which is that one there. Um, that's the existing one next door. And then what you can see outlined in blue is um, the outline of a possible scheme, which is currently under consideration for the adjacent site. Um, that scheme is not before you today. It's a much larger scheme for 163 houses and commercial units, which is still in the process of being considered. It hasn't had a recommendation made or determination. So it, it's merely shown on these plans to outline how it relates both to the existing buildings and how it could relate to the buildings if they were to be granted and built. So again, on this plan, you can see the proposed outline of the proposed building here. You can see the existing buildings, um, which are said are relatively low and then sort of rising up at the, this end. Um, and then the blue outline shows the idea if that adjacent scheme also came forward, how it would relate. Now, um, the determination that these plans I've got up here are purely indicative plans. They wouldn't be approved plans, but in making the determination on the outline scheme, we did have regard to the indicative layout that they provided, which showed they could accommodate 21 rooms with appropriate communal facilities. So they showing that there would be a lobby, cycle and bin stores, and a lounge communal space on the ground floor with, uh, with then seven ensuite bedrooms on each of the upper floors. That, that's the indicative layout. But these are not; these would not be approved plans. These are just shown for 
illustrative purposes. Um, this is to show the, re the main relationship, well one of the main relationship issues uh, is the building would be built directly adjacent to this student accommodation block at 61 Elston Street. It is recognised there are three windows here. We have checked floor plans. We are, these are secondary windows to bedrooms, so they have their main windows facing south. Um, and on balance, it was felt that a building blocking the light to these windows wouldn't be so harmful to the residents of these rooms to warrant refusal of the application. Oh, I'll just go back to possibly that image. Um, in terms of nitrates, it's a minor scheme, so um, it would be the, the £200 per, uh, per room that would be charged, which would be through a legal agreement. So the recommendation is for conditional outline permission. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mr Tarrant, you have six minutes. Hi, my name is John Tarrant. I run a stained glass business in the adjacent property. <coughs> Uh, my first objection is the parking, because if this scheme goes ahead, it will take out eight parking spaces, and parking spaces are at a premium. And the reason why all the units, the commercial units, haven't been taken up is because nobody can park anywhere near the place. If you can't park, if people don't arrive in cars, they don't arrive. And it's also very, very difficult uh, to get uh, deliveries. <laughs> As I say, this takes out all, all the um, parking spaces. And I have 30 years first-hand experience as trading on this street, so I know exactly what the, how bad the parking is at the moment, and this is going to make it even worse. Uh, the second objection is the scale. On these proposals here, they try and justify the scale by having Limington House and Horatio House in there, but they, they won't exist anymore, so this whole thing is completely meaningless, because those buildings in the background won't exist. Uh, they are now due to be demolished. The removal of these tower blocks would create a fantastic opportunity uh, for a creative, coherent development with a balance of business, social housing, affordable housing and rented accommodation with imaginative architecture and landscaping. And avoiding piecemeal development is a stated aim of the Council and this proposal here is piecemeal. To say we want to do this, we might do that, we won't do anything else. It needs an overall plan and a vision. This is absolutely terrible. Uh, the ecology, uh, these people claim that there will be e ecology. This is a photograph of the building when they bought it, and the first thing they did was remove a large flowering cherry tree. It's vandalism. <coughs> so that sums up their ecological things. The build quality, uh, the building, uh, the people involved in this are the same people who built the building at the back and the there's the same developers involved, uh, the same planning authority involved and the same architects will be involved. The build quality of this is absolutely appalling. This is what it looks like after eight years. I don't know if you want to pass it round. That's what we've got to look at at the back and that's after eight years. We've, we've had a, a, an eight-year legal battle with Unilife and the planning department as they removed our right-of-way and then they put in a non-material <laughs> amendment which took out our fire escape and we had to spend £40,000 on legal bills to get our right-of-way reinstated and our fire escape reinstated. <coughs> which is totally unacceptable and we are not comfortable with the same people being involved in this project. Um, the, we have reported this to the city solicitor and he is doing a report on it and I had a meeting with him yesterday and he's assured me that he will have a full report early in the new year to the behaviour of the people involved in the previous development. <coughs> And we had our fire escape reinstated, and they put a huge gas pipe right next to our fire escape. We didn't have a fire escape for three years, three or four years. And we also had a note from the council, from Portsmouth City Council, saying that they got a statutory requirement to make sure that we have a fire escape. 
and yet the planning departments went out of their way to make sure we didn't, and they went out of their way to make sure that we didn't, that our right of way was taken away. It's appalling. And that's my case. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Christian, you have five minutes. So you'd have six minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the applicant uh, in support of the outline application for 21 student dwellings, which your officers recommended for approval. As outlined in the officers' uh, very comprehensive report, uh, the proposed development follows the precedent of student accommodation established in the area. This, the site is appropriate for student accommodation as it's close to university buildings, the city centre and good transport links. The proposed development contributes to the council's housing need through efficient use of the site. Detailed pre-application discussions have taken place with your officers over a number of years to ensure the design is an enhancement to the local area and wider Portsmouth. The local area supports the scale and design of the development. The scheme has been carefully considered to ensure the immunity of neighbouring residents is protected and whilst this is only an outline application. Detailed design has been thought through to ensure deliverability. As detailed in the planning application, the proposal includes opportunities to enhance habitat provision um, for ecology, such as provision of creating vegetation areas and bird and bat nesting sites. The applicant is working with officers to produce the Section 106 agreement, which includes contributions towards protection of local special protection areas, the applicant has sought to minimise nitrate levels leaving the development through designing in water efficiency measures such as low flow taps, showers and dual flush WCs. In addition to this, the applicant also agrees to the financial contribution set out in your nitrate mitigation strategy. We have worked closely with your officers to develop a scheme that proposes well needed accommodation whilst respecting neighbouring amenity and the character of the area. This has included pre-application discussions, design amendments and most recently pro a proactive approach to the nitrates matter. I would like to take this opportunity to thank your officers for proactively working with us. In view of your officers positive committee report and the positive addition that this scheme would make to Portsmouth and the University, we respectfully request that the application be approved subject to uh, the conditions proposed by your officer. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? Uh, Councillor Jones, then Councillor Hunt. Well, there's a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot going on here, um, and I have to say Mr Tarrant's deputation causes me great concern um, as a councillor um, because there are a whole load of things which are not necessarily material planning considerations, but they are nonetheless um, not very good, and, and I thank him for coming to share those with us. And um, should he want to contact me afterwards, I'd be very happy to, to assist him in any way I can as a councillor. In terms of Peter Balfe's city solicitor's involvement, um, I'm wondering if anyone can answer me. Is that because the council is the freeholder? Is that why the council's been involved in this, or is it a separate issue, in which case it's probably not for this committee? It's a separate issue. Okay. It sounds like a separate issue, but I've not been involved with it, so I'm, I'm not aware of the details, unfortunately. Fine. Okay. And was it Peter that you were dealing with? Yeah. Okay. Um, in which case, at that point, I'm going to stop in terms of questions because there are lots of things around the fire escape and other things and the right of way. But clearly, they're well. I mean, I don't, I don't think they are a material planning consideration for today, unless anyone can contradict me otherwise. But they sound like they are issues um, for outside of the meeting. Maybe something I can speak to Peter about. Yes, there would be certainly material consider major considerations uh, if they affect the final application, but this is an outline application. Um, Councillor Hunt. Good. So if we look at page 60, under other matters ecology, the third paragraph, it says given the limited ecological value of the existing site, the redevelopment offers an opportunity for increasing habitats and achieving a net gain in biodiversity comply with policy PCS and I'm very interested in that can I ask how that can be achieved are we talking about 
you know, boxes for sparrowhawks on the roof and things like that. Yeah, if you um, just the, the paragraph before talks about possible. Um, the, sorry. the paragraph before the one you that the, talks about the. Um, Possible incorporation, yes, yeah, so that, that's the possible measures. There's then a condition, no, number nine, um, which would require a biodiversity enhancement plan to be submitted and approved before the development <coughs> commenced. So that would, they would then have to show us what measures the design was going to incorporate to attract species and enhance biodiversity. But what happens if they say it can't be done? Well, they have a but they have a condition that they need to comply with, so it's we, we would then have the opportunity to consult with the ecologists and we determine on that condition. So they have a condition that needs to be met there. So I'm very interested in this. <coughs> if it goes through today, I don't need to come back, but if it goes through today, please can someone just help me and, and send me a, a, a paragraph about what was done about that. Is that all right, please? Is that okay? Just I want to learn because of the the recent um, uh, reps, uh, the recent um, briefings we've been getting around the emerging greening up of Portsmouth, uh, those sorts of things. Councillor Atkins. Uh, yes, I, I would, <coughs> was a little concerned by um, the comments that uh, were made in the deputation that um, the. Um, proposed development could have a negative impact on other local businesses in the, the, the B1 usage area by first of all sort of detrimentally impacting on parking. How has the conclusion arrived at that this scheme has, has no effect on parking and, and is there a current use of the car park? What goes on with the car park that is there present that's, that's going to be lost? The car park as I understand is, is a, it's a private car park to the building that's on the site at the moment. Um, this is a student accommodation scheme, so the proposal is that the applicants would enter into a legal agreement which would include a student intake and uh, exit, I can't believe I, <coughs> arrivals plan, arrivals and departures plan to manage traffic when they come and go. Um, on the basis of having that properly controlled, the highways authority does not raise an objection to the student scheme having no parking. Also, given the proximity to the other the other university buildings and the city centre. Councillor Atkins. I, I don't know if this is appropriate or relevant or not. I, I was um, curious to, to know your opinion whether or not I could ask the, the deputy um, what he's aware of as regards the, the future scheme that's been mentioned for the row and whether or not he's had talks about is his business likely to have to move soon as a result. Because I, I am concerned, and I'll explain how it relates to planning on this application, which is I am concerned about this application having a negative impact on existing businesses in an area we have designated for business. Um, and so <clears throat> I, I, I was wondering if, if the applicant felt he was likely to have to move his business soon anyway or if... Um, if if uh, that's unlikely to happen. Well, since you've said you want to ask the applicant a question, a yes. uh, specific question. To. Uh, yeah, so, so in relation to this scheme that's mentioned here in the blue outline to build new build bl blocks on the site, are existing business holders being consulted on moving away at any time? No. So at present, there's nothing in place for as you're aware for, for existing businesses in that road to move. No. Thank you, Councillor Pitt. Thank you, Chair. The um, ongoing debate that we have around um, whether more student accommodation is needed or not is one thing. I'm slightly concerned that we're losing two <coughs> normal residential units here, though. Most of the other student property that we've seen developed has been on brownfield sites. Um, there's none I can think of where we've actually knocked down housing for local residents to put a student block on it. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's got any uh, material consideration here or any relevance or precedent. Mr Maguire. So a change of use is, is obviously what you are considering as well as the outline illustration of the scale of the building. The material weight to give to that is for members to decide, but obviously you don't have any specific policies that would resist and the demolition of two homes for the provision of 21 student uh, units in principle is the overall implications uh, that you need to bear in mind. Obviously within that I would uh, advise 
one of the advantages of providing student housing is it obviously diverts student accommodation from other forms uh, of housing. So if there is enough purpose-built student accommodation to meet 100% of student need, they don't go into small HMOs. Thus, more, there are more HMOs available for general needs housing. It's a, an interlinked housing market. So by putting 21 units on here, that's four homes that won't be needed to be uh, small HMOs to accommodate those students that otherwise would have nowhere uh, to go. That, that's how we would balance the, the residential implications uh, in this location. Other questions, members? Councillor Stubbs. Um, yeah, several questions. Uh, so firstly, we've got this um, other application to the, to the north, which must be a submitted application. Um, what's the policy position in terms of ground floor uses for this area? I mean, do they have to have, do, does the neighbouring development or does this development or do both have to have some form of, some form of commercial use on the ground floor? Is there any policy which pushes them that way? Or is the proposal to have um, a residential or student use on the ground floor? The, um, as when I was doing my presentation, I mentioned the policy SNS 8, which is one of the policies in the um, area action plan. This indicated the whole of site one, so this site plus the, the bit shown in blue and the existing student halls uh, for B1A, so very specific office use on the ground floor with residential above C3 use. Um, as I explained, there's already been some changes and flexibility in that provision over time, um, which I think is partly due to market demand, market changes, um, and the proximity to the university, which meant these sites were seen as appropriate locations for student accommodation. So there is a policy, and this is this is the reason this is before you, um, it's because it, it does it essentially is a departure from that adopted policy. Um, but it's been assessed on, on balance that, that this, the development of this particular site for student accommodation would not prejudice the wider delivery of um, employment uses on the rest of the site. Because the adjacent scheme, if it was to come forward, um, if it was to be permitted, does include employment uses at ground floor. Okay, so, f I mean, that's... that's uh yeah, that's one of the things I was trying to clarify because I, I don't, you know, you would think both sites would be treated in the same way. Um, I mean, this development, is this one separate from the Ave 1 in the sense that there's no proposals for linking corridors or anything like that to run it as a single development? Yeah, that's right. This is standalone because the, the one next door is proposed as a completely different, it would be private housing. Right, okay. And the indicative layout that you've got um, is such that there are no windows on the north side of the building. I know it's only indicative, but the room layout is such that it doesn't require that. Uh, and also, just to quickly ask about the cherry tree, was that a protected tree or was that unprotected? It wasn't a protected tree, so we had okay, no control. so we have no powers over that. Councillor Smith. Um, you mentioned a letter from Councillor Corkery, and I wondered if we could have the benefit of that right. earlier rather than later, because I may have a question to ask after that. Thank you. Okay. Just to give you a quick summary, members, uh, Councillor Corkery has written in to say that he would like to object to this planning application uh, on the grounds that he believes council land should be used for social housing, uh, and it's not an evidence need for more student accommodation. Uh, there's a bit more wording around that, but because the priority of this council should be for building new social housing. Smith. Well, I could follow up on that. I mean, I think I absolutely uh, agree with what he said there, but I need some clarification about uh, the issue um, of the council owning the land here. And presumably the council who own the land would always have the um, <coughs> right to refuse to sell to any developer, regardless of um, the existence of a planning application. Am I right? Well, no, got one reason, Sorry, I, I need to have that explained. So what I can say is the issue of land ownership and the right to develop land, uh, having control of the land is one separate to the right to develop land on the Town and Country Planning Act, the planning permission. So what rights any applicant may have, there is an ownership in this site by Portsmouth City Council, what rights they have agreed or will agree with the Portsmouth City Council to develop it. I can't give you further advice. Uh, they would certainly need to have the appropriate rights, but that is out with the control of the planning committee. I understand that. My question was a little bit more specific. What I said was that even if there was a planning permission on this site, it would be the right of the landowner, and in this case the City Council, to um, refuse to sell. Is that right? 
chairman. Sorry, I mean, I, I specifically dealt with this site when I was leader of the council okay. um, in Middle Street, so I can probably give some clarity on this. Um, yes, the council owns uh, the majority of that block of, of the freehold, um, but there were long leases that were established to um, people that were controlling the buildings. Now, in terms of redeveloping them, um, I don't know off the top of my head the ins and outs of the uh, leasehold agreement um, with us as the council as a freeholder, um, but unless there is a covenant or there is something restrictive on the site that stops the if you had a 125 year lease for example on on the bits that are outlined in blue um uh it could be a very basic lease agreement in which case to all intents and purposes the people that have got that lease own that site really for 125 years so the fact that we're getting some very basic peppercorn rent or very basic amount because often the value is given at the time that you sell the long lease so that's when the council gets its big cash value and what goes on thereafter is, is a de minimal amount of money and we met with the people for this site because it came up in the local plan or it had been in the local plan for a number of years for redevelopment they approached us about um, acquiring the freehold to it um, I don't know what the conclusion of that was I was involved in some of the meetings but it was three or four years ago so I can't remember off the top of my head but it's not always the case that the freeholder can stop a development because if the lease doesn't say that then to all intents and purposes like I say it, it's their land for that period of time um, and it's only if there's a specific restrictive covenant on the lease that you can you can prevent a development in that way but of course that then brings the value of it down when you're selling the lease so quite often um, unless it's a very special site councils don't do that thank you um, that was helpful um, but we still don't know whether there is uh, this is a this was a potential site that the uh, Council had uh, earmarked for affordable housing, as Cal Corkery has indicated, and um, I know that this is not a planning consideration. I'm very conscious of that, but in terms of um, um, my question, that doesn't that helps me to understand the context in which that decision we made. Is it something that uh, we could know in this making this decision? Mr. McGuire, yeah. if I say in terms of say site control see the planning authority produces policy and makes decisions so and that that's really where your role ends as the planning committee um, the policy the most pertinent one I would suggest is of course the air action plan uh, for this area this allocates this site for four to eight stories of C3 residential and B1 on the ground floor the proposal does not include either C3 residential or B1 on the ground floor so hence we have brought it to you as the committee to say well actually we do think notwithstanding that it is appropriate to put student accommodation on all four floors of the proposed outline scheme uh, on this site because there is adequate space within the broader allocation for city residential uh, and commercial activities on the ground floor that's how we've come to our conclusion but it is allocated for housing not for students so there is a, uh, a policy presumption on that basis but it is a fairly aged policy presumption and it's one where experience in, a, in developing the other area has demonstrated that student accommodation are appropriate as always though to give you the headline issue it is a matter of judgment balancing all of the policies together we have as SPD on student halls of residence saying we, we should provide student halls of residence in walking and cycling distance to the city centre and the university so you're going to have conflict then with action plans that say don't put student halls of residence here it's a matter of judgment for you to weigh those two things in your mind and come to a decision whether this is acceptable and also through you chair it wasn't allocated for social housing in the um, area plan it was so allocated for housing well, I mean it could be social but it wasn't specific uh, just another question if I might yes um, then Councillor Atkins we um, since I've been on the Planning Committee we haven't had many outline permissions to um, to agree um, this is about bulk and footprint and the, the maximum number of flat of accommodation is that right yes yeah, so, they, so they've um, submitted this to determine scale which would include what you just said the, the sort of depth width height um, and access and in this particular case there's only pedestrian access so there's not a huge access consideration but uh, then the matters it would be reserved so you'd have a separate application at a later date which would cover the d detailed design and appearance um, <coughs> along with any landscaping <coughs> um, uh, I've got a blank but there's, a, there's, a, there's another matter that any of the other detailed matters would then be addressed through a separate reserve matters submission 
But the numbers of flats could go down but couldn't go up. The number of rooms couldn't go yeah. down, could go up but not, could go yes. down but not up. Yeah, I mean, the, what, from what the indicative plans show, they, they, they've said, you know, it would be hard to get more than 21 well, uh, in that site, yeah. My, my point is that I think we are in danger of building a lot of housing that will be substandard for any other use and that therefore when a detailed planning application came in I would anticipate being very concerned about the sort of um, and you just gave us an indicative idea of what it might look like but it does seem to me with student housing not being fully taken up already we need to look at, at the possibility that in the future it would have to be used by another sort of household and there isn't space there to do it. But if, uh, if you say it's maximum and then we can negotiate down or whatever if there were details, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, if I may. To be absolutely clear, this is a student application. So, yes, they are. Uh, this is an, a demonstration of how one could accommodate 21 19 square metre en suite student rooms and a ground floor bin cycle lobby and lounge area. Uh, that meets your student halls of residence, design garden, so on and so forth. Clearly, if they decided not to progress that and made a different application for flats, not for student use, this outline application is of no use to them. They would have to reapply for a new application for C3 use and provide, if they wanted to do it on outline, new indicative plans showing flats of a minimum size. So you wouldn't be doing 21 19 square metre flats, you'd be doing a smaller number of larger flats to accommodate the same uh, issue and you probably wouldn't have a communal lobby and kitchen either. So that would need a whole new set of planning applications if that was the case. My question was simply that um, given that the the application we're looking for for the bulk of the rest of the site does include that B1 on the ground floor, is there any danger in allowing this application that we establish a precedent for for getting rid of that or is, is, is it still going to be acceptable to us to demand the B1 ground floor on the further applications we might see in the same area? The... the uh the, the, the adjacent site, I said it's still under consideration, it's actually for um, flexible business use, not just B1. Um, but no, we would have to, we have to assess each application as it comes in, in light of the area action plan policy and determine the impact on that objective. So that would be a consideration in the larger scheme as well. And we've considered it separately in this scheme. So it we will always have to be considered under that policy objective. Councillor Pitt. I might take a couple of goes at this. Um, Ian, in terms of the way this has been uh, balanced by officers to come to a recommendation uh, for conditional permission, you specifically mentioned the, uh, the possibility of student accommodation uh, freeing up uh, normal family units in, in the area. My concern is that um, we have seen an awful lot of student accommodation built in this in the wider area around the city centre none of which is remotely uh, cost uh, relevant to smaller HMOs in terms of how much the rent is it's massively higher uh, and therefore it's not freeing up those homes so um, could you give me an idea of how much weight that was in, in making this uh, recommendation for conditional permission so obviously the case officers put their balance in detail in how they've come to the conclusion in approving this recommendation as the Chief Planning Officer. Uh, I gave it, I'd say, limited weight. Uh, as always, there's a lot of adjectives we can use in this description, but it's obviously looking at that specific question of what you're losing and what you're gaining in any change of use application. So we're, we're losing the current commercial occupancy uh, and the small number of residential units, and we're gaining a student block. The exactly how the market has responded to filling student accommodation uh, and what that means for the overall housing provision within the city is of course when you're looking at a small site like this hard one to you know, project out across uh, the entire city but uh, I would remain satisfied that if you provide 21 uh, ensuite units of, the, of this kind that can only provide some some student ha housing thus meaning it would not uh, impact on student need elsewhere. If it's an over-provision, the fear that there is too much student housing and it would never be let, then it would, obviously the landowner is not going to let it sit 
idly they would seek plan permission for uh, some alterations and put flats in it instead and you would certainly get more than two residential units uh, in there so the actual negative implications for the overall housing stock uh, of the city and I can get quite technical on the housing uh, delivery test calculations on how we should accommodate student numbers and what that means in a uh, in an overall uh, objective says housing need calculation this is of benefit to the residential provision of the city and consequently it does weigh in favour of the application albeit it's limited weight but it does weigh in favour of the application compared to other aspects of the proposal which may weigh perhaps against it okay um, so limited weight but nevertheless weight so chair with your permission can I ask the applicant if they uh, they would have already done a viability assessment for this site to see whether or not uh, it stacks up for them financially so we're going to ask the applicant's representative to give us a ballpark figure of how much these uh, units will be rented to students for please you can ask but um, it's not uh, as yeah, colleagues have said it's not a planning consideration how much they would go for um, so we I don't have that information um, the applicant I'm sure has considered he wouldn't build something if he didn't think he could occupy it a no then thank you sorry am I correct then that the the error because I'm looking at the error action plan and I'm trying to get online if anybody wonders what I'm doing on my thing on my iPhone I'm trying to get online to get to the the um, the um, link but I've not been able to get there so far so the um, Air Action Plan seeks <coughs> employment use at ground floor, is that correct? Yes. Specifically B1 employment B1. use, office employment Office use spaces, support. and this application does not do that. Yep, thank you very much. Councillor Atkins. Um, I was going to follow up with the applicant and maybe he's going to give the same response. Do, does he know um, the target occupancy for the building in terms of students? <coughs> Obviously, the target's 100%, but uh, the kind of the break-even occupancy. Um, obviously, we would aim. The applicant would aim to fill <laughs> the thing. Um, so hence, the point of building it. Um, the also on the employment side of things, not having employment on the ground floor, we have submitted employment um, supply documents, one for each application. The major application has some, and this one that has none. Um, so that provides all the evidence you need as to why there's no employment on the ground floor. Comments, members, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Deputy for um, uh, shedding some light on the situation. I think it's interesting to hear that, and although it may not be uh, material grounds there, it is worth um, hearing. Um, also, I uh, understand Councillor Corkery's comments, although um, you know they're a bit repetitive, and I think he makes the same point about every inch of land across the city. Our job here is not to decide what could go there instead, is to decide on the application that's in front of us. And the application that in front of us, that is in front of us, um, I think, I'm not convinced by some of these material grounds, uh, you know, the impact on character and appearance, impact on uh, amenities, uh, loss of outlook and privacy, increase of noise, impact on the environment through the ecology. I'm, I'm not completely convinced on, on all of those. So I think with that in mind, I, I'm probably inclined to uh, vote against uh, officer's recommend recommendations here. I'm not going to propose it at this stage, but I'm, I think I'm, that's the way I'm heading. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, sure. What is important too with these tall buildings is how they relate to the ground floor. And uh, <clears throat> so you need busy things to be going on on the ground floor. Otherwise, you just get these dead streets, you know, so you want light shining out and so on. And we've been able to, we've been quite successful at doing that. If you go out of here, you go look uh, near the railway station. So how these tall buildings relate to the ground is important. In this particular case, it breaches policy PCS6. It does not provide the employment use of the ground floor. That is our policy. It's very clear. The officers talked about it today, and for those reasons, it should be refused. Are you 
were then proposing refusal on the grounds as set out in PCS 6? Yes, as described by the officers in this conversation. Is there a seconder for that? That is seconded by Councillor Stubbs. Councillor Stubbs, do you wish to speak to the matter? Well, not really at any length. I mean, I, I share the concerns that have been raised through others about the, the employment land and indeed about the whole change to this street. Uh, so um, I, I don't think this is um, a particularly positive development, and um, so I shall certainly support refusal on it. Um, and I do have to say, just because I'm not sure it's going to get said, but I'll say it anyway, um, that um, uh, when Councillor Norton refers to Councillor Corker is wanting social housing on every site. Well, there is one exception, uh, which was the Labour Party site, which went for student accommodation. I am not surprised that you got that one in. <laughs> um, other comments from members? Right. Um, I'm just trying to find PCS 6. Can I just clarify Sorry? that we'd probably need to refer to two policies, PCS 6 and SNS 8. That's the one you meant, as I said, as yeah. described by officers earlier. So I can't recall everything. And I just can't get the link. Members, as, as before, obviously, if we're looking at reason for refusal, we need to identify the specific aspects, and I, I think I understand them, but just so that they are clearly articulated, obviously, primarily, of course, for the applicant, so they can structure any appeal or understand any change in the future. So of the aspects of both PCS 6 and, obviously, SN8, it is the lack of provision of employment space, which is the reason you are recommending refusal. That's right. And and uh, I don't know whether it is, but I think it's important the way a, a building, a tall building, relates to the ground as well. And I haven't seen any evidence how it relates to the ground because there's only an outline planning permission. If I can offer some strong caution uh, on that, it, they are in, yeah, they're entitled, so it's a little bit against to understand so that they can articulate the reason for refusal. So the wording to assist members that don't have access to the internet uh, for of PCS 6 is that we do, this is the Summerston and North South Sea, there is the penultimate bullet point, uh, we are looking to achieve the retention and consolidation of employment uses in the area, clearly removing this commercial use on a site that we have allocated for employment use on the ground floor, not reprovided it, fails to retain employment use. So it's a quite black and white straightforward reason for refusal. It fails to retain employment use in accordance with PCS 6 and SN uh, 8, which is a specific identification of employment use uh, in the area action plan. So it's a, it's a black and white one like that, just so members understand the wording that would be used. So members, uh, it has been proposed that the application be rejected and we refuse planning permission on the grounds of um, that this area has been set out for have commercial use on the ground floor as set out in PCS 6. Has it been proposed and seconded? Those in favour of that proposal please show. Those against, please show. Those abstaining, please show. So that has been refused by six votes to nil with one abstention. The planning application is refused. Thank you. I'm surprised at that, but never mind. Members, we now come to the land at the rear of 76 Vernon Road, which you will find on page 67 of your papers. Uh, may I have Mr. Cox to the table, please? the officer's report please. Uh, thank you Chair, uh, good afternoon members. Um, as a point of 
order, I direct your attention to the supplementary matters list, which features a letter from Councillor Robert New, who was unfortunately unable to attend committee. Um, this application was previously considered by your committee in October, but was deferred in order to provide additional insight on the issues brought up by the committee. The points of further inquiry were its designation as a traditional orchard and a priority habitat, the previous use of the land, uh, what planning designation it should be given, and whether the proposed development constituted a garden land grab. Following the deferral, uh, the LPA have been in correspondence with the applicant and Natural England in respect of the points raised above to confirm the site is designated by DEFA as a traditional orchard and a pri ha priority habitat under the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act of 2006, which also, also states that, that the Council has to have regard to, so far as consistent with the proper exercise of those functions, the purpose of, conserve of conserving um, biodiversity. The area itself was cleared in 2018 prior to the application, but it is recommended by Natural England that it is still considered as a traditional orchard. Uh, comments were sought further from Natural England concerning the site's designation and its proposed redevelopment. Given that the site was cleared of trees prior to the application, Natural England have suggested that a biodiversity mitigation and enhancement plan is drawn up, which considers the loss of the traditional orchard and um, for compensation and mitigation to be sought if required. This is considered to be an adequate solution having regards to the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act, and this will be secured through condition subject to the granting of any permission. In regards to the previous use of the land, the applicant has confirmed that the area was originally sold to the previous owner in three stages. While the area is considered to be previously undeveloped land, the LPA have concluded that the principle of utilising the land for garages is acceptable given the context of the location. Um, further, as highlighted previously, the area of land is not designated as protected green space in the Portsmouth Plan. Uh, just for a um, summary of um, the previous points, um, the site relates to a parcel of loca land located at the rear of the gardens of numbers 64 to 76 Vernon Road and numbers 45 to 55 Glenfort Road. The eastern boundary of the site abuts a comparatively narrow, unmade private rear access way leading out onto both Glenfawn and Vernon Road. Uh, planning permission is sought for the construction of seven garages and one storage unit at the site. Uh, the proposed garages would measure 2.4 metres in height, 2.6 metres in width and 5.9 metres in width in depth. And the existing floor would be covered in a permeal paving and to the north, south and west of the site a closed board wooden boundary fence would be installed. Um, the site is not readily, readily visible from the public realm and the proposed outbuildings are considered to be of an appropriate size and would not appear intrusive in their setting and given the prevailing character of outbuildings in the vicinity the proposed units are considered to be acceptable in their overall design. Um, the majority of the properties to the east of the site feature rear outbuildings at the end of their gardens which would mitigate most of the views towards the proposed garages and the rear of the neighbouring properties to the west are separated by their rear gardens. Representations have, been, have raised concerns around the potential use of the garages by commercial enterprises which could cause additional noise and disturbance and while the renting and selling of the garages would be for economic gain they would, not, they would be conditioned to restrict their use preventing them from being operated as separate commercial businesses and preventing them being used for the storage of commercial or industrial items. Um, the garages are proposed to be accessed via the private service road which is accessed, which get, provides access to the existing garages at Vernon Road and Glenfawn Road. Uh, it's not anticipated that the proposal would generate enough tra traffic to have a material impact on the operation of the local highway network and adequate visibility is available at each of the accesses to the rear service road. They are too narrow to allow cars to pass each other However, both Glenfawn and Vernon Road are quiet residential roads and their, this activity would not conflict with the intended road function. And adequate space is proposed to allow vehicles to turn on site and so, and so to enter and leave in a forward gear. So this proposal will increase the local residential parking opportunities and make it more convenient for local residents to find a place to park and as a consequence improve residential amenity. 
Um, issues have also been brought up around the width and um, condition of the access from Glenthorne and Vernon Road. These accesses are already used by cars, so the proposed use wouldn't be materially different than their existing. So having regards to the above matters, the proposal is considered to be on balance acceptable and appropriate at this location and accord with policy PCS 23, 17 and the Natural England uh, and Rural Communities Act of 2006. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Cox, you have six minutes to address the committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Committee, uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to outline our strong objection to this planning application. I'm here today representing my mother, uh, Daphne Cox of 49 Glenthorne Road, and Lionel Marl as well of 78 Vernon Road, both of which properties and occupants um, are adjacent to the uh, aforementioned uh, application. We are extremely disappointed that once again the Planning Officer and Assistant Director of Planning have refused to agree a site visit um, by members or, or, um, or members or groups of members to meet with local residents on this matter and view the issues for themselves. Providing the pictures that you have combined with what would be believed to be an ill-judged view from the highways engineer is in our opinion not sufficient. Given the significant issues regarding this proposed development and the likely reputational damage to the Council from subsequent publicity around this situation, should the application be granted by the committee, we firmly believe they are not actively considered the residents' views and the objections that have been raised, particularly on the pictures which do not show a vehicle trying to transverse down those access roads. We note the planning officer has provided some brief answers to the objections raised, but has still not provided a mechanism for further discussion, and in our view does not pay proper regard to the concerns raised. Our objection covers a number of key points. The applicant who currently owns the land is not a local resident and will not be personally impacted by this development, nor have need for its utilisation. This is not a private residential development, but one purely for commercial gain, and the information provided on the application to the committee is, in our opinion, misleading in this regard. Whilst the planning papers do outline a condition that the proposed garage storage units shall not be used as a separate commercial business at any time or used for storage of commercial industrial items, we would ask that if this development is permitted that this condition be extended to state that the garage's workshop cannot be used for any form of commercial gain, including being rented on a commercial basis. I would also ask the committee to consider how this condition, as currently worded, could ever be enforced, as we understand that the landowner doesn't even live in Portsmouth. As a commercial development of seven garages and workshop, this would increase the volume of traffic used in these roads by between 100 and 150 per cent in our estimation, mainly because a number of the garages are not able to be currently used because the size of modern cars um, restricts the ability to access those private roads. The damage this will cause to the local community, as well as the risk to elderly, residents and children, has been completely ignored. The ongoing reputation of damage to the council will be considerable as a result of a coordinated publicity by the local residents should this application be granted. I would like to remind the committee from the last meeting that the access roads to development are private roads owned by the local residents. As the owner of this land is no longer a resident of any of the relevant properties, they or any subsequent occupier of those garages, unless they are resident, have no right of access to these roads. Additional non-resident access would be unacceptable and physically restricted. If planning consent is granted for this development, the residents in Glenfond Road that own its access roads will be forced to install lockable security gates to physically restrict access. They will also raise significant publicity regarding these actions. I understand the local residents in Vernon Road access will secure their existing gates, as you can see, to all but residents of Vernon Road. Any attempt to gain access with action by local residents, which I can assure the committee, will have a reputational impact. The planning documents state that any development may cause some issues during its construction. This may be an unavoidable consequence of development and ought not to be a difficulty in this instance. It goes on to say that the development will have their own responsibility around not blocking the right of access of these shared routes. This is completely unacceptable and I can assure the committee that this will cause significant difficulties, particularly as a number of residents affected are either elderly with disabilities or have young children who need to use their garage daily as a car is their only means of reliable transportation. As construction would take some considerable time, assuming they can even manage to get access, blocking access to the existing garages would be inevitable and cause significant distress to those residents affected. The planning documents also make reference to the issues of security, however these conditions do not go nearly far enough. 
The proposed lighting will cause significant light pollution given the proximity of the houses, and the committee should consider placing further conditions, should the application be granted, for the provision of 24-hour actively monitored security cameras. The, the potential for damage to local community from vandalism and, and burglary is considerable, and the subsequent reduction in property values has not been considered in this application. You may remember from the last committee meeting it was disclosed that there is an adjacent piece of land that belongs to the next block of residence. I'd like to bring to the attention of the planning committee that we've spoken to the residents of 33 Glenthorne Road who back on, who back in 2011 submitted a planning application to develop the land behind their properties, which as I mentioned is adjacent to the land in question here. It was proposed to develop a single story dwelling with parking onto that land. However, from discussing with the original applicant, our understanding is that the application was withdrawn before consideration on the advice of planning officers that development on this greenfield site would not be acceptable given the impact and intrusion on other local re residents. I can provide the reference for that, that uh, planning application if required. Therefore, this piece of green land, which I mentioned joins the land here in question, is still a green space. I'm surprised that this has not been considered or brought to the attention of the committee in previous meetings, given the sim sim similarities of a single-storey building on a greenfield space with similar intrusion issues. The final point I'd like to raise is a significant reputation and policy issue for the Council. It has been noted that the Council is placing significant emphasis on the reduction of air pollution in the city. I reference the reports that the City's Council leader has written to the Environment Secretary asking for support to fund alternative initiatives to reduce air pollution and that the Council estimates that half, almost half of the air pollution in Portsmouth is caused by cars, HGVs and buses. The report stated that the City needs a much wider and more radical plan to reduce air pollution and includes suggestions such as car scrappage, investment in cycling and converting taxes. In addition to this, during the recent election, one of the focal points for all political parties was the climate emergency, and in particular the creation of green spaces, tree planting, and government promises to restore and plant new woodland. It therefore seems incredulous to me that the Council is proposing to approve the destruction of a traditional orchard on a greenfield space that existed for over 80 years and replace it with garages for commercial use in the middle of the city. Can you be bringing this towards a yeah. conclusion? Yes. Yeah. Rather than permitting this development, in the opinion of local residents, the Council should be compelling the landowners to reinstate this traditional orchard as a green space, mm -hmm. as an ecological area supporting biodiversity and playing a small way in, in uh, climate change. In summary, this development will increase the level of traffic and pollution in quiet urban streets significantly. It will encourage greater car ownership rather than support the use of alternatives, cause significant light pollution and increase the risk to local residents, and above all this, the granting this application will remove a much cherished and loved urban green space in a time where, as a result of the climate crisis, these spaces should be permitted. For all the points I've... One last... 20 seconds. For all the points I've raised at this and previous planning committee, I urge the planning committee to reject this application. The reputation damage to the council destroying a traditional orchard and replacing it with garages for commercial profit will receive significant publicity, especially when combined with the local tensions this will create. This should not be underestimated by the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? Councillor Norton, Councillor Atkins. Thank you, Chair. Can officers uh, confirm that no planning officer visited the site? Um, I did visit the site um, three times. I don't have the dates on hand, but I did visit the property and site. And secondly, if there were a, uh, I know we've mentioned this before, there were a fire there, are we confident that you know, a vehicle could gain access uh, to that site? So that's obviously a matter covered by building regulation approval rather than the planning issue. As can be seen from the images, this is a, an existing access road to rear, proper, rear garages elsewhere, so this is just more of the same on that issue, but covered by uh, separate legislation. Councillor um, <clears throat> The Deputy and Councillor uh, Robert New both made reference to the fact that this is loss of a green space. I know we are working that into our local plan going forward um, but is there anything currently on, on that basis which we can use to determine this application is it relevant that we are losing a green space for a kind of tarmac over garage area and, and kind of as a follow up to that um, in terms of the the, um, the orchard designation it appears natural England have said the development can go ahead with other mitigation is that correct they've not told us there is any strong imperative to retain this green space uh, 
Um, Natural England has uh, indicated that it's a traditional orchard, and that would be what they would consider it as as it, as, as it is. Um, but due to um, for, for some developments that have taken place, that has greatly been reduced in terms of its uh, what how they would indicate it as being. But this, this is a traditional um, orchard, and that that's the advice they've given. Um, but subject to mitigation, which um, the applicant has uh, volunteered. Yeah, yeah, it, just, it, seemed, it does seem to make a little bit of a mockery of, of, the, of the idea we continue to have the, the designation traditional orchard if we allow garages to be followed. But I haven't actually heard anything which allows us to, or, or which would be grounds for refusal on, on the basis of its designation. Is that correct? It, it just seems very incongruous that it could remain designated traditional orchard, but there can't be grounds, therefore, to, to keep it green or encourage the replanting of trees. Mr. McGuire. So the, the DEFRA mapping was a, a picture of time. Obviously, they, a lot of that was taken from aerial photographs, etc., as well as historic records. Things change uh, over time generally, which is why policy has to be updated. Obviously, your local plan policy regarding the retention of green space uh, is policy. And I'll just want to open up the right tab here. Um, is uh, policy PCS 13, which does uh, encourage us to refuse application, which result in the net loss of existing areas of open space, as shown on our map that designates those spaces. This is not one of those spaces. Um, uh, so there is, if I say, historic mapping will show that everywhere in Boston at some point was green space. Um, this was recently, um, to find that as you wish, traditional orchard. It had that purpose, uh, and consequently, uh, government agency have uh, invited us to consider that because, because of that history, it has a higher likelihood of biodiversity opportunity, uh, and obviously we have that general duty to conserve uh, biodiversity and, and look at opportunities for green space. More importantly, I say to members, that's a mature consideration that has to be borne in mind. You have that duty under Section 40 of the National Environment and Rural Communities Act. But also, it's fundamentally, you can see what the applicant site looks like now. It is not concreted over. It has a contribution to the character of the area. We'll get back. Can, have the, uh, can we give the aerial photograph? You... There you go. Uh, you can, it has a contribution to the character area from that you know, green space and, and buildings, uh, and that will change. Uh, if that change is fundamentally harmful, and in light of the large number of other outbuildings in the area, I'd say the change is actually bringing it more in line with the existing character of the area, um, uh, albeit you do lose the green space, that is a judgment you need to, to make. So there is a, a leaving designation decided isn't a designated local plan policy it has a biodiversity opportunity which we're satisfied can be managed through the planning condition it is a change to the appearance of the site as always change is not in itself harmful you have to judge whether there is harm arising from that change that would warrant the refusal of plan permission and balance that against any benefits of the redevelopment councillor smith I want to return to a previous uh, comment about uh, fire engines being able to get down to put out a fire in one of these new garages. I appreciate there are already garages there. The answer that was given was that would be a matter for building regulations, but presumably uh, it's, it's right that we should make sure that a fire plants could get down there should there be a fire in one of those um, new um, uh, garages. No, as I said, as, as we've had a couple of times before, we have to look at what's controlled in the Town and Country Planning Act. Access for fire appliances is a matter there with other the legislation. So could, if the building, uh, it, it, who, would, who would test that out and who would then veto this application? So obviously none of us are building surveying experts, um, but I, I can advise, as is always the case, it's a matter of the, the, fire, the regulations for, for fire are quite complex, and as you imagine, have gone through a series of reviews recently following uh, the reporting on the back of Grenfell, but it is always a mixture of issues. It's can you get a fire plant there? If you can't, what are the other options? And there are solutions available, whether it be sprinkler systems and so on and so forth, that can be considered. So it isn't a black and white, do you have, do you have to get a fire engine to the front door of every building and property? It's a more complex issue. But to be blunt, it's one that is out with the control of this committee, so it's not something you, you can concern yourself with. Yeah, well, the question is, and perhaps you could answer it, is um, should the other authorities, and I appreciate it may not be a planning matter, discover that um, there's uh, a problem with getting fire appliances down, would that stop the development? We're wondering outside the realm of, of, of planning 
as a, from from experience, having managed building control teams for, for many years, uh, it isn't ever a case where you, it's impossible to come to a solution. There may be alternative solutions will need to be found rather than direct access by fire appliance. Councillor Hunt, question. I listened to you very carefully just now. You're balancing things. What is there that we could object? What policy could we use to reject this planning application if people were minded to want to do that? My job is to provide you with professional advice. Um, I'm obliged to ensure we maintain the highest quality of that advice. We do not feel there is a policy ground to refuse this application. The policy framework within which you're considering, of course, the National Planning Policy Framework, and in particular, Portland Plan Policies PCS 17 and 23 on a local basis. So uh, they promote good design. They uh, pro uh, look at issues of transport and movement. Um, nothing in these policies, in our view, uh, would justify the refusal of plan permission. But promoting good design is a classic example. It's a subjective conclusion. Uh, so, you know, saying it's compliant with a, it's a good design policy, someone could equally say, well, I don't like it. It's not compliant with a good design policy. But as always, reasons for refusal, it's the attribute. What is it about the scheme that is causing a harm that we'll then look at what the policy issues are? So it isn't so much the policy, it's the reason for refusal. It has to identify an attribute of the scheme that is resulting in a planning harm. Comments, Councillor Jones. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, for the second time today, I kind of find myself in a bit of a quandary against what my head is telling me is the legal planning position, what my heart wants to do. And I think, from my perspective, um, this completely flies in the face of why we've got DEFRA, why we have habitat regulations, why we have um, the designation of traditional orchards. Why is that government um, organisation doing all of that work, doing all of that stuff, to then say, oh, but it's okay, um, it's not such an important site, you could mitigate it because it's not an SSI or not near an SSI. You know, for me, with... <coughs> ice caps melting, sea levels rising, rain at the level that it is, flooding, and here in Portsmouth being an island city, being the most densely populated urban area in the country outside of London, being the only island city in this country, having spent £45 million on sea defences right up the Eastern Road, not far from here, up around the top of the city and down towards the Matt Batten Centre, and about to embark on over £100 million of flood defences down in South Sea, this kind of makes a bit of a mockery of everything, doesn't it? And if this was a really significant site because it was for a school or it's for some significant community benefit, I think the point that um, DEFRA made um, around this being mitigated would be a genuine one. But this is not adding any significant community benefit. Seven garages and a workshop, or six garages and a workshop, um, seven, sorry, and a workshop, um, who knows who's going to use them? Who knows if there's even a demand for them? This is not one of the neighbours that owns one of the houses adjacent to this that's going to do it to sell a garage to each of the neighbouring houses so that it eases parking on the street. You know, for all we know, there could end up being commercial activity via the back door. I can absolutely see that happening, by the way. Um, and I think what we should be doing is encouraging whoever owns this, to do more planting there and to use it as um, a site of natural habitation and not to actually be shoehorning garages into there. So we're spending so much money in this city to improve drainage through southern water, to build sea defences, to try and protect ourselves and having trees and having ground like this where water can naturally um, you know, go down into the, and be um, absorbed into the soil is really important. Putting paving over this is not going to help any of those neighbouring properties. Um, I, I'm sure that legally, from a planning perspective, this is, this is not a strong position that I'm coming from, but actually I think we need to set an example and if we want in this city in 10 years time in 20 years time less car ownership uh, then we should be encouraging we, we've just how many trees are we planting at, um, at um, the old landfill site at the new country park 60,000 trees this council's planting to go and then take away 20 here it's completely bonkers so on that basis even though it's probably quite weak um, I'm going to propose a refusal on the basis of the principle of the development of the site I just think it's a poor development um, and the impact on amenities and the neighbourhood uh, use of the uh, residents. 
Will somebody second that? You're seconding it, Councillor Hunt. Right. Okay. Right. Um, Councillor Stubbs had indicated that he wanted to speak, and I'll come back to you immediately after that. Councillor Stubbs. Um, well, I'm going to take a, a contrary view on this. I mean, I, for me, we've got, um, you know, what is the thing which comes up most often in large parts of this city in terms of residents' concerns? It's all to do with traffic and parking. And here we have an opportunity to provide some additional off-street parking, which will reduce the number of vehicles on street. I mean, whether they're, whether they're you know, people who live down that road or not, they'll be coming off the roads from somewhere or other. Um, and it's... You've, the principle of garages down there, there's already garages in the area. I'm quite willing to accept the um, rec what, what uh, Natural England have to say that with a um, that, that through planning condition that we could um, attain some offsets to any loss any loss to the natural environment through this development. Because let's face it, you know, this isn't go if, if this application doesn't go through, if no application goes through, no one's going to turn it into a beautiful little orchard. It'll just be scrapped. It'll just be scrapped out. It'll just be stinging nettles out the back. <coughs> um, that, that's the reality of what will happen. So for me. Uh, I think that this is that, there's, that this application uh, is beneficial, and I'm going to propose it. So the plan, um, Mr. McGuire has very kindly sat through, sat with us after these planning meetings, when we go through uh, with planning officers the upcoming greening Portsmouth. Um, uh, proposals and these proposals seek to retain trees and plant more <coughs> trees so that the, I think the overall the city's overall tree cover what was it six percent mm. it was very low it was very low and um, so we sit here with the very good planning officers after these meetings not today I'm glad to say because we've been here since I've been here since 9 30 anyway but uh, we're looking to do more of this which is the truth of it, we're looking to do more of this. We're not looking to go in the other direction. So this is making things very difficult for me today because I have to base everything on the policies that we've got right now. I think perhaps one of the problems is we haven't been to this piece of land. I'm not aware that it's a candidate status in the city, in this, on page 102 of the plan. <coughs> uh, I'm not aware it's a candidate status uh, piece of land, but it does talk about we should the city council the local planning authority rather should want to enhance green infrastructure by working to improve linkages and so on uh, which this would do but that talk, that's about parks and gardens parks rather this is improving the quality and multifunctionality multifunctionality of the city's green infrastructure assets particularly those of low value so they cater for the needs of wildlife and a broad section of the community and PCS 13 I heard what you said about it earlier, Mr. McGuire. Um, it said, but it does say, protect green infrastructure by refusing planning permission for proposals which would result in the net loss of existing areas of open space, as shown on Map 21, which you quite rightly point out that this is not. It's not. But it then goes on to say, and <coughs> those which would compromise the overall integrity of the green infrastructure network in the city unless there are wider public benefits from the development which outweigh the harm. The wider public benefit is to get a few more cars off the road and ironically to encourage more car use as a result therefore. So that is not, so getting the cars off the road and building garages is not a wider benefit from this development. It clearly isn't because we've got air pollution and so on. We don't want to encourage car uses. If we grant this planning permission today, as Councillor Stubbs wants us to do, we are encouraging almost, almost only a little bit more car use. And what we're doing is cutting down and destroying trees and putting buildings, like Ms. McGuire says, around, which are similar. That's not what we're being told we should be doing. The last election, was, as people have said, was very much about greening up Portsmouth. People would wonder what this planning committee is doing if we then give permission for this little piece of land, no matter how small, no matter how small, to take away trees, to take away this open green space, whether it's an orchard or not, I'm not, still not clear. But it is, I think, 
contrary to PCS 13 agreement at Portsmouth. I hope that Councillor um, Jones will incorporate that into her, her objection because I think it's really very clear. It says, and those that would compromise the overall integrity of the green infrastructure network in the city. This has to be the last time that we get a planning application like this. Officers have got to go out and find these little green spaces if they want us as councillors to be serious about greening up Portsmouth. There's no point coming to us and making us sitting here for three, four, five hours after a planning meeting saying we're going to green up Portsmouth and we want you to come along with, with you know, on that narrative with us if we're then going to be sitting here being asked to do the exact opposite. I cannot hand on heart, whether it goes off to appeal or not, I can't do any more about it than that, but I cannot today vote for it. I hear what Councillor Stubbs, because I'm being told by our planning teams, and I agree with them, and the residents of Portsmouth to do exactly the opposite to what we're being asked to do today. So I can't vote for it, and I think I've got policy reason to do that, and I'm not going to vote for it anyway, regardless, because it's a stupid thing to do. It really is quite a stupid thing to do, isn't it? Do I have a seconder for Councillor Stubbs' proposal that do we accept the officer's recommendation? No, no, you can't say that. Oh, sorry, Councillor Stubbs. Luke Stubbs is a sorry. councillor to your right-hand side, not to your left. Sorry, I was so engrossed. Yeah. <laughs> councillor Stubbs <laughs> previously proposed the officer's recommendation. Does he have a seconder? In which case I shall formally second that. Yeah, um, obviously this has been to run houses a little bit in terms of the, the current condition of the land. Are we pretty clear that if this, the owner of the land had not cleared the site and it was still had all the, the stuff on it that was on it when he bought it, that we would have been taking a different view on this application? So what I'm trying to get to, is this pragmatism based on the fact that he's chopped down the, the trees or is it the fact that the, if all the trees and stuff were still there, that we would uh, take a contrary view? As always, it's not that straightforward. This is, this is not a designated piece of open space in your plan. You have to make policies in accordance with your development plan. Clearly, when balancing the impact for biodiversity, and that's what the NERC identification uh, is for, um, the more biodiversity that was there in the first place, the more would have to be balanced out and, and the greater weight given to that negative loss and the greater benefit needed to be derived from any appropriate mitigation. Ultimately, in this purely hypothetical scenario, there could be a scenario where the diversity available on the site was so great it was impossible to reprovide in, a, in compliance with the proposal and that would be a reason to withhold plan permission. However, this is, as I said earlier, hypothesis does not take us forward. We have to judge the application on its own merit. This is a piece of green space, non-designated, um, and I would note of caution wording-wise on whether it's in the green infrastructure network. I think we need to look at that wording and how we're going to, if that's the reason for refusal, how we're going to put that together. But this is not, it's a designated space, uh, and consequently its loss does not outweigh the benefits officers have identified. That's the recommendation. But that's the balancing exercise. The loss and the benefits, and obviously members are entitled and, and capable of coming to their own balancing conclusion. Um, okay. Before Councillor Pitt continues, yeah. could I remind you that it is a matter of courtesy to listen to the officers when they are speaking and not to hold private conversations. Councillor Pitt. Chair, um, I guess what I'm getting at here is and this is what drives me absolutely bananas about planning in this city, and I guess it's probably the same elsewhere, is people circumventing the rules and going about doing things and then hoping that we don't throw the book at them afterwards. So, in my patch uh, near Fratton Bridge, we've had the recent uh, development go up there, and when we were at this planning committee, everyone was absolutely assured that there would be no damage to the adjacent trees. The first week that they broke ground, the developer accidentally ran into a very mature tree and accidentally knocked it over, um, and then will be required to replace it. But it's quite clear when you look at the plans, there was absolutely no way that they were going to be able to protect that tree in the first place, but also had they been proposing to knock it down, there would 
almost certainly are not got plan information as it was defined. It's a way of people just doing what they like, chopping down trees, knocking over walls, etc., because it's all terribly convenient. And I'm absolutely sick to the back teeth of it with people who are converting houses without coming to the, the committee first for approval and doing it retrospectively, and in this instance, chopping down a piece of open green space because it suited them to do so. In the, we have it here in the report that in the view of DEFRA, this is still a traditional orchard and a priority habitat. So instead of looking at this planning application, I'd like to see the letter that we're writing to the current owner of the site telling him to plant the trees again. I have a large number of hands. Um, I think I have Councillor Atkins, Councillor Norton, Councillor Jones. Um, at the risk of slightly repeating what well, others have said, but also, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, part of the problem here is, is that at some point in the past, the council failed to designate this as a green site because it was too small and it, it missed our notice. And we should have done, and if we had done, we'd have an easy grounds to refuse this. Um, as it stands, I'm, I'm not particularly proposing either way. I'm probably going to abstain because I, I cannot bring myself to vote in favour of of turning this into garages. Um, it's, I've not been on the planning committee that long, but it's undoubtedly the, the stupidest idea that has come before us in the, in the last year or so, as, as Councillor Hunt said. And I, I do hope that, um, that the, the, the owner of this land will, will reconsider um, and will seek um, some buyer for the land, whether that's a community group or even if the council finds the money somewhere, because I doubt it's that high value a piece of land or still money or something, to purchase this piece of land to turn it into a community orchestra and just settle the thing amicably. I think that would be far better of a solution. I think it, when the, the owner of thinks about this and the legal headache that the rights of access, which are not material planning community, I'm not suggesting they are, but I think the rights of access are going to turn into a horrible legal headache. I think the attempt to build garages on this is misconceived, and I hope the owner realises that and attempts to seek some other alternative solution. Um, for me, I, I think I'm going to abstain because unfortunately the, the, the way that it's fallen through the cracks of our green policies and our planning policies mean that we don't have a lot of material grounds for refusing this um, that are going to hold up, but I can't bring myself to vote for it. It's a bad idea. Councillor Norton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to shadow um, Councillor Pitt's comments there, I think, you know, legal jargon aside, sometimes you've got to act with integrity and, and think about your conscience, and if the owner has chopped these trees down, then this shouldn't go through on principle. Councillor Donna Jones. Um, well, I love the passion from Councillor Pitt, and I'm delighted because it's his portfolio that's in charge of planning stuff, so I would politely request that he asks his team to start a survey of the city for <coughs> other like yeah, sites, cool, um, and that we then move to designate them. As we're going through the local plan process next year or the year after, that actually we do formally put these forward at a public inquiry as registered green open spaces to send a clear message to people that we don't want to um, in um, encourage more concrete, slabbed car parking spaces and garages who want more community green spaces. And whoever this person is, he doesn't live in the city, please come back and plant the trees that were there before. I have seldom known the committee so passionate. Um, if I can, do you I wish to speak? I wanted, I wanted to uh, apologise for the officers for the headache that we're giving them today because they're doing good work. <laughs> the chairman will do that afterwards. Um, members, it has been proposed by Councillor Jones and seconded by Councillor Hunt that we reject this planning application on the grounds that it remains designated as a traditional orchard and as such a priority habitat and thus um, is contrary to our planning policy PCS 13. Um, I think we will need some better form of words than I can come up with for this but um, let us take it at the moment a green of Portsmouth, page 101. I think we definitely need to have the impact on amenities of neighbouring and future residents and the principle of the development. They're the two things that I consider to refer to. Okay. Which ones they be. If I can yes. assist. So <coughs> PCS 13 gives you green of Portsmouth, so the wording isn't quite right. Uh, I'm also, because apologies, I can't have it all. 
Honourable Dan, looking at uh, paragraph 174B of the National Planning Policy Framework, which is plan making around priority <coughs> habitat, so there's some wording there. That is the loss of what is identified uh, as priority habitat traditional orchards, uh, and uh, that's the general principle of the loss of green space, which seems to be the clear uh, concerns I'm hearing from committee members. That is very different to the general amenity of immediate neighbours, uh, and I would argue is a matter of principle. So, and just to be blunt, it's never, you can never refuse an application on the principle of an application. Every application has to be assessed on its own merits. In principle, this application is the loss of land currently a priority habitat, traditional orchards. So that that's under PCS 13 and the NPPF. Um, but immunity impact on neighbours is a much more uh, difficult one to judge because that isn't something members have discussed uh, well, today. We so. have objections, but if you think by putting in the amenities of neighbours, neighbouring yeah. and future residents, um, sorry. If you think that that weakens the objection to include the bit about the uh, impact on neighbouring properties and future residents, then I'm happy to drop yeah. that one. To, to be clear, the officer's recommendation is to grant this application, so it's really up to you what you want to include in the reason for refusal. Well, you just said that you think it's much harder to defend, so you my, my question yeah. to you is, is, is my suggestion of that inclusion, does it weaken the the um, objection. Yeah, I don't wish to el elongate the meeting un unnecessarily, but members haven't actually discussed the impact on amenity, which would be the movement of cars in rear gardens. Um, there's because the visual. Well, I talked about the soak is, away uh, and the, and the right. impact on the gardens at the back and the sea levels rising and everything else. That's what I meant by the amenity. Oh, sorry, I thought I covered that quite well, but anyway. Yeah, so I think trouble is those issues of flooding and, and climate change obviously is a much broader issue than amenity in the centres is defined in, in planning and in, in, in your policy which deals with much more residential amenity disturbance noise activity which have relevance obviously you're creating an area of activity where there isn't activity but if members are concerned about that that's something obviously you need to discuss and put put to the vote if you so wish it is a separate one to the loss of the habitat the uh, traditional woodland so if it, it will be two separate reasons for refusal. Right. So well, it doesn't weaken I'm happy the to drop that one so then about the amenity. Yeah. Yeah. 13, so. so the grounds will be that um, this is a priority habitat and this does not promote, was the, what are the words, promote? Chairman, if, if permissive, in light of the fact that there is uh, general policy positions to support priority habitats and policy position uh, regarding greener, uh, greening Portsmouth, um, what I would suggest is, in, in light of that fact, that is clear enough for members to understand. It is PCS 13 locally, uh, and uh, roughly paragraph 170 onwards of the MPPF. Specific right. wording could be delegated to officers to, to find some wording that is uh, best Are able members to members prepared to delegate to officers to find the right wording? Yeah. In which case, we have a proposal from Councillor Jones, seconded by Councillor Hunt for refusal. I put that, those in favour of that proposal, please show. One, two, three, four, five. Those against, please show. Those abstaining, please show. Planning permission for is refused. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now come to item 11 on the agenda, 86 Lincoln Road, Portsmouth, single storey extension to the rear. We have no deputations on this and so I will ask for the officer's report. Thank you Chair. So this application relates to a two-storey mid-terrace property located on the southern side of Lincoln Road. Um, the surrounding area is predominantly residential and is characterised by rows of terrace properties. Um, to the rear of the dwelling is an enclosed garden which concludes an outbuilding. Boundary treatment consists of a 1.6 metre brick wall and fencing which measures approximately 1.8 metres. Planning permission is sought for a single storey rear extension following part demolition of the existing rear extension to create a larger kitchen. Um, permission is also sought for a first floor extension to the rear to create a bedroom and accommodate a bathroom upstairs. 
So the proposed single storey extension would measure 4 metres in depth, 2.7 metres in width, and would have a maximum height of 3 metres. And the first floor element would measure 3 metres in depth, 2.7 metres in width, and would increase the height of the existing single storey row extension by 2.4 metres. A slide showing the existing and proposed west elevation, and a slide showing the proposed east elevation. There are no site-specific land use policies that discourage the principle of residential extensions in this area. Therefore, the design policy PCS 23 of the Portsmouth Plan is the most relevant in this case. It is noted that there would be an increase in the scale and bulk at first floor level. However, the site is considered to be an adequate site to accommodate the development. Both extensions will be finished and rendered to match existing property, and a planning condition is proposed to ensure that extensions will be completed in matching materials. With regards to any impact on neighbouring properties, neighbouring property to the west has a first floor, a proposed first floor extension which is situated approximately 1.5 metres from the boundary shed with 84 Lincoln Road, approximately 2.6 metres from the neighbouring property itself. At first floor level, the property has a obscure glazed bathroom window and a bedroom window to the other side. Um, at ground floor level there is a window serving a living room. It is noted that the proposed extension would increase the bulk of the host dwelling when viewed from the neighbouring property. However, having regard to existing relationships between the properties, including the existing boundary treatment and the south-facing nature of the rear elevations, it is considered that the proposals would not be so harmful to warrant a reason for refusal on the grounds of loss of light or over loss of outlook. With regard to the neighbouring property to the east, 88 Lincoln Road benefits from a single window at first floor level to the eastern side, um, having regard to the separation distance and the modest depth of the proposed first floor extension is considered that the proposed development would not result in significant adverse impacts to the occupiers of number 88. Um, so having regard to all material considerations and raised representations and planning policy, concluded that the development is acceptable and capable of support. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? Councillor Hunt? That is what we're considering, what we saw in the photograph. With this, you know, it was coming out, isn't it? Yeah. They're knocking some of that down. So, some, yeah, and it's coming. How far is it coming out again? So, the... I'm we better. So, the existing single-story rear extension being part demolished and rebuilt um, would have a depth of four metres, the same footprint as existing, and a proposed first floor extension which would have a depth of three metres. And could we go back to the picture that shows number 80? Is it 80 or 82? <coughs> 88. 84, or this is... That one. Yep. So it's coming out from the grey, it's coming out another... So it's coming out three metres to about here. How many? Three metres, the first Three metres, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're not considering that enormous dormer window, is that right? No. Not under this application, no. <coughs> <coughs> Councillor Jones. Could you go back to the picture with the existing floor plan? Um, uh, oh, yeah, that one. So there's already um, a, a rear extension on the on the ground floor only, yeah. and they're knocking it down and rebuilding it. So they're just going to replace exactly the same footprint <laughs> on the ground floor. They're part done demolishing it and rebuilding, I think, just to tidy it up and create a single oh, I'll find a photo. One other question, if I may, Chair, please, if that's okay. Um, are there any other houses in this street or the neighbouring streets that have come out so far? Is there any other sort of example that, that has already been, been um, given permission or not? Um, not recent permission. There's nothing on this side of the street. There is examples. It's hard to tell from this photo. But examples of first floor elements on this side of the road. Comments? Yes. Uh, absolutely clear cut case for me. It will create a sense of enclosure by way of bricks and mortar on the property the other side at 88. Uh, and therefore, because uh, it's going to come out uh, how, two meters, absolutely no question about it. And if you go back to the other picture showing them with their little fence and everything, that's him. So it'll come out another 2.2 .2 meters. No, that's going to be miserable for them, and uh, I should propose a refusal. 
Councillor Atkins. Oh, right. Um, <coughs> in a new area where, where you have single story extensions and, but not first floor extensions, I know there are some on the other side of the road. Um, is it generally, what does it take to start allowing first floor extensions? Is it something you generally, we generally do allow? Is it something we generally don't? Or is there no position kind of on, you know, um, whether or not we start allowing first floor extensions where there previously weren't any? Different inspectors have different views about matters of this nature. Um, from my experience, um, which regards um, this sort of development um, with what we've been allowed or what has been allowed opposite side of the road and the issue being raised, this being, um, I believe, the north side of this rear garden. Is it on the north? Is it the south? Uh, so the rear garden south facing. Um, Can you show me the um, floor? Yeah, okay. Um, with that respect, um, I, what I would want to find out from members is what would be the um, harm that we are looking at. Um, well, would the residential amenities is absolutely stands out. Which of the residential amenities, sorry? Sorry? Which of the residential... Sorry? Enjoy with the house and their garden. You may not agree with me, but that's a view that I have taken. I know, I'm just, I'm just saying which of the residential amenities, because there are several, it could be outlook, it could be yeah. sunlight, it could be enclosure. It could be overbearing. I said, I said the sense of enclosure. I said it just now. Okay, sorry, I just I didn't get that. I just I wanted to conclude. Yeah. You, you um, didn't say it, but uh, I think at this time of the afternoon we need yeah. absolute clarity. Uh, if, if that's Councillor um, Atkins. I would just add comments. So I, I move from my question to my comment. Um, I, I completely respect what Councillor Hunt says, and there is an effect on neighbouring light and immunity, and I think this is very much a, just a matter now of judgment. For me, I would probably rather see first floor extensions bringing these kind of houses into larger occupation and make them more suitable as family homes. And once we allow it, I think others will follow suit and that would become more the character of those houses and gardens. And to my mind, I think I would prefer that. And so I'd be willing to propose the officer's recommendation despite the damage to me, which I fully accept exists. So as a judgment call, I would go the other way and I agree with the officers. I would, I would propose the officer's recommendation on this one. Mr. Chairman, if I may, is there a seconder for that? Councillor Stubbs. Thank you. Yeah, on a number of occasions today, I've given reasons. I mean, to play the tape back, and either people haven't been listening, or um, but I have made the representations, and I used the word sense of enclosure by bricks and mortar, and I've done that several times a day. Certainly, I, I heard you, but there is a lot going on. There's a lot of background now. It is understandable that some people may not have have immediately taken that on board but I heard you certainly Councillor Hunt um, so other comments from members please Councillor Stubbs just to follow up really I mean all development involves some change I think this is quite limited in scope um, and so I'm happy to support it other comments from members please yeah no it has, been, it has been proposed by Councillor Atkins, seconded by Councillor Stubbs, that we accept the officer's recommendation on this. Those in favour of the officer's recommendation, please show. Those against the officer's recommendation, please show that the officer's recommendation has been carried. Uh, the applicant has planning permission. Thank you. We now come to item number 12 on your agenda, which is 87 Gladys Avenue. This is one of your favorites, Councillor Pitt. This is a change of use from a dwelling house to a house in multiple occupation. There, is no, there are no deputations on this. Can I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. 
this application seeks planning permission for the change of use um, from a Class C3 dwelling house into purposes falling within Class C4 house in multiple occupation or Class C3 dwelling house. The application relates to 87 Gladys Avenue, a two-story mid-terrence dwelling situated on the western side of Gladys Avenue. The surrounding area is characterised by rows of terrence properties of a similar size and design. Uh, the dwelling is set back from the highway by a small front forecourt, which is, could be used, which is used for the storage of waste and recycling. And the property benefits from an enclosed rear garden with uh, rear access through a rear alleyway, which you can uh, see just there. Uh, the property will comprise of a combined kitchen and dining room, a uh, bedroom with its own um, conservatory space oddly, um, a shower, a WC and an additional bedroom at ground floor level and three bedrooms and a bathroom at first floor level. Based on the information held by the City Council, there are 62 properties within a 50 metre radius of the application site. No properties have been identified as being HMOs, so granting this application would raise the total percentage of HMOs within a, 10 meter, within a 50 metre area to 1.61% and under the 10% threshold. Furthermore, the proposal wouldn't result in three or more HMOs being adjacent to each other, nor would it result in any residential property being sandwiched between two HMOs. Therefore, the community is considered to be not already imbalanced by concentration of HMOs, and the application would not result in an imbalance to the of uses in the area. The um, above you can see some photos. Um, the site is currently being renovated from its former state when the site visit took place. Um, the HMO SPD states that a combined living space for three to five persons should have a floor space area of 24 metres squared. Uh, the proposal would provide 25 metres squared and uh, therefore is, required, is considered to meet the standard. Um, the applicant has confirmed that all of the Four, each of the four bedrooms would be for single occupancy and all four bedrooms are considered to exceed the space standards for bedrooms set out within the HMO SPD. Um, as a point of clarity, the officer's report has a small discrepancy. It states the upstairs bathroom is undersized by 0 0.9 metres squared when it's actually only 0 0.09 metres squared undersized. Uh, further, the property um, the required standard for toiletry facilities in a five-person HMO is one bathroom and one separate WC, and the property would provide an additional shower room at ground floor level, which would more than make up for the slight under-provision of bathroom size at first floor level. Um, the property is therefore considered to comply with the space standards as set out in the HMO SPD of October 2019, and is considered to provide an adequate standard of accommodation. Uh, the City Council's Parking Standards SPD places a requirement of two off-road spaces for a Class C4 HMO with four or more bedrooms. No off-road parking is provided as part of the application or could be provided at the site, but the required spaces are the same as for its current use as a C3 dwelling house, and as such a refusal on parking grounds couldn't be sustained. Um, all other matters relating to amenity and waste storage have been outlined in the officer's report and so have in regards to all the material considerations, representations and planning policy, it's concluded that the proposal is uh, acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Members questions? C Councillor Atkins, then Councillor Smythe. Let's have a look at the plan again please, yeah. so the, the floor plan of the proposal. Yeah, one second. Uh, if members wish, I do have paper copies I could give out. I know, it's fine. So, uh, Jay, so the communal area is the part on the left, which incorporates the kitchen and lounge, and, and the conservatory is actually part of one of the bedrooms, then, is it? That's, that's the way it's structured. Uh, yes, the conservatory is um, existing, and instead of knocking it down, they've given it to this proposed bedroom just as an extra bit of amenity space to do what they with. Any other questions, members? Comments? Councillor Atkins? Um, I think it's pleasing to see that they're uh, refitting the property, so the fact that it's going to go in quite a substantial 
uh, remodel, I think, is a good thing, uh, assuming it's brought up to a relatively high standard of, of decoration and quality. Um, I think the provision of bathroom space is good, and the, the size of the um, bedrooms is, is a decent size as well. So I think overall this, this meets our planning standards, looks like a relatively high quality HMO um, in a position where, at least officially, and I do note that there are objections about un unregistered HMOs potentially operating the area, don't think that's uh, relevant today. I think we have to focus on the registered ones, and, and so in an area which I think can accommodate one on a bus route, I think this is a, uh, a relatively suitable HMO application, and so I'm happy to propose the officer's report. Uh, do I have a seconder? Councillor Stubbs. Any further comments, members? Those in favour? Those against? Uh, the officer's recommendation is supported. The applicant has planning, applic uh, planning permission. We now come on page 84 to Spinnaker Lodge change of use from a care home C2 to a 12 bedroom house in multiple occupancy, uh, sui generis. Um, we have a Mr. Robert Totten, who has asked to make a deputation. Would you please come to the table, sir? Thank you. Chair. Yeah. Just before we do the officer's report, um, have you, Matt, have you got paper copies on, mm. on this? And have you got the kitchen layout that we talked about yesterday? Uh, yes, I'll pass them out now. No, pages um, two was the previous floor plan. Pages three also includes the um, kitchen layout now. Um, can I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, I would draw members' attention to the supplementary matters list, which includes uh, details of two additional objection comments that were received since the publication of the committee report. Uh, the majority of the issues had been addressed within the report, um, except for the loss of a, um, the care home itself and um, one uh, comment identifying an error on the application form. Uh, with regard to the loss of the care home facilities, the property is currently vacant and there are no specific policies that would require the care home to be retained. Um, and an amended um, application form has been received to correct an error within the uh, applicant's stated address. Uh, in addition, a condition and a recommendation have been included to deal with nitri uh, nitrate mitigation. So. Uh, this application is seeking planning permission for the change of use from a care home, Class C2, to a 12-bedroom house in multiple occupation, sui generis. 
The application relates to Spinnaker Lodge, 464 London Road, which is located on the eastern side of London Road, a busy through, ro through road, and it's just north to an area classified under PCS 18, London Road North, for local shops and services. The property is set back from the road by a front forecourt and front boundary wall, um, and provides space for one car park, for one car to park, um, as well as an area for, for the storage of waste and recycling within the front forecourt area. And the property also benefits from an enclosed garden to the rear of the dwelling. Uh, the property would comprise a combined kitchen and dining room at ground floor, six bedrooms, each with their own dedicated ensuite, a WC and a laundry area at uh, ground floor level, um, four bedrooms, each with their own dedicated ensuite at first floor level, and two bedrooms, each with their, dedica with their own dedicated ensuite at second floor level. It should also be mentioned the applicant submitted amended plans um, and a detail that was not picked up within the officer's report is that in the second floor also includes a small kitchenette, um, which you can see has been provided um, within the um, printed out drawing plans. Um, based on the information held by the City Council, there are 46 properties within a 50 metre radius of the application site. One property has been identified as a HMO. <coughs> Therefore, the granting of this application would raise the total percentage of HMOs in the area to 4.34%, and the total number of bed spaces and occupants within the HMO, within HMOs in the vicinity, is similarly low. Uh, it is considered that the community, therefore, is not already imbalanced by a concentration of HMO uses, and that this application would not result in an imbalance of such uses. Um, furthermore, the proposed development would not result in three or more HMOs being adjacent to each other, nor would it result in any residential property being sandwiched between two HMOs. It's therefore concluded there is no particular concentration or proliferation of HMOs in the community, and as there is not already an imbalance, it is not considered that it will likely cause a demonstrable adverse implication to the local amenity from the change of use. Uh, the HMO Supplementary SPD states that a combined living space serving six or more um, occupants um, should have a floor space of 34 square metres. Um, given that the proposal provides 34 square metres of combined living space at ground floor level, it is considered to meet this required standard. Um, you can see some photos of the property that were taken um, a couple of months ago. Now um, the property was being renovated what during the officer's site visit. Um, all 12 bedrooms um, exceed the space standards required as set out in the new HMO SPD and the property complies with all the space guidance guidelines and is therefore considered to provide an adequate standard of living. Um, environmental health were consulted as part of the application and have not raised any concerns in regards to the amenity of the surrounding residents. Uh, the building is detached, reducing any risk of sound transference from neighbours. Um, environmental health do have concerns in regards to the noise generated from London Road impacting the future occupancy occupants of the property and as such have suggested a pre-commencement condition to conduct a noise impact assessment and further investigate the issue and, if necessary, provide possible uh, mitigation. Um, the local highway authority are satisfied that the additional traffic generation that is likely to arise as a result of this proposal would not have a material impact on the operation of the local highway network. Uh, parking is permitted on both sides of London Road in the vicinity of the property and there is often scope to find an on-street uh, car parking opportunity within a reasonable walking distance of the property. It is considered that the parking requirement of the previous use exceeds the SPD required two spaces parking required for the uh, HMO providing six excess of six bedrooms and as a consequence, while the parking provision on site is limited, this proposal is likely to reduce the local residential parking on the street. And the application also provides an area for secure um, bicycle storage, um, just to the side there. Um, and this um, is suitable for the storage, storage of four bicycles and can be secured by a condition. And in relation to refuse um, requirements, the owners of the site would need to apply for communal waste collection. Um, it's considered that waste facilities 
could also be stored within the front forecourt of the property and can be once again secured by condition. And so I have in regards to all the above matters, the proposed change of use is considered to be acceptable and appropriate in the location and in accordance, in accordance with policies PCS 17, 20 and 23 of the Portsmouth Plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Totten, you have six minutes to address the committee. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak in favour of my client's application and the officer's favourable recommendation. Number 464 stands on the east side of London Road to the north of the London Road North Centre of Local Shops and Services. London Road forms part of the route of six regular bus services that take passengers north to Cosham and Lee Park or south to North End and South Sea. This is a very sustainable location. Paragraph 525 of the core strategy recognises, and I quote, the contribution of HMOs to meeting the city's accommodation needs, particularly as a source of housing for those starting off in the economy as young professionals. Twelve professional tenants would be accommodated here. Policy PCS 20 of the core strategy states, and I quote, in order to support mixed and balanced communities, applications for changes of use to a house in multiple occupation, or HMO, will only be permitted where the community is not already imbalanced by a concentration of such uses or where the development would not create an imbalance. Para 2.2 of the HMO SPD states that, again I quote, a community will be con considered to be imbalanced where more than 10% of residential properties within a 50 metre radius of the area surrounding the application property are already in HMO use. This proposal would result in an HMO percentage of just 4.34 for the locality. The proposed accommodation would satisfy the internal floor area requirements on pages 8 and 9 of the SPD. Environmental Health recorded no outright objections to this proposal, but have suggested a pre-commencement condition. There is just one parking space on the forecourt of these premises, so the notional shortfall for care home use is taken up on the public highway. Transport planning is satisfied that HMO use of these premises would not have a material impact on the operation of the local highway network. My client is prepared to pay £200 towards Solent mitigation. The officers are satisfied that HMO use of these premises meets all the requirements of the core strategy and the SPD, so members are requested to accept their recommendation and grant permission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Tartan. Before... Uh, the chairman will come in with the first question. Um, on the proposed second floor, we see a kitchen. Uh, is that included in the uh, 34 square metres of communal space, or is that additional to the 34 metres of communal space? Uh, that will be additional to the 34 metres of communal space at ground floor level. And just for clarity, um, that's just the one large room there. It also doesn't include um, that small area for laundry space, so it's simply that one combined area has 34 square metres. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? Councillor Jones, Councillor Norton. Um, I wonder if the planning officer can confirm what date you went out and took the photographs. You did mention it. I didn't hear. Um, I... Roughly. Um, one second. It would have been sometime around May because of nitrates. So the application has been on hold for a period of time. Well, it's, I mean, it's quite clear from the application uh, and from the photographs that I was hoping that you were going to, you went out and did a site visit last week or the week before, because what's obvious from this is that this is clearly a retrospective application because the conversion works, whilst you use the words refurbishment, the roof has already been converted, uh, the dormers are on there, um, and, you know, I do feel quite sorry for people who have had to wait 
I mean, this, this particular application was submitted on the 12th of March and its last date of determination was the 21st of May. And I appreciate we've had the nitrates issue and that's out of everyone's control. So I, you know, I do feel for people who've spent money on acquiring properties, thinking they'd be able to turn them around within three, four months, five months maybe, and they've ended up, but here we are nine months later, they're still sat with them, paying potentially debt payments on them and everything else. So I do have empathy. And if you'd said you had um, done the site visit last week and, and what you'd had a conversation with them over the last few months was along the lines of, look, I can't give you, I can't take it to committee yet because we haven't got the um, the nitrates uh, mitigation sorted out, but I will be taking it forward with a recommendation for conditional permission or permission. On that basis, I could almost understand them then going ahead and starting the conversion works, even though they shouldn't have done, but because they'd had that verbal from you. But if that you took these photographs in May, am I right in thinking that that, that is substantially already underway. Um, so I took the photographs in around May time. Um, I would point out that most of the works are internal alterations. Both the front dormer and rear dormer were already in place at the property right, prior. Okay. They were they existed when it was a care home, so Fair they enough. haven't been right. put in separately. Okay, in which case I take that back. Um, the, um, I mean, this, the, we've got so many HMOs across the city and we've had HMOs brought to us for a similar number of people that are in far smaller footprints than this one. Um, and yes, the parking situation, of course, we'd all love to have more parking for them, but I can imagine that the care home generated a lot more traffic movement and foot flow um, every day with in terms of the staff, doctors, whoever were coming to visit the site daily. So 12 professional people, not all of whom will own a car I'm sure because some will cycle and some will um, uh, some will use the buses obviously um, you know I, I, I don't see how we've got any um, option but to, to support it that was a comment rather than a question but uh, Councillor Hunt but can I ask some questions then take you to the proposed second floor plans if you wouldn't mind so we've got the kitchenette thing there and um, you see the door opening up into the kitchen uh, and then you've got about another door space to the place where the the um, cooker and hobbies <coughs> so my, my concern is it might be uh, uh, something for licensing rather than here <coughs> we've got a situation where somebody's actually at the at the hob cooking and um, somebody's trying to get in through the door uh, the door was opening up onto them and I don't know potentially frying chips or goodness knows whatever else they do uh, but, but that's the things right there and um, probably would be better around the corner I guess but that's up to somebody else I reckon the other thing I've got a concern about is how many people do we any idea how many people might live here I and mean, there's 12 bedrooms and some of them look like double beds but I can't tell people like sleeping in double beds I know we have any idea? It is not something for us to consider today. I um, well, it, it's stated on the application for um, 12 bed, 12 person HMO. So yeah, sure. So single. minimum 12 persons. We've got this kitchenette thing here. Can we, can we reasonably expect? You know, at lunchtime, is it reasonable to expect 12, a dozen persons rummage around? It's let's say 10 or eight people rummaging around in that kitchen area preparing their food. I mean, is that acceptable? Do you reckon? Just yeah, to be careful, there are, there are two kitchens, one large kitchen, diner and meeting area, and then the other kitchenette. So uh, with 12 people, maybe guests as well, uh, uh, living with it, within it, uh, are they all going to want to eat at the same time? Uh, so that's six per, per kitchen. Um, well, I've certainly lived in far busier houses without a lot of concerns personally. So no, we're, we're satisfied, and it does meet all your minimum criteria, and we're satisfied, especially with that extra kitchen on the on the upper floor, which I think is a really useful addition to the practical amenities of the occupiers. That this is uh, a very good additional residential occupation for the city. Uh, just very nervous about having the. I mean, I just say as a human being, very nervous about having the uh, and, and having a, oh my, we all own our own houses to have a. a, a a hob there when you're frying or cooking what you right by the door when somebody's coming in or opens up onto you is not a clever idea need to think about that I reckon Councillor Atkins then Councillor Norton I have a, a couple of questions. First of all could, could you just clarify following on from um, what um, Councillor Hunt said could, could um, they 
accommodate, could they have more than 13 people, in, uh, 12 people, sorry, in, without changing the planning permissions? Or could they, they start having two people to a room in some of the rooms? Or, or is there a limit somehow on the, the occupation of this? Thank you. Is it 12 is already very large. I think that's all that's giving us pause. I, I don't think that. Um, so it, it's just. Uh, would, sorry, if I, if I may, just, just to be absolutely clear, the actual description, which is at the top of page 84, is for 12 bedroom house and hospital occupancy. So we haven't included them in there. This is a 12 person, 12 bed. Right. The number okay. of the conditions associated with cycle stores, etc., describe it as 12 person, 12 bed. But there isn't a condition on there saying there can only be 12. Uh, persons. I'm comfortable with that, as obviously it is for licensing to dictate the actual occupancy. Oh, I see. Oh, so um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll need a license, and it will need to uh, be judged on, on that basis. So uh, it's a 12 bedroom one. There could be more than 12 occupants and not be in breach but of the But that's down operation. to licensing. I, yeah. I feel that's an appropriate place for that control. Yeah, okay. No, I, I think that's, that's quite sensible. Um, my if second question... If you have a concern about that, speak to Councillor Udi. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, I'm sure licensing will, will control that sensibly. Um, the second question was about overlooking is there any problem with overlooking of the row of houses on Amberley Road to uh, um, to the the south? Is that is that an issue which uh, is relevant here, or, or because the care home would have potentially had the same effect? Is it not something to consider? Um, well, the care home would have had the um, same potential for overlooking. Um, the applicant has um, kind of proposed that the side facing windows um, would be of an obscure glaze. Is that a condition or is that just a proposal by the applicant? That's a proposal purely by the applicant because these are existing windows. We don't feel it's necessary to require that obscure glazing. Clearly, it's part of good neighbourliness if the applicant chooses to do so. The first floor window serves a hallway and the second floor window is a secondary window to a bedroom. So they both could be obscurely glazed uh, should the applicant so choose, but we wouldn't require it. Okay, thank you. So, so they're not, there's not any primary windows in that direction uh, in any case. Um, my final question so is more of a comment. I, I did... Um, um, I was contacted by one of the, the wood councillors who was slightly concerned that some of the documentation related to this application only went up on the planning portal yesterday, though it was only the distance uh, of HMOs in the area, so the 50 metre radius. I don't know why it was as, as late as the afternoon, but he was slightly concerned that some of his residents might not have had a chance to look at that, though I don't think actually it has a huge effect on this application overall. Okay, so apologies for the delay. And obviously, we're applying the new guidance. So until the new guidance came out, we were certain aspects of determination were still being in abeyance. So we could take the staff through training. Thank you, Councillor Norton. Then Councillor Pitt. Thank you, Chair. So 12 bedrooms, potentially um, with partners, 24 people, and one parking space. Uh, how do we, I mean, it might be a licensing issue, but how do you work out who gets the parking space? Or was that part of a premium for living out? I don't so obviously, we, we don't. It is for, for management. Uh, as always, in judging highways <coughs> implications, it's one applying standards in the first instance, and secondly, comparing it to existing use. As this was a care home of exactly the same size, we're satisfied the provision of effectively no parking. That one parking space is, uh, no, never mind, um, uh, is, is adequate and will not cause sufficient harm when compared to the lawful use for a care home. Councillor Pitt. Comments, Councillor Pitt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have to laugh at some of these sometimes. Um, I was um, a resident came to me with a uh, complaint a while back that um, we take an enforcement action because they we were they were allegedly using their 
places an HMO because it was a couple and a single person sharing and private sector housing judged that there was 0.4 metres too little workspace for the three people to use in a two bedroom flat and then we have to look at a, a property which by my reckoning in terms of the number of the bedroom sizes is capable of uh, supporting 21 people um, but then private sector housing will go in and measure up all the worktop space and the fridge space and everything else and come to a different figure and none of us here have got a clue what figure that's going to be um, and there are so there are always vagaries around this which are just I personally find unhelpful I know they're not always material considerations but in uh, in coming to a decision I'd like to know what I'm putting people into uh, I did note that in the report it didn't mention the kitchen on the second floor um, and um, so looking at the report yesterday without the plans uh, I think when I came into this today I was moving it in the direction of saying no because I don't think one kitchen for all that lot especially spread over three different floors is enough uh, or because it was flat right on the line uh, of what's required but I think given that it's got a kitchen on the second on the second floor um, provides me with some comfort and the fact that it's obviously uh, got quite a number of large rooms and all suites um, and hopefully will be done to a high standard it is a very large property um, I'm not a massive fan of these HMOs but if you can compare this to a rather disastrous one that some of us will remember down near the seafront in South Sea where a former hotel uh, was going to require potentially 50 people to all cook in one kitchen which always struck me as a nonsense we turned it down but lost it on appeal it's quite clear we would absolutely lose this on appeal um, as much as I don't particularly like it so uh, I'll propose the officers recommendations do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Smythe. Any further comments from members? Okay, we move to the vote. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four. Those against, please show. Two, three. It is carried on a four, three. So you have your planning permission, sir. That, members, concludes this afternoon's entertainment. Um, it has been, in some ways, a rather fraught day, a rather difficult day, but thank you very much for your attendance.